Chapter 55, Henry the Sixth of Windsor, The Red Rose and the White. You remember that Henry the Fourth, who took the crown from Richard the Second, was descended from John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, the fourth son of Edward the Third. But there was someone who had a better right to the throne. That was Edmund Mortimer, who was descended from the third son of Edward the Third. Now, in the time of Henry the Sixth, there was still living a descendant of Edmund Mortimer. He was called Richard, Duke of York. The Wars of the Roses began because Richard claimed to be the rightful heir to the throne. At first, Richard said he only wanted to be made protector of the kingdom because he saw how weak and easily led the king was. It seemed indeed as if the king needed a protector, for he was not only weak and foolish, but at times he was quite mad and unable even to speak for days. The Duke of York hoped that if he was protector during Henry's life, the people would make him king after Henry died. The people would very likely have agreed to this, had not a little son been born to Henry. This little son was called Edward, and many of the nobles turned from the Duke of York for his sake. Although Henry was quite unfit to rule, they hoped that his little son would grow up wise and good and more like his grandfather. Henry V, so some of the nobles sided with the Duke of York, and others with the king, and the quarrelling between them became very bad. Many at first were afraid to speak out and say openly on which side they were. But soon the quarrel grew to be so bitter that not only the nobles, but the whole nation took sides. One day, while walking in the Temple Gardens in London with some other nobles, Richard, Duke of York, tried to persuade them to join his cause. Ah, he said at last, I see you are afraid to speak out. Well, then, give me a sign to show on whose side you are. Let him, that is a true-born gentleman, and stands upon the honour of his birth, if he supposes that I have pleaded truth, from off this briar pluck a white rose with me, saying that he pulled a white rose which grew on a bush near and stuck it in his cap. Then the Duke of Somerset sprang forward, and, tearing a red rose from another bush, said, Let him that is no coward, nor no flatterer, but dare maintain the party of the truth, pluck a red rose from off the thorn with me. Then, one after another, all the nobles who were there plucked red or white roses. Those who were for Lancaster, that is the king, because he was descended from John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, wore red roses in their caps. Those who were for the Duke of York wore white roses in theirs. And even after, during all the years that the wars lasted, red and white roses were the sign or badge of the two parties, and the wars were called the Wars of the Roses. Man holding red rose next to group of people with one man putting white rose on hat. One after another, all the nobles plucked red or white roses and put them in their caps. The first battle was fought at St. Albans in 1455 A.D. The white rose won this battle, and King Henry was taken prisoner. The Duke of York treated Henry very kindly and as he became quite mad for a time the duke ruled the country the duke ruled the country the next year however the king recovered from his madness he sent the duke away and once more ruled the kingdom himself or rather it was the queen who ruled for she was very fond of power but did not care in the least to do what was best for the people so she was greatly hated and it was not long before war again broke out. This time, too, the White Rose was successful. Queen Margaret fled to Scotland with her little son, and Henry was again taken prisoner. The Duke of York now claimed the throne in earnest. He entered London in great state. Trumpets were sounded, the sword of office was carried before him, and he was followed and surrounded by a train of soldiers and servants. He rode straight to Westminster, 
where Parliament was sitting, and did not pause until he reached the House of Lords. There he marched up to the throne, and laid his hand upon the cloth of state with which it was covered, as if he meant to show that he had taken possession of it. But he did not sit on the throne. He stood for some time in silence, looking at the empty seat, keeping his hand still upon the cloth. Then turning, he looked at the nobles, as they crowded before him. Still silent, he stood wondering, and as if asking himself, Are they glad or sorry to see me? Then in silence, the Archbishop of Canterbury stepped forward. My Lord Duke, he said, Will you come to see the King? The Duke of York drew himself up proudly. I cannot remember, my Lord Archbishop, he said, that there is any one in this kingdom who should not rather come to me than I go to him. Then he turned and boldly sat upon the throne. Sitting there, the Duke made a long speech to the Lords. He reminded them that Henry the Fourth had taken the crown by force, and tried to show that he, the Duke of York, had a better right to the throne than Henry the Sixth. therefore. He said, According to my just and free title, I have and do take possession of this royal throne, and, with God's help, I shall keep it for his glory, my own honour, and the good of all my people. When the Duke had finished, there was a deep silence. The Lord sat as if struck dumb. In their astonishment they seemed afraid even to whisper or utter one word. It is good, said the Duke at last, that you should think well of what I have said, and rising he went away, not very pleased at their silence, yet not quite displeased either. He went to the royal palace, took possession of Henry's own rooms, and lived there more like a king than a duke. Left to themselves, the lords and the commons, after a great deal of talking, decided that while Henry lived he should still be called king, but that the Duke of York should be protector, and that when Henry died the Duke should be the next king. Henry, who was weak and idle, was quite satisfied with this. So was the Duke, for he was a wise man who really loved his country. He meant to rule well, and hoped in this way to become king without further fighting. But Queen Margaret was very angry. She loved to rule, and she hated the Duke of York, and she would not be ruled by him, nor have her son set aside for him. She came from Scotland, where she had been hiding with her little boy and gathering an army fought another battle with the Duke of York and his followers. It was a terrible battle. This time the Red Rose won, and the Duke of York himself was taken prisoner. After the battle was over, the Red Rose soldiers set the Duke on a little mound. They crowned him with bulrushes, and then knelt before him, crying, Hail King without rule! Hail, King without rule! Hail, King without heritage! Hail, Duke and Prince, without people or possession! And after this cruel mocking of a helpless prisoner, they cut off his head. The wicked Queen Margaret laughed with joy when she saw it, and, to mock the dead man still further, she placed a paper crown upon the head and stuck it upon the walls of York. One of the Duke's sons, a pretty boy of only twelve, was killed too. He was trying to run away with his tutor when he was caught by one of the Red Rose soldiers. Oh, please, please do not kill me, sobbed the boy, the tears running down his cheeks. I do not want to die. But the soldier had a cruel heart and would not listen. Dumb with fear, the poor little boy fell upon his knees, holding up his hands to beg for mercy. But the soldier had no mercy. Your father killed mine, he cried. I will kill you, so the poor little boy died. Queen Margaret had no mercy either. She seemed mad with revenge. 
she killed as many of the White Rose nobles as she could, and the White Rose cause seemed lost. But although Richard, Duke of York, was dead, he had a son called Edward, who now became Duke and the head of the White Rose Party, and more terrible battles were fought. The people hated the Queen for her cruelty and her wickedness. She had no money with which to pay her soldiers, so she allowed them to plunder, and they too were hated and feared wherever they went. The gates of London were closed against them. The people were refusing to give them even the plainest food. But Edward of York was young, brave, and handsome, and, when he came to London with his army, the people threw open the gates to him, welcoming him as their king. Then the Bishop of Exeter, standing up among the great crowds who had gathered to meet him, reminded the people of all the cruel wrongs which they had suffered during Henry's reign. Will you have him still to rule over you? he asked. No, no, shouted the people. No, no, if you will not have Henry, whom will you have? asked the bishop. Will you serve, love, honour, and obey Edward, Earl of March and Duke of York, as your only king and sovereign lord? Yes, yes, shouted the people. King Edward, King Edward, long live King Edward. So with shouting and cheering and clapping of hands, the people chose Edward of York to be their king. Chapter 56 Edward the Fourth, The Story of Queen Margaret and the Robbers It was in 1461 A.D. that the people chose Edward the Fourth as their king, and so there were two kings in England, Henry the Sixth, the head of the Red Rose, and Edward the Fourth, the head of the White Rose Party. There could be no peace in the country, so long as there were two kings, each claiming the throne. So, without waiting to be crowned, Edward marched to meet the Red Rose army and to fight for the crown. On a cold, bleak day in March, the two forces met at Towton in Yorkshire and fought amid a wild storm of wind and snow. For ten hours the battle raged. The white snow was stained, and the river which flowed near ran red with blood till it seemed as if the earth and the sky had taken sides with the red and white roses. Never since Hastings had such a terrible battle been fought on English ground. The white rose was victorious. Henry's cause seemed utterly lost, and he and his wife and their little son fled to Scotland. If Henry had been left to himself, he would have given up fighting for the crown for he loved quiet and peace. But Queen Margaret loved power and would not rest until she had again won the kingdom. She got help from the French king and in three years was back in England once more. But Edward and the great Earl of Warwick, who had helped to put Edward upon the throne, were too strong for Margaret, and she was utterly defeated. Without a single friend or servant, Margaret and her little son, who was now about eleven years old, fled into the forest to hide. The night came on. It grew dark, and they lost their way among the winding paths. Hungry and tired, they did not know which way to turn. Afraid to stop, afraid to go on, starting and shrinking at every sound, they clung to each other, trembling. Presently, they heard men's voices and saw the glimmer of a fire. Margaret whispered to her little son to be very, very still, as they crept near to find out who these people were, whether friends or enemy. Hidden by the trees, the queen and her little boy came quite close to the fire and stood listening and watching. In a few minutes they found out that these men were robbers holding the prince tight by the hand, Queen Margaret made ready to run away. But suddenly one of the robbers looked towards them. He saw the glitter of jewels in the firelight. 
With a cry he made a spring at the queen, and, in spite of her screams and struggles, she was dragged into the circle round the fire. "'Ah! Ah! What have we here?' cried one robber. "'A fine prize, truly,' said another. "'Here is gold enough,' said a third, roughly pulling at the chain round Margaret's neck. "'Come, lady, we will have all these things,' he went on. The queen began to take off her rings and jewels, for she was very much afraid. But one robber pushed the other aside. "'Let be,' he said. "'The prize is mine. I took her. Nay, nay, share and share alike. I say, I took her, I say, it is mine, I say, I took her, I say. So the robbers began to quarrel fiercely about the treasure, and while they quarreled, Margaret took the prince in her arms and ran away. Where she ran she did not know. On and on she went, stumbling through the dark forest. At last, breathless and weary, Unable to go another step, she sank down on a grassy bank. Scarcely had she done so when another robber appeared. Seeing no escape, Margaret went towards this robber, and putting the little prince into his arms. Friend, she said, take care of him. He is the son of your true king. The hard, rough man, accustomed only to murder and rob, felt sorry for the poor, tired lady and her little boy. He held the prince in his arms, saying, Lady, I will not hurt you. Come with me, and I will show you where you can rest safely. The robber led the queen and prince through the forest till he came to his secret cave. There he fed them and kept them safe for some days, and at last took them to the shore, where they found a ship in which to sail over the sea. But King Henry was not so fortunate. He escaped and hid in various places for nearly a year, but he was discovered at last and taken prisoner to London. As he rode a prisoner into the city, he was met by the Earl of Warwick, and the poor unfortunate king was made to ride through the streets like a common criminal, with his feet tied under his horse. Then he was shut up in the Tower of London. Chapter 57 Edward the Fourth, the story of the Kingmaker. Edward the Fourth now felt quite sure of the throne, and he married secretly a beautiful lady called Elizabeth Woodville. When this marriage became known, the Earl of Warwick was very angry, because he thought the king should have married someone more great and powerful. The Earl of Warwick himself was so great and powerful that he was called the king, maker, and he had done much to make Edward king. Edward soon acted in many ways which displeased the earl, and they quarrelled, and plots were formed to drive Edward from the throne. Among the people who plotted against him was the Duke of Clarence, King Edward's own brother. At last the Earl of Warwick became so angry with Edward that he took him prisoner and shut him up in a castle called Middleham. So there were two kings in England, both of them prisoners. The king-maker, having made and unmade the king, now ruled the country himself for a year. He really had intended to make the Duke of Clarence king, but he found that even he was not powerful enough to do that. In about a year's time Warwick set Edward free again, and strange to say, they made up their quarrels, and were friends once more, but in a very short time they again quarrelled. So badly this time, that the Earl of Warwick, who had fought so hard for the White Rose of York, forsook it, and joined the Red Rose of Lancaster. He went to France, where Margaret and her son were, and offered to help them to conquer England and place Henry again on the throne. So one morning Edward awoke to hear the Red Rose War cry, and two friends, running into his room, begged him to fly. For, they said, even in your own army we know not who is true and who is false, many like Warwick having turned traitor. 
hardly waiting to dress without money or armor, Edward threw himself upon his horse and rode as fast as possible to the coast. There he found some ships, and with a few friends, and two or three hundred faithful soldiers, he sailed over to Holland. They were very poor. They had no money, nor goods, nor indeed anything except the clothes they wore. Edward, who had one day been King of England, Wales, and Ireland, found himself the next a homeless, penniless wanderer, and Warwick, in little more than a week, had deposed the king whom he had helped to set on the throne, and had placed Henry the Sixth once more there. Henry was brought out of prison, and dressed in beautiful robes, and riding upon a splendid horse, was led through the town, while the people cheered and shouted, God save the king! Long live King Harry! Did he remember that the last time he rode through the same streets, it had been as a wretched prisoner, bound and disgraced by the very man who now set him again on the throne? And did he remember that the people, who now cheered, had then cursed and laughed at him? Although Henry was once more on the throne, he could not rule. He was like a wooden doll in the hands of a clever man, such as the Earl of Warwick, and it was the Earl and the Duke of Clarence who ruled. Henry would have been far happier had he been left alone to his books and prayers. He loved peace, yet he was made the cause of war by the proud and powerful men and women around him Edward had been obliged to fly from the country. Penniless and almost friendless, yet he did not despair. He persuaded the Duke of Burgundy to help him, and soon returned to England with an army. No sooner had he landed than people began to flock to him. By the time he reached Barnet, near London, he had a large army. No sooner had he landed than people began to flock to him. By the time he reached Barnet, near London, he had a large army. Many who had joined Warwick now forsook him and returned to Edward, among them Edward's own brother, the Duke of Clarence, who brought twelve thousand men with him. There seemed to be no faith nor loyalty in those days. It was hard to know who was friend and who was foe. At Barnet on Easter Day, 14th April, 1470, 1 A.D., another terrible battle was fought. What made it more terrible was that it was begun and ended in a thick mist. In the white dimness, which wrapped both armies, it was difficult to know the red rose from the white and indeed at one time the red rose fought against themselves. King Edward's men wore a golden sun embroidered upon their coats. The Duke of Oxford's men, who were fighting for King Henry, wore a golden star. In the mist the red rose soldiers, mistaking the star for the sun, attacked the Duke of Oxford's men, thinking that they were King Edward's men, and killed many of them. From dawn to midday the battle raged. Then the Earl of Warwick's army broke and fled, leaving the White Rose victorious. The great kingmaker was found dead upon the field, and Edward the Fourth was once more king. On the very day of this battle, Queen Margaret and her son, who was now about eighteen, landed in England. They had hoped to find Warwick victorious, and Henry on the throne. Instead they found Warwick dead, his army shattered, and Edward on the throne. But Margaret was as bold as ever. She marched through England, gathering soldiers as she went, and at Tewkesbury another great battle was fought. Here again the Red Rose was utterly defeated, and Margaret and her son were taken prisoner. Prince Edward was led before King Edward. The king looked fiercely at the young and handsome prince. He hated him more than he had ever hated his poor, weak, gentle father. How dare you come into my kingdom to stir up my people to rebellion? He asked. It is not your kingdom, but my father's, replied Prince Edward proudly. You are a traitor. I should sit where you are. You should stand before me as a subject. 
Then King Edward, pale with rage and hate, struck the boy in the face with his steel-gloved hand. The Dukes of Clarence and Gloucester, the King's brothers, dragged the prince away and stabbed him to death. Queen Margaret was put in prison, and a few days later King Henry died mysteriously in the Tower of London. Many people thought that he was murdered by King Edward's brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. At last it seemed as if all Edward's enemies were either dead or in prison, and that he might really rule in peace. The Red Rose Party was for the time utterly crushed. Some of the great nobles even were seen barefoot and in rags, begging for bread from door to door. Edward never quite forgave his brother, the Duke of Clarence, for having, at one time, sided with Warwick. Clarence, too, was jealous of the Queen Elizabeth and her relatives, many of whom had the chief posts at court, so he quarrelled with them, and with his brother, the King. At last, an old wizard prophesied that someone whose name began with G would bring about the death of King Edward and the ruin of his house. The Duke of Clarence was called George, and King Edward made the prophecy an excuse for shutting him up in the tower. He never came out again. It is supposed that he was murdered. Some say by being drowned in a cask of wine by the order of his brother, the Duke of Gloucester. Edward the Fourth died in 1483 A.E.D. He was brave, but cruel and revengeful, handsome but wicked, caring little for the happiness of his people, and his reign was dark with many battles and murders. He had ruled for twenty-two years, during twelve of which King Henry still lived. Chapter 58 Edward V the story of the king who was never crowned. When Edward the Fourth died, his eldest son was only thirteen, but the people willingly chose him to be king. The young Prince of Wales, now Edward the Fifth, was living at Ludlow Castle with his uncle, Lord Rivers, when the news of his father's death was brought to him. He at once set out for London, accompanied by his uncle, and some gentlemen. On the way he was met by another uncle, Richard of Gloucester, who was a wicked, hard-hearted man. He sent Lord Rivers and his friends to prison, and himself took charge of the young king. Edward was very fond of Lord Rivers, and was afraid of his ugly uncle Richard. He cried when Lord Rivers and his friends were taken away from him. That did no good. But the poor little king was only a boy, and he did not know what else to do. When the queen heard of what had happened, she was so frightened that she ran away from the palace in which she had been living, taking her daughters and her other little son, who was called Richard, with her. She ran to Westminster Abbey, and there took sanctuary, as Hubert de Burgh did, you remember. Many years before, in the days of Henry the Third, the Duke of Gloucester, had the young king in his power, but he was not satisfied with it. He wanted to have Prince Richard too. Queen Elizabeth, however, would not give up her little boy, who was only ten years old, and the Duke of Gloucester, bad though he was, was afraid to take him by force because he was still trying to pretend to be a good, kind uncle to the little boys. At last the Duke sent a bishop to the Queen to try to persuade her to give up her little son. This bishop said everything he could think of to make her do so, but all in vain. My little boy has been ill, said the Queen. He is not well enough yet to leave his mother. Ah, lady, said the bishop. It is not kind to his brother, the king, to keep him here. They should be together, so that they could play with each other. Oh, surely some other little boy could play with the king, said the queen. Little boys, even if they are kings, 
Do not ask that their playmates should be princes. I cannot, I will not, let my little boy go. Let him come to me, and I will guard his life as my own, said the bishop. At these words the queen stood for a long time, thinking silently. It seemed to her as if she must give up her boy sooner or later. It would be better to give him up to this kind bishop, who would perhaps keep him safe, than to his wicked uncle. So, taking the prince by the hand, she led him to the bishop. I know you are faithful and true, she said. You are strong and powerful, too, and, oh, for the trust his father put in you, I now charge you, guard my boy. Then, kneeling beside her little son, and putting her arms round him, she held him close to her heart. Farewell, my own sweet son, she said. God give you good keeping. Let me kiss you yet once before you go, for God knows when we shall kiss together again. Then she kissed him and blessed him, and kissed him again and again, and at last, crying bitterly, put him into the arms of the bishop, and turned her face from him. But, weeping as bitterly, little Richard clung to her, and would not go, until the bishop, taking him strongly in his arms, carried him away. The bishop led the prince straight to his uncle, who was very glad to see him. His ugly face shone with joy as he took his nephew in his arms and kissed him. Now welcome, my lord, he said. With all my heart you are right welcome. King Edward, too, was very glad to see his brother, for they had been parted for a long time. The duke led them through the streets with great pomp and put them into the tower. Now that the Duke of Gloucester had both the princes in his power, he began to show his wickedness. He sent to the prison, in which Lord Rivers and his friends were imprisoned, and ordered their heads to be cut off, because he knew that they were the Queen's friends. Then he called a council to arrange, he said, about the coronation. Only a very few lords were asked to this council. When they were all gathered together, he came into the room seemingly very much disturbed. What should be done to people who try to murder me? he asked. At first every one was so astonished that no one spoke. Then Lord Hastings, who was a brave man, and true to the king and the queen his mother, said, if any one has tried, he deserves to be punished, whoever he is. The queen has tried with her sorcery, cried the duke, and others have helped her. And pulling up his sleeve, he showed his arm, which was all puckered and withered. In those days it was believed that people had power to hurt their enemies by saying wicked words and rhymes and wishing evil to them. It was thought that people could even kill others who were quite far away, and who they could not even see nor touch. This was called sorcery. Of course, it was a very foolish belief, and everyone knew that the Duke of Gloucester's arm had always been withered up, but when he said that the Queen had done it by sorcery, no one dared to contradict him. There was silence in the hall, till Lord Hastings said, If the Queen has done this, you answer me, with ifs and ands, cried the Duke. You are a traitor, a traitor, I say. And with that he struck with his hand upon the table. Immediately soldiers rushed into the room. Seize him, he said, pointing to Lord Hastings. Cut off his head. My lord, said Hastings, I am no traitor. You are a traitor, yelled the duke, and by heaven I will not dine till I see your head cut from your body. Obey your orders, he added, turning to the soldiers. Lord Hastings was hurried away, and without being allowed to defend himself, 
without a trial of any kind, he was made to lay his neck upon a rough plank of wood which happened to be at hand, and his head was at once cut off, so another of the king's friends was dead. The Duke of Gloucester next made a clergyman, called Shaw, preach to the people, and tell them that the little princes were not really the sons of King Edward the Fourth and his queen, and that, therefore, they had no right to the throne of England. Our true king, said this wicked clergyman, is Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Then he waited, expecting every one to cry out, King Richard, King Richard, but there was not a sound. The people stood as if they had been turned into stone, pale and trembling. They went away to their homes, wondering what would happen next. The clergyman, too, went home. He was so ashamed to have preached such a wicked sermon that he never again showed himself to the people, and died soon after. The Duke of Gloucester was very angry and disappointed when he heard of the bad success of his wicked plans. But he did not give them up. He again gathered a lot of people together, and this time his friend, the Duke of Buckingham, talked to them. The Duke of Buckingham said much the same things as the clergyman had said. When the people heard these wicked lies for the second time, they began to whisper among themselves, till it seemed as if a swarm of buzzing bees filled the hall. But not a single person shouted King Richard. Then some of the Duke's servants and friends came into the hall, and they shouted King Richard, King Richard, King Richard. But the cries sounded very feeble, for they came from only a few. The Duke of Buckingham, however, pretended that all the people had shouted for King Richard. He thanked them, and he and his friends went to the Duke of Gloucester, and told him that the people had chosen him as their king, and were cheering and shouting for King Richard. Richard then pretended to be very unwilling to take the crown, and only consented to do so after a great deal of persuasion. This was all a part of his wickedness and cunning. Richard was crowned with much splendor and grandeur, and poor little King Edward, who had never been crowned at all, and who had only been called king for a few weeks, was kept shut up in the Tower of London. Chapter 59 Richard the Third, The Story of the Two Little Princes in the Tower when Edward was told what his uncle had done, he was very sad and very much afraid. Oh, he said, I hope my uncle will not take my life as he has taken my kingdom. From that day he became sorrowful and did not seem to care about anything. He did not even trouble to dress himself properly. Richard took away all the little prince's servants and left them only one man called Black Bill. He was rough and rude, but even he loved the gentle little boys and tried to comfort them. For shut up in one room with nothing to do, the days seemed very long and dreary. But although Richard was king, he could not be happy. He could not forget the little princes in the tower. As long as they lived, he knew that some day the people might drag him from the throne and make one of them king instead. So he determined to kill Edward and his brother. King Richard sent a message to the governor of the tower telling him to kill the princes. But the governor refused to do the wicked deed. Richard, however, could always find men bad enough to do what he wanted. He sent a bad man now to the governor of the tower commanding him to give up the keys of the tower for one night. The governor was forced to obey the king, but he did so with a sad heart. That night the little princes went to sleep with their arms round each other's necks. Each trying to comfort the other, they lay together in a great big bed, happy in their dreams, with tears still wet upon their cheeks. As they slept two men crept softly, softly up the dark stair. Quietly they opened the door and stole into the room. 
they stood beside the bed, hardly daring to look at the two pretty children, in case the sight might soften even their hard hearts, and they would be unable to do the cruel deed. Then they seized the clothes and the pillows, and pressed them over the faces of the little boys. They could not scream, they could not breathe. Soon they lay still, smothered in their sleep. Then the wicked men took the bodies of the two little princes, threw them into a hole which they had made under the staircase, covered them over, and fled away. There the bodies were found many years later. Now that Richard had murdered the rightful king and his brother, he was no happier. Terrible dreams came to him at night so that he could not sleep. By day he thought that people were ever ready to kill him, and his hand was almost always on his dagger. The people hated him, and he knew no rest nor peace. He tried to make good laws so that the people might forget his wickedness, but it was no use. They hated him in spite of all he could do. Plots against Richard soon began. Even the Duke of Buckingham, who had helped him in his wickedness and put him on the throne, turned against him. The people longed for another king, and their thoughts went out to Henry Tudor, Duke of Richmond. Two boys sitting in a bedchamber in a castle. The days seemed very long and dreary to the two little boys. You remember that Queen Catherine, the widow of King Henry V, married a Welsh gentleman called Owen Tudor. This Henry Tudor was her grandson, and he was also descended from John of Gaunt. He belonged to the House of Lancaster, and had fought for the Red Rose. Henry of Richmond was at this time living in France, but he now gathered an army and came over to England. But before he came, Richard had already fought the Duke of Buckingham. He defeated him, took him prisoner, and then cut off his head. When Henry heard that, he went away again, but he soon came back. This time, as soon as Henry landed, people flocked to him, noble after noble, deserted Richard and joined the Red Rose Party. In 1485 A.D., a great battle was fought called the Battle of Bosworth Field. This was the last of the Wars of the Roars, of the Roses, and in it King Richard was killed. He fought well, for although he was small and deformed, he could fight. His horse was killed under him, but he still fought on foot. In the middle of the battle, Lord Stanley left the king, and, with all his followers, joined Henry Tudor. Seeing that the battle was lost, some of his nobles begged Richard to fly, but he would not. I will die a king, he said, and so he fell in the thickest of the fight. As he fell, the crown which he had worn over his helmet rolled away under a hawthorn tree. There it was found by Lord Stanley, who set it upon Henry Tudor's head, and on the battlefield with the dead and dying round, the soldiers shouted, King Henry, King Henry, long live King Henry. The place is still called Crown Hill to this day. Richard III had reigned two years, two months, and one day, and it was twenty-six months and twenty-four hours too long, said a man who lived about that time, and who tells his story. Chapter 60 Henry the Seventh, The Story of a Make Believe, Prince, with Henry Tudor, a new race of kings, began to reign in England. For more than three hundred years, the kings of England had been Plantagenet. Henry the Second was the first of the Plantagenets, and he took his name from Geoffrey of Anjou, who used to wear a piece of Plantagenista in his cap. With Richard the Third, the last of the Plantagenets died, for Henry the Seventh, though a Plantagenet on his mother's side, was a Tudor on his father's side, and it was from his family that Henry took his name. The Tudors were Welsh, and claimed to be descended from the ancient British princes 
who, you remember, were driven into Wales when the Saxons took possession of England. The Battle of Bosworth Field was the last of the Wars of the Roses. Henry Tudor, who was the Red Rose Prince, married Elizabeth, the daughter of Edward the Fourth and sister of the little princes who were murdered in the tower. She was the White Rose Princess, but by marrying Henry she became the Red Rose Queen, and the differences between the House of Lancaster and the House of York, between the Red Rose and the White, ought to have been quite forgotten. But Henry himself could not entirely forget these quarrels, which had been so bitter. There were many people in England who still belonged to the White Rose Party. Although they had hated Richard, they were not pleased to see a Red Rose king upon the throne. So Henry the Seventh was hardly crowned before rebellions against him began. Soon after Henry the Seventh was crowned, a handsome boy and a priest landed in Dublin. He was, he said, the son of that Duke of Clarence, brother of Edward the Fourth, who was murdered in the tower by being drowned in a cask of wine. The priest, he said, was his tutor. Ever since the death of his father, the Earl of Warwick had been kept a prisoner. But now, he said, he had escaped in some wonderful manner. The simple Irish people believed this story. They knew nothing of Henry, and had no reason for either hating or loving him. But they did love the House of York, for the Earl of Warwick's grandfather had at one time governed Ireland in the name of the King, and, having governed well, the people remembered and loved him. So now they welcomed this young prince with great joy. Edward, Earl of Warwick, as he called himself, was gay and young and handsome, and he gained the love of the Irish so much that they resolved to crown him king. This was done with great rejoicing in Dublin. But they had no crown, so the priest took the golden crown from the statue of the Virgin Mary, which was in the church, and put it upon the boy's head. Then, wearing this crown, and dressed in beautiful robes. The new king was carried through the streets on the shoulders of a great strong Irish chieftain, while the people shouted, Long live King Edward the Sixth! Having been crowned in Ireland, Edward the Sixth thought he would next conquer England. So he sailed across the Irish Sea, and landed in England with a small army of wild Irishmen and Germans. Meanwhile, Henry the Seventh had heard of these doings in Ireland and had not been idle. He brought the real Earl of Warwick out of the tower, where he had been kept prisoner ever since he had been quite a tiny boy, dressed in fine clothes and riding upon a splendid horse. The real Earl was slowly led through the streets of London, from the tower to St. Paul's, and back again by another way. He was led so that all the people might see him. The young Earl had spent all his life in prison. It must have been a wonderful thing for him to come out into the open streets, to see the blue sky and the houses and the trees, the great procession of soldiers and knights in glittering armor and gorgeous clothes, and the people men, women, and children, crowding in the streets, all eager to see him. And having been led out, having seen for once all the life and stir of the great city, the poor young prince was taken back again to his dull, quiet prison, while the king marched with his army to fight the pretended earl. The two armies met at a place called Stoke. Very few English had joined the pretender, for they were quite sure that the earl whom they had seen riding through the streets of London was the real earl, and that this one was only a make-believe. The pretender's soldiers were soon defeated, 
for most of them were wild Irishmen badly armed, and wearing no armor they were no match for Henry's well-armed and well-trained soldiers. The pretender was taken prisoner, and so was the priest who was with him. They confessed that the prince was no prince at all, but a boy called Lambert Simnel, the son of a baker. The priest, who was a Yorkist or white rose man, hated Henry, and finding that the boy Lambert was clever as well as handsome, he taught him how to behave as a prince ought. He told him stories of the Duke of Clarence and of Richard the Third, so that he might pretend to be what he was not. Henry did not kill Lambert Simnel, as many kings who reigned before him would have done. Instead, he gave him a punishment which, had Lambert indeed been a prince, would have been a very dreadful one. He was sent into the king's kitchen to be a scullery boy and to help the cooks. This boy, who had worn a crown and royal robes, who had been carried through the streets shoulder-high while the people cheered him as their king, was a few days later turned into a kitchen drudge, to be ordered about by the cooks and set to do the meanest kinds of work. But Lambert Simnel behaved himself so well that the king soon took him out of the kitchen and made him a kind of page. He had then to look after the king's falcons. All great people kept falcons in those days. They were used for hunting, and were trained to fly up in the air to catch and kill other birds. A great deal of time and money was spent on falcons. They had hoods of velvet and jewels, and gold and silver chain. Lambert must have found his new work much more pleasant than helping the cooks in the hot kitchens. The priest who had taught Lambert Simnel was allowed to go free, but some of the nobles who had helped him were beheaded, and others were made to pay large sums of money. Chapter 61 Henry the Seventh the story of another make, Believe Prince. A few years after the rebellion of Lambert Simnel there was another which lasted longer and was more serious. A second handsome boy, even more handsome gay and princely than Lambert Simnel, landed in Ireland. He was, he said, Richard, Duke of York, the younger of the two little princes who had been smothered in the tower by order of their uncle Richard. It was quite true, he said, that his brother, Edward V, had been killed. But the wicked murderers had not been cruel enough to kill them both, and he had been saved. For seven years he had been wandering about the world from place to place. Now he had come to claim his own again and take the throne from Henry. This story was not true. The boy's real name was Perkin Warbeck, but, like Lambert Simnel, he had been taught to tell these lies by the enemies of Henry, who hoped in this way to drive him from the throne. Although the Irish had already been deceived once, they believed Perkin Warbeck, and many people promised to help him. The French king, who was quarrelling with Henry, invited him to come to France. There he was kindly treated, and more help was promised to him. But Henry, who always avoided war when he could, made peace with France, and the French king, although he would not betray Perkin to the English king, sent him out of France. When he was obliged to leave the French court, Perkin went to Margaret, Duchess of Burgundy. This lady was a sister of Edward the Fourth, and she hated Henry the Seventh so much that she was glad to hurt or annoy him when she could. She had helped Lambert Simnel, and now she welcomed Perkin as her nephew. She said that he was very like his supposed father, Edward the Fourth, and she called him the White Rose of England. Just as Henry had taken trouble to prove that Lambert Simnel was a false earl, now he took trouble to prove that Perkin was a false prince. He sent spies to the places where Perkin had been born, and had lived till now, and made sure that he was really Perkin or Peterkin Warbeck. Then he found the two men who had killed the princes in the tower. They confessed to the murder, but they were not punished for it, perhaps because Henry thought they had not been so much to blame as Richard III, who had made them do it. 
But in spite of all this, many people believed in Perkin, the King of Scotland. Not that King, who had been kept prisoner for such a long time in England, believed in him so much that he not only helped him with soldiers, but married him to his cousin, a beautiful lady called Catherine Gordon. Like Lambert Simnel, Perkin was crowned, and his followers called him Richard the Fourth. The rebellion went on for about five years. Battles were fought now and again, but Perkin was never successful. His beautiful wife, Catherine, went everywhere with him. She at least believed in him and loved him. At last, hearing that the men of Cornwall were angry with the king because he had taxed them too heavily, Perkin decided to try his fortune there. He landed in Cornwall, left his beautiful wife at St. Michael's Mount, where she might be safe, and marched to besiege Exeter. But the people of Exeter were true to the king and would not yield, so Perkin grew tired of besieging a town which would not yield, and he marched away to Taunton. There, hearing that Henry was coming against him with a great army, he took fright and ran away in the night. Next morning, when Perkin's poor soldiers woke up and found that they had lost their leader, they had no heart to fight. Some of them ran away like Perkin. Others gave themselves up, begging the king to forgive them. They were all gathered together in a churchyard at Exeter, their heads and their feet bare and ropes, around their necks. King Henry came to a great window and looked down upon them. When the people saw him, they all fell upon their knees, begging for pardon. There were so many of them that the king could not punish all. So he spoke to them, and warning them not to rebel again, said he would forgive them all, except the ringleaders who should be put to death. Then, with a great cry of rejoicing and thanks, and thanks the people threw the ropes from their necks and went to their homes, Henry sent to St. Michael's Mount for the Lady Catherine, Perkin's beautiful wife, and when she was brought before him, blushing and trembling and fearful of the rough soldiers, the king felt so sorry for her that he treated her as a royal guest. He gave her a guard of honour, and sent her to London to the court of his Queen Elizabeth. There she lived for many years, loved and admired for her beauty and her gentleness. She was so lovely that she was called the White Rose of England, the name which the Duchess of Burgundy had given to her cowardly husband. Meanwhile, Perkin had taken sanctuary at a place called Beaulieu. Henry would not seize him while he remained in sanctuary, but he kept such a close watch that Perkin could find no way of escape and at last gave himself up. Henry would not see nor speak with Perkin, but made him ride in his train to London. When they arrived there, all the people came out into the streets to see the wonderful man who had pretended to be a prince, and who had made people believe in him for so many years. Perkin was even more fortunate than Lambert Simnel had been. He was neither put in prison, nor was he made a servant. He was allowed to live at court like a gentleman, although there were guards always with him who had orders never to lose sight of him. Perkin might have spent the rest of his life in peace, but he soon grew tired of being watched, and one day he managed to run away. But he did not run very far. Henry's soldiers were too quick for him, and once more Perkin gave himself up. This time Henry punished Perkin by putting him in the stocks for two whole days, first at Westminster and then at Cheapside. He also made him read a paper aloud, in which he confessed that the story he had told was not true, and that he was not the Duke of York. In those days people were often punished by being put in the stocks. They had to sit in a very uncomfortable position with their feet through holes in a board. It was uncomfortable and painful also, and was considered a great disgrace. 
Little boys, and grown-up people too, used to hoot and yell at those in the stocks, and pelt them with mud, rotten eggs, and other disagreeable things. After Perkin Warbeck had been in the stocks for two days, Henry shut him up in the tower. There he met the Earl of Warwick. The real Earl, not Lambert Simnel. These two prisoners were allowed to talk together, and soon they formed a plot to kill the governor of the tower and escape. But the plot was found out, and that put an end to Perkin Warbeck, for Henry, thinking that he was too dangerous to be allowed to live any longer, ordered his head to be cut off. The poor Earl of Warwick was also put to death. This was a needless and cruel act, for the Earl alone was too simple to harm anyone. Indeed, he was so ignorant of the world and the things in it that it was said he did not know the difference between a hen and a goose. Except for the wars which these pretenders, Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel, caused, the reign of Henry the Seventh was very peaceful. One reason for that was that Henry was greedy, and he knew that wars cost a great deal of money. Once indeed he got money from the people in order to make war against the French. But as soon as he got it, he made peace and kept the money for himself. The people were very angry, but Henry as a king was far more powerful than the Plantagenets had ever been, and the people had to submit. One reason why the Tudors were such powerful kings was that, during the Wars of the Roses, nearly all the nobles were killed. The king took all the money and lands which had belonged to these dead nobles, and so he became very rich. Being rich, he did not need to ask Parliament for grants of money, so the people became less powerful. Indeed, during a great part of Henry's reign he called no Parliament, which shows how much he had of his own way. About this time two very wonderful things happened which made a great difference throughout the world. One was the discovery of printing. The other was the discovery of America. Up to the time of Edward the Fourth, books had all been written by hand, and they were so dear that only a few rich people could buy them. But when a clever man called Caxton brought the art of printing to England, books became cheaper, and people began to think more about learning and less about fighting. Then Columbus discovered America. That, too, made people think less about fighting for they gave up quarrelling about little bits of the old world, and turned their thoughts to exploring the wonders of the new world, as Columbus called the land he discovered. Chapter 62 Henry the Eighth, The Story of the Field of the Cloth of Gold Long before Henry the Seventh died in 1509 A.D., all the joy and love which the people had felt for him when he came to the throne had faded away. He had proved to be a hard and greedy king, and no one was sorry when he died. His son was also called Henry, and he was only eighteen years old when his father died. He was gay and handsome, and the people believed him to be generous and good, so there was great rejoicing when he was crowned. Henry's chancellor was a man called Wolsey. He was a very great man, and for many years it was really he who ruled England. Wolsey was the son of a butcher. Being a clever boy, he was sent to school, and afterwards to college at Oxford. There he showed himself to be so clever that people soon began to notice him, and he quickly rose from one post to another until he became chaplain to Henry the Seventh. Henry the Seventh found Wolsey very useful to him. He became one of Prince Henry's greatest friends, and when Prince Henry became king, he made Wolsey Chancellor and Archbishop of York, and heaped upon him many other honours and posts, until he was almost as rich and as great and as great and as great as the king himself. Wolsey had most splendid houses and about five hundred servants, all of whom wore most beautiful clothes. His cook even wore a satin or velvet coat, and had a gold chain around his neck. 
Wolsey himself, dressed most gorgeously in bright red silk or satin, and he wore gilded shoes set with pearls and jewels. Whenever he went out, there was a great procession. A man carrying a mace walked first, then came two gentlemen carrying silver wands, then two of the biggest and handsomest priests that could be found, each carrying a great silver cross. Then came Wolsey mounted upon a mule. He rode upon a mule because he said, being a humble priest, it was more fitting for him than a horse. But the harness and saddle were of velvet and gold, and behind him came a long train of his servants and followers on splendid horses. Henry the Eighth was fond of magnificence and show, and it pleased him to have so fine a chancellor. Henry was gay, and the chancellor was gay. If Henry were sad, Wolsey would joke and laugh until the king laughed too. If Henry were merry, Wolsey would be merry with him. Soon people began to see that if they wanted anything from the king, it was best to make friends with the chancellor. Wolsey, on the whole, made good use of his power. He was fond of learning. He saw that without learning no country could be truly great, and he founded a school at Ipswich, which was his birthplace, and a college at Oxford. If he tried to make himself great, he also thought of England and how to make England great. The first few years of Henry's reign were peaceful and quiet. Henry the Seventh had been a very rich man when he died, so Henry the Eighth had plenty of money, and at first the people were not troubled with new taxes. Henry pleased everyone by marrying a rich and beautiful lady called Catherine of Aragon. She was a widow, having already been married to Henry's elder brother, who was called Arthur. Arthur would have been king had he lived, but he had died a few months after his marriage with Catherine. After Arthur died, Henry the Seventh kept Catherine at the English court, in the hope that his second son, Henry, would one day marry her. This he now did, although it was then, and still is, against the law for a man to marry his dead brother's wife. However, as Henry thought it was a wise thing for him to marry Catherine, he asked the Pope to give him leave to do so. And the Pope, whom you know, was a very powerful person, gave him leave. In those days people were never long content to be at peace, and Henry soon began to fight with France and with Scotland. In a battle called Flodden, the Scots were defeated, and their king killed, and Henry made peace with the queen, who was his own sister. Soon afterwards he also made peace with France. Henry then decided it would be wise not only to be at peace with France, but to make friends with the French king. So the great chancellor, Wolsey, arranged a meeting between Francis I of France and Henry VIII of England. This meeting took place on a plain in France, near a little town called Gisnes, and everything about it was so splendid that it was called the Field of the Cloth of Gold. A palace for the English king was built so quickly that it seemed like a magic thing. It was only made of wood, but it was so painted and gilded that it shone and glittered in the sunshine like a fairy palace. Great golden gates opened into a courtyard where a fountain, sparkling with gold and gems, flowed all day with red and white wine instead of water. This fountain bore the motto, Make good cheer who will. The palace walls were hung inside with cloth of gold and silver. Everything was rich with embroidery and sparkling with gems. Wherever possible, gold and jewels shone, the queen's foot tools even being sewn with pearls. When the French king saw Henry's splendid palace, he did not wish to be outdone. He set up a great tent, the center pole of which was a gilded mast. The tent was lined inside with blue velvet. The roof was spangled with golden stars, and a golden sun and moon shone night and day. The outside was covered with cloth of gold, and the ropes which held it up 
were of blue silk and gold. The tent looked very grand and glittered in the sunshine like a ball of fire. But when everything was ready, a terrible wind arose which snapped the ropes of silk and gold, broke the mast, and brought the blue velvet sky, the glittering stars, and golden walls to the ground. So Francis had to content himself with living in an old castle, which stood not far away, and very likely he was far more comfortable there than he would have been in his golden and blue tent. When all was ready, King Henry and Queen Catherine sailed from England, and with them a great company of nobles, each trying to be more splendid than the other. The two kings met on the plain near Henry's palace. They were both dressed in gold and silver cloth, and rode beautiful horses with harness of gold and velvet, while still on horseback they embraced and kissed each other. My dear brother and cousin, said Francis, I have come a long way to see you. I hope you will think that I am worthy of your love and help. My great possessions show how powerful I am, replied Henry. I never saw a prince with my eyes that I could love better with my heart, and for your love I have crossed the seas to the furthest bounds of my kingdom in order to see you. Then the kings got off their horses and, arm in arm, walked to a gorgeous tent nearby, where a very fine dinner was prepared for them. For three weeks there were gay times. Grand tournaments were held, in which the kings fought with the knights, and the kings always won. There were balls and feasts, too. Sometimes the kings and queens and lords and ladies dressed up and disguised themselves so that no one could tell who was who. This, they thought, was the greatest fun of all. The English people were very fond of wrestling, and the soldiers used to amuse themselves in this way. Henry was fond of all kinds of games and sport, and one day, while watching the soldiers, he proposed to King Francis that they, too, should try a wrestling match, and laughingly laid hold of his collar. Francis was quite pleased, for, although he did not look so strong as Henry, he was very quick and wiry. Soon the two kings were struggling together, and in a few minutes Henry was lying upon the ground. He sprang up with a laugh, and wanted to try again. But the nobles who stood round persuaded him not to do so. They were afraid that what had begun in fun might end in a quarrel, if Francis should again throw Henry down, for Henry had a very fiery temper. Francis felt, too, that, in spite of all the show of friendship, there was no love between the French and the English. This was hardly to be wondered at, for they had been such bitter enemies for so long a time that it was hard to forget all at once. Francis himself, however, was really generous, and wished it really could be forgotten. One morning Francis rose early, and, without telling any of his nobles, he rode quite alone to the English camp. Henry was still in bed when King Francis came into his room and said, Laughing, my dear cousin, I come to you of my own free will. I am now your prisoner. Henry was very pleased to see that Francis trusted him so much that he was not afraid to come quite alone like this. He sprang out of bed and threw a chain of gold round the French king's neck. In return, Francis gave Henry a beautiful bracelet, and then, laughing and joking like a schoolboy, he insisted on helping Henry to dress. He warmed his shirt, helped him to tie and button his clothes, and then, mounting on his horse, rode gaily home. When he came near his castle, he was met by some of his nobles, who were anxiously looking for him. Francis laughingly told them what he had been doing. "'Sire,' said one of them, "'I am very glad to see you back again. But let me tell you, master, you were a fool to do what you have done. 
Ill luck be to him who advised you to do it. Well, that was nobody, replied Francis. The thought was all my own. In spite of the fears and jealousy of the French and English, the meeting came to an end as peacefully as it had begun. Henry sailed home again with all his gay knights, but many of them were quite ruined and penniless. They had spent all their money on fine clothes and jewels, so anxious were they to make a great display and be grander than the French. But all this splendor and show of friendliness meant nothing and came to nothing. For Henry, both immediately before and after this meeting with Francis, met and plotted with Charles, the Emperor of Germany, who was the enemy of Francis. When war again broke out, the English fought against the French, as they had always done. Chapter 63 Henry the Eighth how the king became the defender of the faith, and how the great cardinal died. In the reign of Henry the Eighth, the Pope was still the head of all the Christian Church, although, as long ago as the time of Edward the Third, a man called John Wycliffe had begun to preach and teach against his rule over the English Church. Wycliffe translated the Bible from Latin into English and encouraged the people to read it. His followers were called Lollards, and they helped the people at the time of Wat Tyler's rebellion in the reign of Richard II. The heads of the church hated the Lollards, and Henry IV, who wanted to please the priests, made a law saying that anyone who would not believe just what the Pope said he must believe should be burned to death. This was a very wicked law, and it marked the beginning of another struggle for freedom in England. That is the struggle for freedom of conscience, which means freedom to think and do what one feels to be right in matters of religion, instead of being forced to think and do as someone else says is right. For some time now very little had been heard of the Lollards but the things which Wycliffe had taught had not been forgotten. After printing was discovered and books became cheaper, people began to read and, in consequence, to think much more than they had done before. The more people read and thought, the more difficult some of them found it to believe just what they were ordered to believe by the Pope. It was not only in England that this was happening, but in many other lands as well. In Germany, a monk called Martin Luther, after thinking a great deal about it, decided that some things which were done in the Romish church were wrong. He was brave enough to say what he thought, and, in spite of the anger of the Pope and the priests, a great many people followed Martin Luther and left the Roman Catholic Church. This is the beginning of what is called the Reformation. That is a long word, but it is quite easy to understand. It is made from two Latin words, re, again, and forma, to form or make. It means that the people who left the Roman Church again formed or made the Church. These people were called Protestants. The word Protestant is also made from two Latin words, pro, publicly, and testari, to bear witness. So a Protestant really means someone who openly and publicly bears witness or protests. We can hardly understand how bold and brave a thing these Protestants did. Now everyone is free to believe what they think is best and right, but in those days people who could not agree with the Pope were cruelly punished or put to death. Now. Protestant churches and Roman Catholic churches stand side by side, and we do not kill and hate each other because we worship God in different ways. But in those days nothing caused such cruel suffering and such bitter hatred. When King Henry heard what Martin Luther had done, he was very angry. 
Being a clever man and proud of his learning and knowledge about religion, he wrote a book against Martin Luther and his teaching. This book he had bound most beautifully, and then he sent it to the Pope. With great splendor and ceremony, dressed in his most magnificent robes, and sitting upon his throne with all his priests around him, the Pope received Henry's messenger. The messenger knelt humbly, presenting the book, and kissing first the Pope's toe, and then his cheek. Afterwards the messenger made a long speech, and the Pope made a long speech, and so the ceremony ended. When the Pope had read the book, he was so pleased with it that he gave the King of England a new title. He called him Fide Defensor, which means Defender of the Faith. He wrote a letter to Henry, thanking him for his book, and calling him our most dear son Henry, the illustrious King of England and Defender of the Faith. Henry was very proud of his new title, and he held a solemn service in the church at Westminster when the Pope's letter was read and the King's new title proclaimed. Afterwards Henry quarrelled with the Pope, but he kept the title of Defender of the Faith, and it has been borne by the kings and queens of England ever since, although the faith they now defend is no longer the faith of the Roman Catholic Church. If you look at some of the coins which we use now, you will see FD, or FID, DEF, upon them. These letters mean Fidea Defensor, or Defender of the Faith. King Henry quarrelled with the Pope because he would not let him put away his wife, Queen Catherine. Queen Catherine had done no wrong, but she was some years older than Henry, and now that he had been married to her for nearly twenty years, and she was no longer young and pretty, he had grown tired and wanted another wife. Henry was very selfish. He thought a great deal of his own pleasure, and always wanted to have his own way. Years before, when he wished to marry Catherine, he had made the Pope give him leave to do so, although it was against the laws of the Church, because, as you remember, she had already been married to his brother Arthur. Now Henry began to think, or pretended to think, that he had been wrong ever to marry her at all, and he tried to make the Pope say so. Wolsey, whom the Pope had made a cardinal, tried very hard to make him say so too, but in vain. After a long time, the Pope sent another cardinal to England, and a great trial was held to decide whether Henry should be allowed to put away his wife or not. Many wise men were gathered together with the king and queen, the two cardinals and their priests and clerks. When the queen's name was called, she rose from her chair, but although she tried to speak, she could not. She stood a moment, then crossing the hall to where the king sat, she threw herself at his feet. Sir! Sir! she said, I pray you do me justice and right, and take some pity upon me, for I am a poor woman and a stranger born out of your dominion. Alas, sir, how have I offended you? I take God to judge that I have ever been your true and humble wife. I have been glad for the things which have made you glad, and I have been sorry for the things which have made you sorry. Your friends have been my friends, your enemies, my enemies. I have loved for your sake all whom you have loved. I have been your wife these twenty years and more. If there be any just cause for the anger you have against me, I am content to depart in shame and rebuke. If there be none, then I pray you to let me have justice at your hand. With that she rose up and making a low curtsy to the king, she walked proudly out of the court, a most unhappy woman, but a grand and dignified queen. The king sent messengers after her to call her back, but she would not return, nor did she ever again come into the court. 
the cardinals and the wise men talked for a long time, but they could not decide whether Henry might be allowed to send his wife away or not. The fact was, the Pope was afraid of Henry on the one hand, and of the Emperor of Germany, who was Catherine's nephew, on the other, and dared say nothing. Then Henry grew very angry and impatient, and blamed Wolsey. Perhaps Wolsey had something to do with the delay, for although he did not love Queen Catherine, and would have been quite glad to have had her sent away, he hated Anne Boleyn, the lady whom Henry now wished to marry. Anne Boleyn hated Wolsey, too, and little by little she so turned the king against his old friend that he took many of his offices from Wolsey, and in the end sent him away from court. When Wolsey was sent away, he went to a house which he had in the country, a sad and worn-out man. He loved power, but he loved England, too, and in all he had done he had thought of making England great in the eyes of the world. With his wise counsels he had done much for England, and yet the people hated him. The nobles hated Wolsey, because he was proud and haughty. They could not forget that he was a butcher's son, and yet they knew that although Henry ruled England, Wolsey ruled Henry. The common people hated him, because when Henry needed money, it was Wolsey, his chancellor, who had to wring it from the poor. So they looked upon him as the cause of all their sorrows, and there were few who mourned and many who were glad at his fall. Henry next accused Wolsey of treason, and sent for him to come to London to be tried. Worn with sorrow and sickness, the cardinal started on his journey, but when he reached Leicester he was so ill that he could go no further. Father, I am come to lay my bones among you, he said sadly to the abbot, who came to welcome him when he arrived at the abbey of Leicester. It was true for in a few days the great cardinal lay dead. Had I served my God as faithfully as I have served my king, he said before he died, he would not have cast me off in my old age. Large man holding paper toward man in Catholic cardinal's garments. Walking away, Henry sent Wolsey away from court. Chapter 64 Henry the Eighth the story of the king's six wives. After the death of Wolsey, Henry chose a wise and gentle man called Sir Thomas More to be his chancellor. As the Pope still refused to give Henry leave to send Catherine away, he resolved to do so without leave. He sent her away, married his new wife, Anne Boleyn, and, because the Pope as head of the church had refused to allow him to send Catherine away, he announced that the Pope had nothing more to do with the Church of England. Henry told the people that in future they must look upon the King of England as head of the Church as well as of the State. The Pope was very angry with Henry and threatened him with all kinds of punishments, but Henry did not care. He had done what he wished to do and was no longer afraid of the Pope. Soon it began to be seen how wise Wolsey had been, for now, that Henry ruled without him, he became a much worse king than he had been before. Some good and wise men, among them the Chancellor, Sir Thomas More, felt that Henry had been wrong to quarrel with the Pope. They would not acknowledge him as head of the Church, so Henry first put them into prison, and then he cut off their heads. The king soon grew tired of Anne Boleyn, and when people told him that she was a wicked woman, he was quite willing to believe them. He put her into prison and presently cut off her head. The very next day he married another lady called Jane Seymour. This lady was good and gentle, but she did not live very long after she was married to Henry. He was very sad at her death, and for two years he did not marry anyone else. At the end of that time he married a fourth lady. She was called Anne of Cleves. Henry had never seen her, as she lived in Germany, 
but he had seen a picture of her painted by a famous artist called Holbein. In it she looked very pretty, and Henry said he would marry her because Thomas Cromwell, who was his chief adviser at that time, told him that it would be a wise thing to do. But when the lady came to England, Henry found that she was not in the least like her picture. She was not at all pretty. She was very clumsy and awkward and could not speak a word of English. Henry flew into a great passion, rudely called her a great Flanders mare, and vowed he would not marry her. He was, however, obliged to do so. He was afraid, if he did not, he might have to fight the German princes who were her friends. But in revenge he put Thomas Cromwell into the tower and cut off his head because he had advised this marriage. Henry soon got rid of his new wife. He offered her a large sum of money if she would go away and let him marry another lady, and was quite pleased to do this. No doubt she was glad to get away with her head safe upon her shoulders from such an angry, passionate man. About a fortnight later Henry married another lady, called Catherine Howard. This time the king soon discovered that he had married a wicked woman. She was not any more wicked than Henry was himself, but he did not think of that. To punish her he cut off her head and the heads of several of her friends as well. About a year later Henry married his sixth and last wife, a lady called Catherine Parr. She was a good woman, and it is wonderful that she should have been willing to marry so bad a man, and one who was so fond of cutting off the heads of his wives. Perhaps she thought that Henry might cut off her head if she refused, and after all it was a fine thing to be called Queen of England. Catherine Parr was clever, and she managed to keep her head upon her shoulders although Henry once thought of cutting it off because she did not quite agree with him about religious matters. Although Henry had quarrelled with the Pope, he did not wish England to become a Protestant country. He wished people to remain Roman Catholics, but to look upon him instead of the Pope as the head of the Church. So he beheaded and burned the people who tried to follow the teaching of Luther, and he also beheaded and burned those who still looked upon the Pope as the head of the Church. Yet Henry helped on the Reformation, for he gave an order that a Bible should be placed in every church, so that people might go there and read it. And as books were still very dear, these Bibles were chained to the desks in case people should be tempted to steal them. Henry the Seventh had left a great deal of money when he died, but Henry the Eighth was so extravagant and reckless that he soon spent it all. He tried many ways of getting more money, and after he quarrelled with the Pope he thought of a new way. All over England there were monasteries and convents in which men and women lived, who gave up their lives to good works. They cared for the sick and poor, taught the people how to read and write, and did many other useful things. Some of these monasteries and convents were very rich possessing land and jewels besides much money. Henry said that the people who lived in these places led wicked lives. No doubt some of them did, but many of them lived good lives and brought great comfort and happiness to the poor around them. But because of the evil which some did, Henry shut up these monasteries and convents. He sent the people who had lived in them out into the fields and streets homeless wanderers and took all their money and lands for himself. Besides doing this, Henry taxed the people very heavily, and at last they rebelled. It was a curious, rabble-like army which gathered together, an army of peasants and weavers, led by priests and monks carrying their sacred banners and crucifixes. They called their rebellion the Pilgrimage of Grace. "'Who is your leader?' asked the Duke of Norfolk, who had been sent against them. "'Our leader is poverty,' they replied, and we are driven on by necessity. Although the king was not well prepared, the rebels did not well prepared, the rebels did not succeed. The Duke of Norfolk persuaded them to go home, promising them pardon in the king's name. They went home, but the following year the rebellion broke out again. 
This time the king's soldiers were better prepared. The rebels were defeated, many of them being taken prisoner and put to death in cruel ways. Henry the Eighth died in 1547 A.D., having reigned for nearly thirty-eight years. His reign was a great one for England, the country becoming more important among the kingdoms of Europe than it had ever been. But Henry himself was bad and selfish, and at the end of his reign, at least, proved himself to be a cruel tyrant. Chapter 65 Edward the Sixth, The Story of a Boy King Henry the Eighth had three children. They were called Mary, Elizabeth, and Edward. Edward was the son of Lady Jane Seymour, Henry's the son of Lady Jane Seymour, Henry's the youngest of the three. But for several reasons he was made king. Edward was only nine years old and his uncle, Lord Somerset, was made regent or protector. Lord Somerset was not a strong man and did not rule well. He wished to be powerful and tried to make himself king in all but name. His brother, Thomas Seymour, also wanted to rule, so there were plots and quarrels between them and between the other great nobles. Although Henry the Eighth had quarreled with the Pope, he never became a Protestant, nor did he wish the religion of the country to be changed. But Lady Jane Seymour had been a Protestant, and so was her brother, who was now protector. Edward the Sixth had been brought up in the new religion, and although he had very little power, he wanted the country to become Protestant. But this was not the wish of the whole people. Many of them did not like the new English service which the king ordered to be used in the churches. It was like a Christmas game, they said, and they asked for the old Latin service called the Mass to which they were accustomed. When Henry the Eighth shut up the monasteries, he brought great distress on the poor in many ways. He gave some of the monastery land to his friends, and these gentlemen, growing greedy, began now to add to their possessions by enclosing with fences the common lands, which before had been free to everyone. The poor had been allowed to feed their cows and sheep on these common lands, but now that they were enclosed by fences, the sheep and cows died from hunger, and the poor people were worse off than ever. Those who had been turned out of the monasteries were all Roman Catholics. They were now homeless and went among the people, telling them that all their sorrows were because of the change of religion. At last the people rose in rebellion, many of them hardly knowing why, but only feeling that they were very unhappy. But the rebellion was soon crushed, and the ringleaders put to death. It is told how the provost marshal wrote to one man, the mayor of Bodmin, who was known to have been one of the leaders, saying that he was coming to dinner. The mayor was very glad, thinking that he was not to be punished for his share in the riots. He made ready a splendid dinner, and received the provost and his friends with great politeness. Mr. Mayor, said the provost, I have to hang a man in the town after dinner. Will you have a gallows set up? The mayor gave the order to the hangman, and then they sat down to dinner. They were all very gay and merry, and when the meal was over, the provost took the mayor by the arm, saying cheerfully, Come now, let me see these gallows. The mayor led him to where they were set up. Do you think they are strong enough? said the provost. Oh, yes, replied the mayor. I can assure your lordship they are quite strong enough. Very well, said the provost, you shall go up and try, for you are the man that is to be hanged. You do not mean that is to be hanged. You do not mean that, my lord. You are joking, said the mayor. Nay, but I do mean it, said the provost. Up you get, you have been a busy rebel, and now here is your reward. And in spite of all he could say, the poor mayor was hanged upon his own gallows. But the people rose again and again. One of the chief rebellions was under a man called Ket. He was a tanner, 
a great many people gathered round him, and they camped near Norwich, on a plain, in the centre of which stood a great oak tree. This tree they called the Oak of Reformation, and under its branches Ket held his parliament and court, deciding quarrels, making laws, and punishing wrongdoers. Ket encouraged his followers to pull up the hedges, throw down the fences, and fill up the ditches with which the common lands had been surrounded. Otherwise they behaved in a wonderfully orderly manner. They did indeed steal sheep and cattle from the rich gentlemen round, so that they might have plenty to eat in the camp. But Ket ordered his men not to hurt any honest or poor people. He called himself the king's friend, and said he fought only against the wicked lords who gave him bad advice. For some time the protector did nothing, and Ket's army grew larger and larger. Lord Somerset was sorry for the people. He knew that they were very poor, and felt that they were badly treated. Yet he knew, too, that he ought to do something to put down the rebellion. At last a royal herald came. Dressed in his coat, embroidered with the arms of England, he stood under the oak of reformation and blew his trumpet, and, while the people gathered round to listen, he cried, All ye good subjects of King Edward the Sixth, by the grace of God, defender of the faith, King of England, attend. Then he told them that he had been sent to say that King Edward would pardon them all, if they would go quietly back to their home. Many of them would have done this, but Ket said no. Pardon is for rebels. We are no rebels. We are the true subjects of the king, and only wish to prevent him from being evilly advised, so he would not go home. The protector had gathered an army intending to make war on Scotland, and this army he now sent against Ket and his men. There was a good deal of fighting. Many people on both sides were killed. The town of Norwich was taken and retaken, but in the end Ket was defeated. He and his brother were made prisoners with many of their followers. They were put to death and nine of the chief rebels were hanged upon the branches of the Oak of Reformation. As time went on, the quarrelling among the nobles grew worse. The office of protector was first taken from Somerset, and he was then beheaded. Many of the common people were sorry for this because they believed that Somerset had really been their friend, and they loved him although the nobles hated him. Lord Somerset was succeeded by the Duke of Northumberland. The Duke of Northumberland was also a Protestant, and he was quite as fond of power as Somerset had been, and began to make plans to get the crown of England into his hands. Edward had never been strong, and Northumberland knew that he was not likely to live long. The next heir to the throne was Mary, Edward's elder sister. She was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. The first wife of Henry the Eighth, Princess Mary, was a Roman Catholic. She hated the Protestant religion as much as Edward loved it. It made Edward sad to think that, when he was dead, Mary would undo all that he had done, and that England would again become Roman Catholic. Northumberland knew this, and he persuaded Edward to make a will leaving the throne to his cousin, Lady Jane Grey. Of course Edward had no right to do this, but he did do it. Lady Jane Grey was the great-granddaughter of Henry the Seventh, and she was married to the Duke of Northumberland's son. She was very young, being only about sixteen, and the Duke thought that if she were queen he would be able to do just as he liked. He tried to keep his plan secret, for he knew that many of the people wished Mary to be queen. He succeeded so well that even Lady Jane herself did not know what he intended to do. In 1553 A.D., soon after Edward had made his will, leaving the crown to his cousin, he died. He was a good and gentle boy, fond of books and learning. During his short reign many schools were founded. 
Some of them still exist and are called King Edward schools. Edward was very anxious to do what was right, but like his father Henry VIII, he was also fond of his own way. Had he lived to be old enough really to reign, he might have proved to be a good king. But it is hard to tell, for while he lived, he had little real power. Chapter 66 The Story of Lady Jane Grey As soon as King Edward VI was dead, Northumberland, with several other nobles, went to Lady Jane Grey and offered her the crown. They knelt to her, kissing her hand and greeting her as their queen. It was a great thing to be Queen of England, but Lady Jane was not glad. She was sad and frightened. She trembled as the Duke spoke to her, then covering her face with her hands, she fell fainting to the ground. When she came to herself again, she cried bitterly for sorrow at the death of her cousin, whom she had loved dearly. She was only a very little older than he, and like him, she was fond of learning. Indeed, they had often had the same masters. Lady Jane was even more clever than Edward. She could speak and write Greek and Latin, and she knew some Hebrew. This was more wonderful in those days than it would be now, for then very few people had any learning at all. As Lady Jane wept for her cousin, the nobles tried to comfort her by reminding her how great she herself now was. But that did not comfort her. It frightened her. I cannot be queen, she said. I cannot be queen, she said. I cannot bear so great an honour. I am not fit for it. It is your duty. You cannot put away from you the duty God gives you. With tears running down her face, Lady Jane fell upon her knees, and clasping her hands said, Then, if it must be so, God give me strength to bear this heavy burden. God give me strength to bear this heavy burden, the good of the people. The next day Lady Jane was taken in state to the tower. But no crowds gathered to greet and cheer her as their queen. A few people came out of idle curiosity, but they were all silent. Not one voice cried, God save the queen. But while these things were happening, the Princess Mary did not sit still. She raised an army and claimed the crown. Northumberland marched against her with another army, leaving Lady Jane in the tower. No sooner had he gone than many of the lords, who had joined him in helping to put Lady Jane on the throne, began to regret it. They one and all declared for Queen Mary, and marching to the tower, demanded the keys in her name. Lady Jane's father, who had been left to guard the tower, was afraid to resist, and he opened the gates to Mary's friends. Then running to his daughter's room, he told her that her reign was at an end. Dear father, she said, these are the happiest words I have ever heard since you told me that I must be queen. May I go home now, she added, but alas, it was easier to enter the tower than to leave it, and she was kept fast prisoner. Meanwhile Mary had been proclaimed queen in the streets of London. Instead of the gloomy silence which had greeted Lady Jane Grey, the people shouted with joy, God save the Queen! God save the Queen! God save the Queen! The church bells rang, the people sang and shouted, bonfires were lit. Everywhere there was feasting and rejoicing. Mary was Queen. The news travelled on. It reached Northumberland and his army. The Duke knew when he heard it that his cause was lost that his hopes and his fortunes were fallen and broken. Only one thing was left to him. He, too, took off his cap and shouted with the rest, God save the Queen! Poor Lady Jane, the ten days' Queen, was forgotten. But even that could not save Northumberland, and he was taken back to London a prisoner. The people hated him, and they shouted, Traitor! 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 death to the traitor, as he was led through the streets, till in fear and shame he hid his face from them as he entered the tower, out of which he never again came. 
Mary was so glad and happy to have won the crown that she was at first kind to everyone. She would not put Lady Jane and her husband to death. An innocent girl was not to blame, she said, but she kept them both prisoners in the tower. It is even thought that Mary would have spared the life of Northumberland, but many of the nobles hated him. It was decided that he must die, and his head was cut off. The new queen's gentleness did not last long. When once she felt herself secure upon the throne, she proved to be as self-willed as her father. Henry the Eighth had been. Mary was a Roman Catholic, and she made up her mind to bring England back to that faith. At first many of the people were glad of this, for although they did not wish to come under the rule of the Pope again, they did not like the new religion. But when Mary let it be known that she meant to marry Philip of Spain, the people were very angry. Spain was a Roman Catholic country. The English hated the Spaniards and were afraid of them. The Spaniards they knew were cruel. They had in their country a terrible court called the Inquisition. Inquisition means to seek out. If anyone was suspected of thinking for himself in matters of religion, he was brought before this court and asked searching questions, so that the truth might be sought out. Sometimes the questions were so difficult to answer that innocent people made themselves appear guilty. But whether innocent or guilty, those who were brought before this court were nearly always tortured, and often condemned to be burned to death. However much the English wished to return to the Roman Catholic religion, they did not wish this terrible inquisition to be brought into their country. They tried to make Mary marry an Englishman. But Mary was very proud and haughty. There is no Englishman my equal. I will not marry a subject, she said. No one was pleased with this marriage, and the Protestants were very much afraid. Anything, they thought, would be better than to allow a Spaniard to rule in England. So a plot was formed to put Mary from the throne, and to set either her sister Elizabeth or Lady Jane Grey in her place. But the plot failed. All the leaders were beheaded, and hundreds of their followers were hanged. Gentle Lady Jane, who had never wished to rule, was blamed for this rebellion. She was brought out of the tower where she had been kept prisoner, and her beautiful head was cut off. Her husband, father, and brother were also put to death. The Queen had begun to earn for herself her terrible name of Bloody Mary. Chapter 67 Mary I. How the Princess Elizabeth became a prisoner. Queen Mary thought that her sister, the Princess Elizabeth, had a part in the plot to put her from the throne, so as soon as it began, she sent some gentlemen with soldiers to take her prisoner. These gentlemen arrived late in the evening at the house where the princess was living. Tell the princess, they said to her lady, in waiting who met them, that we must see her at once. We come from court with a message from the queen. The princess was ill and in bed, but the lady took the message to her. Go back to the gentlemen, said the princess. Say to them that I welcome them, but as it is so late, I trust that they will wait to speak with me until the morning. No, we must see the princess at once, replied the gentlemen when they received this answer. And without waiting for more, they followed the lady into Princess Elizabeth's bedroom. She was very much surprised and angry, too, when she saw them. "'Is there so much haste that you cannot wait until morning?' she asked. "'We are sorry to see you so ill,' replied the gentleman, somewhat ashamed of themselves. "'And I am not glad to see you here at this time of night,' returned the princess. "'There is no help for it,' said the gentleman. "'We are sent by the Queen, and her message is that you must come to her at once.' Certainly, I shall be very pleased to obey, replied Elizabeth, but you can see for yourselves that I am not well enough to come at present. We are very sorry, replied the gentleman, but you must come, 
Our orders are to bring you dead or alive. This made the princess very sad, for she now felt sure that she had reason to be afraid of her sister, the queen. She tried very hard to make the gentlemen go away, but they would not. At last, after a great deal of talking, she agreed to go with them next morning. When the time came, Princess Elizabeth was so ill that she fainted several times as she was being led out of the house. All her servants, crying bitterly, gathered to say good-bye to her. They loved their mistress very much, and they did not know what was going to happen. When Elizabeth arrived at court, she was not allowed to see the Queen, but was shut up in her room, and kept a prisoner there for a fortnight. Gentlemen of the court came and talked to her, trying to make her confess that she had helped in the rebellion against the Queen but she said always that she knew nothing of it, and had ever been true to her sister. Then one day they told her that she was to be taken to the tower. The princess became very much afraid. She knew what a dreadful place the tower was, what fearful things happened there, and how few people who once went in ever came out alive. She begged and prayed not to be taken there, I am true to the Queen, she said in thought, word, and deed. It is not right that she should shut me up in that sad place. But the Lords replied, There is no help for it. The Queen commands, and you must obey. So a boat was brought, and the Princess was rowed down the Thames to the tower. It was a dreary morning. Sky and river were grey, and the rain fell fast. As the boat went slowly on, the princess sat silent and sorrowful, deep in thought. At last the boat stopped. The lord stepped out, and the princess, awakened from her sad thoughts, looked up. But when she saw that the boat had stopped at the gate of the tower, called the traitor's gate, she sat still. "'Lady, will you land?' said one of the lords. No, answered Elizabeth, I am no traitor. Lady, it is raining, said another of the lords, as he tried to put his cloak round her to shelter her. But the princess dashed it back with her hand. Then rising, she stepped on shore, saying as she did so, Here landeth, being a prisoner, as true a subject as ever stood upon these steps. When the princess reached the courtyard, she would go no farther, but sat there upon a stone. Not all the entreaties of the lords could move her. Through the cold and wet of the dreary morning, she sat in that grim courtyard. Lady, you will do well to come in out of the rain, said the governor of the tower. You are but uncomfortable there. "'Better to sit here than in a worse place,' replied the princess, "'for I know not where you will lead me.' Then one of her own servants, kneeling beside her, burst into tears. "'Why do you weep for me?' said Elizabeth. "'You should rather comfort me and not weep.' But she rose and went sadly into the tower. Then the doors were locked and barred. The princess was a prisoner at last. A close prisoner— Elizabeth was kept. Very few of her own servants were allowed to be with her. But one of the servants of the tower had a little son about four years old. He used to come to see the princess and bring her flowers, and they soon became great friends. But when Elizabeth's enemies heard of this, they thought that she would try to send messages to her friends by this little boy. So one day, they caught him and promised to give him apples and figs if he would tell them what the princess said to him and what messages she sent to her friends. But although the boy was so young, he understood that these men must be the enemies of the princess, and he would not tell them anything, if indeed he had anything to tell. They talked for a long time, but could learn nothing from him. "'Please, my lord,' said the little boy at last. "'Will you now give me the apples and figs you promised?' "'No, indeed,' replied the gentleman. "'But you shall have a whipping if you talk to the princess any more. "'I shall bring my lady more flowers,' replied the little boy boldly. 
but his father was told that he must not allow his son to run about the tower any longer, and next day the princess missed her little friend. But presently she saw him peeping through a hole in the door, and when he saw that no one was near he called to her, Lady, I can bring you no more flowers. Then the princess smiled sadly, but said nothing. She knew that unkind people had taken even this one little friend from her. The princess lived in constant fear of her life. After a time she was removed from the tower, and was sent from prison to prison to prison. It was no wonder that one day, hearing a milkmaid singing gaily, Elizabeth said she, too, would rather be a milkmaid and free than a great princess and a prisoner. At last she was allowed to go to Hatfield, a house near St. Albans, which now belongs to the Marquis of Salisbury. There, carefully watched and guarded, she lived until Mary died. Chapter 68 Mary the First How a candle was lit in England which has never been put out. When Mary had put down the rebellion which her desire to marry Philip had raised, she had her own way and married him. He came from Spain with much pomp and splendor, and as he rode through the streets of London there was a show of rejoicing, but the people did not really like him. He brought a great deal of money with him, and gave presents to the people, but still they did not like him. Parliament took good care that he should have no share in the government, and that made him angry. No one loved him except Mary. With Philip's help, the Queen began to do what she dearly wished. That was to bring England again under the power of the Pope. The Pope sent a messenger to England, and Philip and Mary, holding a solemn service, knelt at his feet. They confessed that Henry the Eighth had done a wicked thing when he quarrelled with the Pope. They said that the people of England were sorry for it, and humbly begged to be forgiven. Then the Pope's messenger granted them forgiveness in his master's name, and England was once more said to be Roman Catholic. Now began the most terrible time of Mary's reign for it required more than a few words from king, queen, and pope to make England again truly Roman Catholic. The Protestants would not give up their religion. Mary was determined that they should. Those who refused were imprisoned and put to death in the most cruel way. They were burned alive. It would make you too sad to tell stories of this terrible time. In three years, nearly three hundred people were put to death by Mary's cruel orders. Yet she did no good but rather harm to her cause. For many who were at first on her side turned away with horror from her dreadful cruelties. These men and women who suffered death so cheerfully for their religion fought for British freedom as much as Caractacus or Harold or any of the brave men of whom you have heard and it was much harder to die as they did than to fall in battle fighting for their country with sword and spear. So when you hear such names as Rogers, Hooper, Ridley, Latimer, and Cranmer, honor them as heroes, and think gratefully of the many, many others, whose names we shall never know, but who suffered as bravely. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man, said Latimer as they were being led to be burned together. We shall this day light such a candle, by God's grace, in England, as I trust shall never be put out. By this he meant that others, hearing of the brave manner in which they died, would take heart too, and fight as bravely for their faith and freedom. So instead of crushing out God's light and truth, Mary was making it shine as a light which every one might see. Mary was not happy. She could not help knowing that her cruel behavior did harm rather than good to the religion which she loved, yet she went on killing and torturing more fiercely than ever. Philip grew tired of England, where he was not allowed to rule, so he went back to his own country. This was a great sorrow to Mary, for she loved her husband. Philip returned indeed once, but it was only to get money for a war with France. 
Very unwillingly, the Parliament granted the money and help he asked, but the war ended sadly for Mary. Calais, which had belonged to the English for more than two hundred years, was lost. Mary grieved very much over this. When I am dead, she said, you will find Calais graven on my heart. In the same year, 1558 A. She was succeeded by her sister, the Princess Elizabeth, who was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry the Eighth. Chapter 69 Elizabeth, How the Imprisoned Princess Became a Queen Then our streets were unpaved, our houses were thatched, sir. Our windows were latticed, our doors only latched, sir, yet so few were the rogues that would plunder or rob, sir, that the hangman was starved for want of a job, sir. Oh, the golden days of good Queen Bess! Then are the ladies with large. Ruffs tied under their neck fast would gobble up a pound of beefsteaks for their breakfast. With a close quilled-up coif, their noddles just did fit and were trussed up as tight as a rabbit on a spit. The golden days of good Queen Bess. Then jerkin and doublet, and yellow worsted hose with a large pair of whiskers, was the dress of our bews. Strong beer they preferred to clarets and to hocks. No poultry they prized like the wing of an ox. Oh, the golden days of good Queen Bess! Good neighbourhood, too! There was plenty as beef. And the poor from the rich never wanted relief, while Mary went the mill. Clack, the shuttle, and the plough, and honest men could live by the sweat of their brow. Oh, the golden days of good Queen Bess! Then all great men were good, and all good men were great and the props of the nation were the pillars of the state, for the sovereign and the subject one interest supported, and our powerful alliance was by all other nations courted. Oh, the golden days of good Queen Bess! In the grounds of Hatfield, the oak may still be seen under which Elizabeth was sitting when messengers came to tell her that Mary was dead and that she was queen. The princess listened looking up through the bare branches to the dull November sky, then falling upon her knees, she exclaimed in Latin words, It is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Afterwards Elizabeth put these words upon the gold coins which were used during her reign. Upon the silver coins she put another Latin sentence which means, I have chosen God for my helper. As soon as Elizabeth knew that she was chosen to be queen, she left Hatfield and went in state to the Tower of London, for at that time the tower was used as a royal palace as well as a prison. But this time she did not go as a prisoner. This time she did not enter by the traitor's gate. She went as a queen, free and happy, guarded indeed, but guarded indeed, but guarded with love and honour, as the queen passed through the gates, she paused. Some, she said, have fallen from being princes in this land to be prisoners in this place. I am raised from being prisoner in this place to be prince in this land. That was the work of God's justice, this a work of his mercy. So must I be myself to God thankful and to man merciful. There were great rejoicings when Elizabeth was crowned. Bonfires blazed and joy bells rang. Yet the land and the people were in a sad and miserable state, and it needed all Elizabeth's wisdom and the wisdom of the great men who surrounded her to bring back happiness and peace to the country. Elizabeth began her reign at a very difficult time. The quarrels between the old and new religions and the cruelties of Mary had divided the people into two parties. Each party hoped that the new queen would favour them, but Elizabeth did not mean to make any of her subjects suffer death because of what they felt it right to believe. During her reign people were neither tortured nor killed in the name of religion. Elizabeth was clever, but she liked to think that she was beautiful too. 
She loved fine clothes, and she dressed in the most splendid silks and satins and jewels. Her courtiers told her that she was the most beautiful lady on earth. This was not true. Elizabeth was not really very beautiful. But she was vain and liked to hear people say that she was lovely, and her people loved her so much that very likely they really thought that she was beautiful. Whenever it was known that the Queen would pass through the streets, the people would gather to see her. They would stand for hours, waiting, until she came. When she at last appeared, they would wave their hats and shout, God save your majesty! God save your majesty! Then the Queen would stop, and looking round on them would say, God bless you all, my good people! The people would again cry, God save your majesty! And the Queen would smile and reply, You may well have a greater prince, but you will never have a more loving prince. Then when she had gone again, the people would go to their homes, talking of what a splendid queen she was, and of how they would die for good Queen Bess, as they loved to call her. Chapter 70 Elizabeth, the Story of a Most Unhappy Queen At this time in Scotland, as in England, there ruled a queen. These two queens were cousins, for Margaret, the sister of Henry the Eighth, had married James the Fourth, King of Scotland, and this Mary, who was now Queen of Scotland, was their granddaughter and Elizabeth's cousin. In spite of the fact that an English princess had married a Scottish king, the two peoples continued to be enemies, as they had always been, and Elizabeth of England did not love her cousin Mary of Scotland. She hated and feared her. Mary had been brought up in France, which is a Roman Catholic country, and she had married the French king. So she was Queen of France and Scotland. When Mary of England died, Mary of Scotland thought that she had a better right to the throne of England than Elizabeth, so she called herself Queen of Scotland, France, England, and Ireland. Many people agreed with Mary, among them the Pope, who was angry with Elizabeth because she would not be ruled by him and would no longer punish the Protestants as her sister had done. So it was little wonder that Elizabeth hated and feared her cousin. The Protestants of England hated Mary of Scotland, too. They were afraid that if she became Queen of England, she would bring back the dreadful days of the English Mary. When Mary was only nineteen, her husband, the French king, died, and she left France, where she had been living, and returned to Scotland. As she sat upon the deck of the ship which took her to Scotland, she wept bitterly. Adieu, France, adieu, she sobbed. I shall never see you more. Scotland seemed cold and dark to Mary after sunny France, and the people harsh and rough. Yet the Scots loved their queen, and were eager to show her that they did so, and Mary wanted to be loved. But Mary and her people did not understand each other. Although she was clever and beautiful, she was perhaps the most unhappy and most unwise queen who ever sat upon a throne. In Scotland, as in England, many dreadful things happened because of the reformation and change of religion. Mary was a Roman Catholic, while many of her people had turned to the new religion. There were other causes for quarrels, so there was sorrow and war, until at last the Scottish people imprisoned their beautiful queen in a lonely castle upon an island in the middle of a loch. But, although many people hated Mary, many loved her too, and these helped her to escape. One evening a boy called the little Douglas, who lived in the castle where she was imprisoned, stole the keys while the governor was at supper. In the middle of the night he unlocked the door of Mary's room. Fearfully and silently she crept with him through the dark passages till they reached the great gate. Douglas unlocked it, and Mary passed out, 
holding her little frightened maid by the hand, Douglas locked the gate behind them and led the way to the place where a boat was waiting for them. They were soon out on the dark water, getting farther and farther away from the castle. Halfway to the shore, little Douglas leaned over the side of the boat and dropped the great castle keys into the water. Mary's gaolers were prisoners in the castle, and she was free. On land some of Queen Mary's friends were waiting for her with horses, and she rode joyfully away. Soon more friends joined her, and a battle was fought near Glasgow. But Mary's soldiers were defeated, and she was obliged to flee. She did not know where to go. It would have been safest to go to France. But no ship was ready to take her there. So she crossed the border into England and went to ask her cousin Elizabeth to take pity on her. Elizabeth had never seen her beautiful cousin, and she refused to see her now. She gave her a castle to live in, not as a royal guest, but as a prisoner. Mary had had to run away from Scotland so quickly that she had brought no clothes except those she wore. She wrote to tell Elizabeth this, but although Elizabeth had hundreds of beautiful dresses, she only sent some old clothes quite unfit for a queen to wear. Poor Mary would have been badly off, but her enemies were kinder than her cousin, and sent her dresses and clothes from Scotland. When Queen Mary found that Elizabeth meant to treat her as a prisoner, and not as a friend, she begged to be allowed to go away to some other country. But Elizabeth would not set her free. She feared if she did, Mary would go to the kings of France or Spain, and ask them to make war on England. She felt it was safest to keep her great enemy in prison. Mary was so beautiful that she had many friends, and they were very angry with Elizabeth. Plot after plot to free Mary was formed. But all plots failed. For nineteen years this poor queen was kept in prison. She was moved from castle to castle, for it seemed as if no place was strong and safe enough to keep her from her friends. At last she was shut up in a castle called Fotheringay. When Mary had been in prison about nineteen years, a plot to kill Elizabeth and put Mary on the throne was discovered. Then the English Parliament persuaded Elizabeth that Mary must be put to death. Elizabeth either really felt, or pretended to feel, very unwilling to give her consent to this. But in the end she signed a paper ordering Mary's head to be cut off. A few days later the beautiful Queen, who had been so unhappy, and who had caused so much unhappiness, walked into the great hall at Fotheringay. In one hand she carried a Bible, in the other a crucifix. The hall was hung with black. At one end was a low scaffold, also covered with black. Nineteen years before Mary had come to England, young and beautiful, and although she was not yet old, the long years in prison had made her look like an old woman. She could only walk with difficulty, and when she laid her head upon the block, it was seen that her hair was white. Mary's servants cried bitterly when she said good. By to them, although she comforted them by saying that, to her death was a happy release out of prison. Her little dog would not leave her even after she was dead, but crept close to her dress, whining sadly as the dean of Peterborough cried. So perish all Elizabeth's enemy. Woman seated at desk, resting head on her hand. For nineteen years this poor queen was kept in prison. When Elizabeth was told that Mary was dead, she was very angry. She said that although she had signed the death warrant, as the paper was called, she had not meant that Mary should be killed. It is difficult to know what Elizabeth did mean for she was deceitful as well as clever. But whether she meant it or not, Elizabeth had no right to behead Mary. Mary's son James, who was now the King of Scotland, was very angry with Elizabeth for the manner in which she had treated his mother. 
but he had neither money nor soldiers enough with which to fight against England. So he did nothing. Chapter 71 Elizabeth The story of how England was saved from the Spaniards. Philip, King of Spain, who had been married to Mary I, wanted, after her death, to marry her sister Elizabeth, who was now Queen of England. But Elizabeth would not marry him, and that made him very angry. Philip hated the English people and the Protestant religion, and he made up his mind to conquer England and punish Elizabeth. He gathered together a great number of soldiers and sailors and guns and ships, and made ready to invade England. Among the many famous Englishmen of this time was a man called Drake. He had sailed in far-off seas to newly discovered countries, and was very bold and daring. While Philip was busy making ready to invade England, Drake sailed over to Spain, and boldly entered the harbor where the Spanish vessels lay. He sank and burned thirty or more of them, damaged others, and then sailed away again. This, he said with a laugh, was just singeing the king of Spain's beard. King Philip was very angry, but he at once set to work to repair his ships and to build others, and next year was ready to attack England. In May, 1588, A.D., 129 great ships sailed out from Spain, but, hindered by a storm, it was many weeks later before they came in sight of the English coast. These Spanish ships, with their gilded prows and white sails shining in the sun, made a splendid show as they sailed along in the shape of a crescent seven miles long. King Philip called his fleet the Invincible Armada. Invincible means which cannot be conquered. Armada is a Spanish word meaning navy. Once again, as in the days of the Romans and as in the days of the Danes, the little green island in the lonely sea was threatened with conquerors coming in great ships. The people of England had been slow to believe that there was any danger from Spain and the queen was unwilling to make preparations. But when at last they saw that the Spaniards meant to come, the country rose like one man. Roman Catholics and Protestants forgot their quarrels, and remembering only that they were Englishmen, worked together against the common enemy. The English navy at this time was very small, but gentlemen and merchants gave money and ships, and soon it was almost as large as the Spanish navy, although the ships were smaller. Besides these ships and sailors, a great army gathered on land in order to resist Philip, should he succeed in reaching England, in spite of the wooden walls, as the English war vessels came to be called. Men young and old flocked to the standard. Very few were real soldiers, but all of them were eager to fight for their queen and for their country. Elizabeth herself reviewed the army and spoke such brave words that the hopes of the men who heard her rose high. I am come among you, she said, not for pleasure nor to amuse myself. I am come to live or die with you in battle to lay down my honor and my life for my God, for my country and for my people. I know that I have but the body of a poor, weak woman, but I have the heart of a poor, weak woman, but I have the heart of a scorn that any Spanish prince, or any prince in Europe, should dare invade my kingdom. Rather than be so dishonored, I myself will take up arms. Myself will be your general and the judge and rewarder of every one of you for your deeds in the field of battle. So eagerly did the people work that England was ready before Spain, and Lord Howard, the chief admiral, sailed out to meet the enemy. But week after week passed, and as still the Spaniards did not come, he returned to Plymouth with his ships. Elizabeth was not fond of spending money. 
she thought that it was dreadful waste to keep all these soldiers and sailors and ships waiting for an enemy who never came, and she told Lord Howard to pay off his men and send them to their homes. But Lord Howard refused to obey, and he with his captains and his men held their ships in readiness at Plymouth. Day by day they kept watch, looking always anxiously out to sea, and spending the long, weary hours as best they could. At last, one sunny day in July, when Drake and some of the other sea captains were playing at bowls, they were interrupted by a cry, the Spaniards, the Spaniards, the Spaniards, the game was stopped, all eyes were turned towards the channel. Yes, there at last, far out to sea, the proud Spanish vessels were to be seen. They were distant yet, but a sailor's eye could see that they were mighty and great ships, and the number of them was very large. But the brave English captains were not afraid. Come, said Drake, after a few minutes, there is time to finish the game and to beat the Spaniards too. Three men with hats and capes, speaking to each other with others facing away in background. There is time to finish the game and beat the Spaniards too, said Drake. So they went back to their play, and when the game was finished, they went down to the harbor, got the ships ready, and sailed out to meet and fight the Spaniards. For more than a week the battle lasted, the English always having the best of it. Their ships were smaller, but for that very reason they could be moved and turned about more easily than the great painted and gilded Spanish vessels. The wind, too, was in favor of the English and against the Spaniards. In those days, before steam engines and steamers had been invented, when ships were still moved by sails, the wind was of great importance. Day by day the wind grew fiercer, the waves became white and wild, till the Spanish ships were driven northward by a terrible storm, without pilots, through unknown seas, past strange islands they were driven. Shattered on unfriendly rocks, refused the shelter of every port, up to the north of Scotland, and back round the west coast of Ireland, they sped. At last, ruined by shot and shell, torn and battered by wind and waves, about fifty maimed and broken wrecks, all that were left of the invincible armada, reached Spain. Once again, England was saved. How the people rejoiced! Bells rang, bonfires blazed, and every heart was filled with thankfulness. In memory of the victory, the queen ordered a medal to be made, and on it, in Latin, were the words, God blew with his breath, and they were scattered. Although Philip had lost nearly all his ships, he did not consider that he was beaten, and the war went on until the death of Elizabeth. But the English people no longer feared the Spaniard. Chapter 72 Elizabeth the story of Sir Walter Raleigh. The reign of Queen Elizabeth was great, not only because she was a wise ruler, but because she was surrounded by so many wise and great and good men. One of these wise men, Sir William Cecil, afterwards called Lord Burleigh, was her Secretary of State and her chief adviser during nearly all her reign until he died in 1598 a. There were so many great men in England at this time that you could not remember all their names, and to tell stories about them all would fill a whole book. In the reign of Elizabeth, it is not only the men who were soldiers that we remember as great, but the men who wrote books, the men who wrote books, the men who sailed over the sea and discovered new countries, and the men who, by careful thinking and wise, acts kept peace at home. Sir Walter Raleigh was one of the great men who lived at this time. He was a soldier and a sailor, a courtier, and a writer of books. 
But clever though he was, until the great queen noticed him, he remained only a simple country gentleman. One day, Elizabeth was passing along the streets, and the people as usual came crowding to see her. Among them was Sir Walter Raleigh. The queen stepped from her coach, and followed by her ladies, was about to cross the road. But in those days the streets were very badly kept, and Elizabeth stopped before a puddle of mud. She was grandly dressed, and how to cross the muddy road, without soiling her dainty shoes and skirts, she did not know. As she paused, Sir Walter sprang forward. Elizabeth was very pleased, and, as she passed on, she smiled at the handsome young man who had ruined his beautiful cloak to save her dainty shoes, and ordered him to attend her at court. Raleigh's fortune was made. He went to court, and soon became so great a favorite that at one time he even thought that he might marry the queen. Fain would I climb, but that I fear to fall, he one day wrote with a diamond upon a window. And the queen, seeing it, wrote underneath, If thy heart fail thee, climb then not at all. So Raleigh climbed, and although he never reached the throne, he climbed high. Elizabeth gave him money and lands till he became very rich. He wanted to sail away over the sea in search of new countries and treasure, as Drake had done. But the queen would not let him go. As Raleigh could not go himself, he spent a great deal of his money in buying ships and sending other men over the sea to find new land. These men sailed to America, which was then wild and unknown. Landing there, they claimed it for England, and Raleigh named it Virginia, in honor of Elizabeth. She liked to call herself the Virgin Queen, which means the Queen who has never married. One of the United States of America is still called Virginia. For a long time Elizabeth was very pleased with Raleigh but at last she became angry with him and sent him to prison in the dreadful tower. The reason for this was that Sir Walter had dared to love and marry another lady, one of the Queen's own maids of honor. Elizabeth was always very angry if any of the gentlemen in her court married. Many of them wished to marry her, but she refused them all. Still, she wished them to think that she was the cleverest and most beautiful woman in all the world. She wished them all to love and admire her so much that they would never think of marrying any other lady. And when they did marry another, she was always very angry. Sir Walter, happily, was not kept in prison for very long, and some years later he really did have his wish, and sailed away to explore America. He did not find the golden land which he had imagined, but he brought home many strange stories, and many curious and useful things. Two of the things which Raleigh brought home with him were tobacco and potato. Elizabeth had given him estates in Ireland, and there he planted the potatoes, and showed the people how to grow them. Even to this day the poor people in Ireland grow many potatoes and live on them very largely. People were pleased with the new vegetable, but they were very much astonished when he showed them how to use tobacco. Such a thing had never been seen before, and it took people some time to grow accustomed to it. Man bowing with cape on the ground in front of ornately dressed queen, quickly pulling off his cloak, he threw it upon the ground. One day, soon after Raleigh had returned home, he was sitting smoking when a servant came into the room. The man stood still in horror. Smoke filled the room and was pouring out of his master's mouth. He must be on fire, thought the servant. Without saying a word, he ran away and returned as quickly as he could with a pail of water. This he threw over his master, hoping to put out the fire and so save his life. Raleigh, you may imagine, was not very pleased at finding himself suddenly drenched with cold water, just when he was enjoying a quiet smoke, but when he understood the mistake his servant had made, he laughed heartily. Raleigh had many adventures. 
He swept the ocean in his ships, and he fought by land and sea. But he wrote books, too, and one of his friends was the poet Spencer, who tells beautiful stories in his poem called The Fairy Queen. The greatest writer of this time, perhaps the greatest poet of any time, was Shakespeare, his name you know, and some day you will read the stories he wrote. Another writer, and great soldier, too, was Sir Philip Sidney. He was so handsome and brave and kind that everyone loved him. Queen, statesmen, and people, soldiers, courtiers, and poets, all loved him. He lived well, wrote well, and died well. He fell fighting for his country. Wounded and groaning with pain, he asked for a cup of water. While it was being brought, he noticed a soldier lying beside him in great agony. Give it to him, he said, pointing to this poor soldier. The man refused to have it. Nay, but take it, said Sir Philip. You need it more than I do. Sir Philip never recovered from his wound. A fortnight later he died, still young, brave, and handsome. Chapter 73 Elizabeth the story of the Queen's favorite. Another brave and handsome man, who was a great favorite with the Queen, was the Earl of Essex. He was so handsome and graceful that the Queen liked to have him always near her, although she quarreled with him very often. Essex loved fighting more than attending upon the Queen, and twice when there was war he ran away without leave. Elizabeth was angry, but Essex did great deeds, and helped to make the name of England famous, so she forgave him. Later she made him commander of an expedition which, however, was not very successful. Again they quarrelled. One day the Queen and her counsellors were talking about who should govern Ireland. Elizabeth wanted one man, Essex another. He grew so angry because she would not take his advice that he turned his back upon her. This was a very rude thing to do, for one must never turn one's back to a king or queen, but must even walk out of the room backwards when leaving their present. Elizabeth was furious, and, springing up, she boxed the earl's ears. Essex had been angry before. Now he was in a terrible rage. Forgetting that a man must never fight with a woman, he laid his hand upon his sword. Then a gentleman who was there threw himself between the angry queen and earl, trying to calm them both. But Essex would not be calmed. I will take a blow from no one, he cried. I would not have endured it from her father, King Henry. I will not take it from a king in petticats. And, swearing dreadfully, he flung himself out of the room, refusing to return. For some time the advisers of the queen and the friends of the earl tried to make peace between them, but in vain. Essex would not apologize. The queen would not say that she was sorry. But in the end the queen forgave Essex and he came back to court, as they had quarreled over who should be sent to govern Ireland. Elizabeth decided to send Essex himself. This was not at all what Essex wanted. It was a very difficult post, and he did not wish to accept it, but he was obliged to do so. He went to Ireland, but he did not succeed in ruling as the Queen would have liked. She wrote bitter, angry letters to him, and he replied with letters as bitter and angry as hers. At last Essex decided to come back to England to see the Queen, and try to make friends with her again. Elizabeth forbade him, but in spite of her orders he came. Early one morning he arrived in London, dusty, dirty, and untidy from his long journey. He was in such haste to see the Queen that he did not stop to make himself fit to appear at court. Dusty and untidy as he was, he rushed straight to the palace. 
It was so early that the queen was not up. Hearing that, Essex ran to her room without even waiting till someone had told her that he had arrived. The queen was sitting in her room with her hair hanging down, waiting for her ladies to dress her, when Essex rushed in and, flinging himself on his knees beside her, kissed her hand again and again. The queen was so surprised to see Essex, and so sorry when she saw how miserable he looked, that she spoke gently to him and comforted him. So presently he rose from his knees and went away feeling that he was forgiven. But it was only surprise which had made the queen kind to Essex. Later in the day she received him very coldly. Later, still she sent him to prison. For some time Essex was kept a prisoner. Then he was set free, but he could not again win the queen's favor. Her unkindness hurt him so much that he grew more and more unhappy and more and more angry. He began to say unkind things about the queen, calling her a foolish old woman who was growing crooked in mind and body. It was quite true that Elizabeth was growing old, and, being as vain as ever, she liked to think that she was still young and pretty. She covered her gray hair with a wig and painted her face. She sang and danced, although she was nearly seventy years old. But it was wrong and foolish of Essex to speak as he did, and people were not slow to carry his words to the Queen. At last Essex grew so angry that he tried to raise a rebellion against Elizabeth. The rebellion failed, and Essex and those who had helped him were sent to the town. In spite of all their quarrels, Elizabeth really loved Essex. Now she felt it very hard to condemn him to death. Still she did. Long before this, Elizabeth had one day given Essex a ring telling him that if ever she should be angry with him, she would forgive him if he sent this ring back to her. When Essex heard that he was to die, he remembered this promise, and he made up his mind to send the ring to Elizabeth, hoping that she would pardon him but he did not know how to send it. He was afraid to give it to any of the Queen's courtiers, for he knew that many of them were his enemies. They were only too glad that he should be in disgrace, and would never deliver the ring to the Queen. At length one day, as he looked sadly from his prison window, he saw a boy passing. The boy had a pleasant, honest face, and Essex felt sure that he might be trusted. He called to him, and throwing the ring down, told him to take it to his cousin, who was a kind lady, and loved him. Tell the lady, he said, to show this ring to the queen, and all will be well. The boy took the ring, promising to do as he was asked. Then Essex threw down a purse full of gold, as a reward for his kindness, and the boy went away very pleased but by mistake he gave the ring to the wrong lady. Instead of giving it to the wrong lady, instead of giving it to the cousin of Essex, who loved him, he gave it to another lady. This lady showed the ring to her husband, and as he too hated Essex, they resolved to keep the ring and say nothing about it. So Elizabeth never knew that Essex had sent it. She, too, had remembered her promise, and hoped that Essex would send the ring. She waited and waited, but day after day went past, and it never came. At last, thinking that he was too proud to ask forgiveness, she ordered his head to be cut off. So proud and foolish Essex died, believing his queen was still angry with him. Elizabeth was growing old. Many of her friends had died and left her, and after the death of Essex she was often very sad. The people, too, who had loved Essex, were angry with her for having put him to death, and that made her more sad still. When the lady who had kept back the ring was about to die, she felt very sorry for what she had done. She could not find peace until she had confessed to the Queen and asked her forgiveness. She sent a message to the Queen, 
begging her to come to her. Elizabeth came, but when she heard the story, instead of forgiving the poor dying lady, she shook her fiercely, saying, God may forgive you. I never can. At last Elizabeth herself grew very ill, but she would not go to bed. She sat day and night upon cushions on the floor, doing nothing but staring before her, with her finger in her mouth. Then Sir Robert Cecil, the son of the great Lord Burleigh, who had been so wise and faithful a friend to Elizabeth, said, For the sake of your people, madam, you must go to bed. Must! exclaimed the Queen. Must is not a word to use to princes. Little man, little man, your father would not have dared to use that word. But you know I must die, and that makes you so bold. But at last she allowed herself to be carried to bed, some of her lords, knowing that she had not long to live, asked whom she wished to reign after her. I will have no rascal's son in my seat, she said, and would say no more. Asked again, Do you desire your cousin, the King of Scotland, to have the crown? The Queen only moved her head, but it seemed to those around that she meant to say yes. She never spoke again. On March 24, 1603 A.D., this great queen died, having reigned forty-five years. She had loved her country and her people, and her people, ruler, had ever before been so mourned. She was the last of the Tudor sovereigns, and with her successor, James, a new race of kings, called the Stuarts, began to reign in England. Chapter 74 James the Sixth of Scotland, the First of England, the story of Guy Fox. For hundreds of years the kings of England had tried to conquer Scotland, and make Scotland and England one kingdom, under one kingdom, under one king. Many dreadful battles had been fought, many brave people had been killed. The Scots had lost many battles, but they had never been conquered and at last the kings of England had almost given up hope of ever being able to conquer them. But now, what they had longed for, and fought for in vain, happened quite quietly and naturally, although not at all in the way that they had expected. Instead of an English king conquering and ruling over Scotland, a Scottish king came to rule over England. Elizabeth Tudor Queen of England, being dead, James Stuart, King of Scotland, was the rightful heir to the throne. James the Sixth of Scotland was the son of the beautiful and unhappy Mary, Queen of Scots, was descended from Margaret Tudor, the sister of Henry the Eighth, and was Elizabeth's nearest relative. At the Queen's death, there was no man nor woman left in England who had any right to the throne. So the English sent to Scotland, and asked the Scottish king to come to be their king too. He came, and since 1603 a, England and Scotland have formed one kingdom with Wales and Ireland. So now we will talk no longer of England, but of Britain. For long ago, the old hatred has been forgotten, and we are all Britons. James had been king of Scotland for many years, before he became King of England too. He was a very little boy when he was first made King, and Scotland had been ruled by a regent. James had been carefully taught, but unfortunately his teachers had thought more of making him clever than of teaching him things which would have made him a great ruler. Some people call him the British Solomon, but because he was such a mixture of wisdom and foolishness, he has also been called the wisest fool in Christendom. Although his mother, Queen Mary, was a Roman Catholic, James had been brought up a Protestant. The English Roman Catholics thought, however, that, in memory of his mother, James would be kinder to them than Elizabeth had been. Elizabeth had not burned and tortured the Roman Catholics as her sister Mary had burned and tortured the Protestants. Still, they were not quite kindly treated. 
they had not equal rights with the Protestants, and were sometimes looked down upon. The Roman Catholics soon found out that James had no intention of being kind to them, and they became very angry. So angry did they become that they formed a plot to kill the king and all the chief Protestants in the country. Having done this, they intended to place James's little daughter, Elizabeth, upon the throne and make Britain a Roman Catholic country once more. Princess Elizabeth was, of course, being brought up as a Protestant, but she was such a little girl that the Catholics knew she would only be a make, believe queen. Until she grew up, the country would really be ruled by the Catholic gentlemen, and meantime they would have time, they thought, to teach her to be a Roman Catholic. The first thing to be done was to kill the king and all the chief Protestant gentlemen. To do this, the conspirators, as the people who form a plot, are called, thought of a very dreadful plan. They decided to wait until Parliament was sitting, until the king and all his wise men were gathered together in one place, and then they would blow them up with gunpowder. Underneath the Houses of Parliament there were cellars. These cellars were let to merchants and other people who wished to store goods. It was quite easy for the conspirators to rent one of these cellars, and into it they carried thirty-six barrels of gunpowder. Besides the gunpowder, sticks and firewood were piled into the cellars by the conspirators. This was done partly to hide the barrels, and partly, no doubt, to help to burn the Houses of Parliament when they were set on fire. Nobody paid much attention to the barrels as they were being taken in, and nobody thought of asking with what they were filled. For a year and a half the plot went on. Very few people knew of it, and those who did were bound by an oath never to talk of it. They met secretly at night, speaking only in mysterious whispers. At last everything was ready. Guy Fox, one of the most fearless of the band, was chosen for the most difficult and dangerous part. He was to set fire to the gunpowder. Having done so, he meant to try to escape, but if he could not, he was quite ready to die in what he thought was a good cause. The day was fixed for the 5th of November, when Parliament would be opened. A gentleman, called Francis Tresham, had joined the plot. He had a friend, a Roman Catholic nobleman, who was sure to be among the lords who would attend this parliament. Tresham could not bear to think of his friend being killed. So he wrote a letter to him, in a disguised hand, warning him not to go to this parliament, said the letter. Out of the love I bear to some of your friends, I have a care for your life. Therefore I advise you, if you love your life, to make some excuse so that you need not go to this parliament. God and man are agreed to punish the wickedness of this time. God and man are agreed to punish the wickedness of this time. Warning! But go away into the country where you may be safe. For although there is no sign of any stir, yet, I say, they shall receive a terrible blow this parliament, and yet they shall not see who hurts them. Tresham's friend was very much disturbed by this letter. He took it to Lord Salisbury, who took it to the king. The king, who was afterwards very proud of his cleverness, said that the terrible blow which was to be given, without the person being seen, must mean gunpowder. It was clever of the king to think of this, but some people say that Salisbury had already found out about the plot and perhaps he put the idea of gunpowder into the king's head. About midnight, on the 4th of November, the day before Parliament was to meet, the cellars under the houses were searched, with hushed voices, drawn swords, and dim lanterns, the searchers moved from cellar to cellar. All seemed empty, silent and dark,
stern men with drawn swords closed in upon him, and he was soon a prisoner. He could not deny his guilt. Round him were the barrels. In his pockets were those things which he needed to set fire to the gunpowder. He knew he must die. Oh, would I had been quicker, he said, would I had set fire to the powder. Death would have been sweet had some of my enemies gone with me. Guy Fox was taken to the tower. In the cruel manner of those days he was tortured to make him tell the names of the others who were with him in the plot. But Guy Fawkes was very brave, although he was wrong and he would not tell. The others, seeing that part of their plot had failed, hoped still to succeed in gaining possession of the Princess Elizabeth, so they hastily rode to the country house where she was living. But part of the gunpowder which they took with them, which they took with them, was set on fire and exploded by accident. It hurt some and frightened all of them, for they thought that it was a punishment sent upon them because of what they had intended to do to others. The Roman Catholics in the country did not rise to help the conspirators, as they had expected, and soon all hope of success was lost. The chief of the conspirators were seized and were put to death along with Guy Fox. Man approaching men with swords and lanterns in a cellar stern men with drawn swords closed in upon him. After this the Protestants hated the Roman Catholics more than ever, and their lives were made very hard. There was great rejoicing at the discovery of the plot. Bells rang, and bonfires blazed, and even now, after three hundred years, the day is not forgotten. On the 5th of November, people still have fireworks and bonfires on which they burn a figure made of straw and old clothes, which is meant to represent Guy Fawkes. Chapter 75 James the Sixth of Scotland, the First of England, the Story of the Mayflower When Henry the Eighth broke away from the Church of Rome, he did not make much change in the services or in the ruling of the church. He merely said that the Pope had nothing to do with the church in England, and he commanded the services to be read in English instead of Latin. But by degrees many Protestants began to think that the Church of England was too like the Church of Rome. They wanted to have no prayer book at all. They wanted to have very simple services and very simple churches. These people were called Puritans. They were very stern and grave, but many of the best and bravest men in England joined them. At this time men did not wear plain, dark clothes as they do now. They wore bright colors, and their clothes were often made of silk and velvet, and trimmed with lace. They wore their hair long and curly, and they had feathers in their hat. But the Puritans thought this gay dress was wicked. They cut their hair short, and wore dark clothes and plain linen collars, instead of lace and feathers and gay-colored silks and satins. They even spoke in a slow and sad tone of voice, and they very seldom laughed. Others, even more stern and strict, were called separatists. They felt that in England they could not worship God in what seemed to them the right way. So, although they loved their country, some of them resolved to leave it and sail away over the sea to the new lands which had been discovered. There they would found a new England where they could be free. The first of these brave people who left England for conscience' sake were called the Pilgrim Fathers. The ship they sailed in was called the Mayflower. There were only one hundred of them, men, women, and children, all left dear friends behind. Some said good-bye forever to fathers and mothers. Some left their wives and little children, hoping one day to be able to send for them when they had made a new home far over the sea. But sad as they were, 
their hearts were full of hope, and in spite of tears they sang hymns. They started in the summer, but they had so many delays and misfortunes that it was winter before they reached America. They did not come to the part of America to which they had expected to come, but reached land much further north, where the winter was very cold, far colder than the English winter. As the little Mayflower drew near, the shore of their new home looked very dark and dreary to those pilgrim fathers. There were no people to greet them on the beach, no houses with twinkling lights by night and cheerful smoke by day. There was nothing but the rough, rocky shore, and beyond it, a mass of bare, brown tree. There was no sound but the roar of the waves, the call of sea-birds, and the cry of wild animals. The little band of pilgrims felt very lonely when they landed in this strange country, hundreds and hundreds of miles from any white people. Dark woods and wilderness lay in front, behind the cold gray sea, separating them from all their loved ones, and round them day and night the fear of attack from the wild red Indians, who inhabited the land. But in spite of dangers and hardships they did not lose heart. Soon the noise of axe and saw was heard in the forest as the pilgrim fathers, as the pilgrim fathers, felled trees and cut them into planks with which to build their houses. Through cold and wind and rain they worked, and a little town of wooden houses rose round the little wooden meeting-house, as they called their church. The building went on slowly, for all the pilgrim fathers could not work at once. Some of them had to keep watch, in case of attack from the Red Indians, while the remainder built the houses and laid out the gardens. The little band struggled bravely. They were often cold and hungry, weary and afraid. Still, they did not give up hope. They had very little to eat. Sometimes they did not even know at night if they would have anything for breakfast in the morning. Once an eagle was shot, and they thought it was a great treat. It tasted something like mutton. Once a sailor found a herring on the shore. As it was only enough for one, the captain had it for supper. But many of the pilgrims, unused to such hardships, died during the winter. At last the dark days passed, and with the sunshine of the spring came brighter time, and with the spring the Mayflower, which had lain in the bay all winter, sailed back to England. With sad hearts the pilgrims saw it go. It was the last link which bound them to their old home. Yet in spite of the longing in their hearts for the green fields and white cliffs of England, in spite of all the hardships they had suffered, not one pilgrim returned home with the Mayflower. They knelt upon the shore, watching with tear-dimmed eyes, till the last glimmer of its white sails died away in the distance. Then they turned back to their work. But for many days after the bay seemed sad and empty, with no little Mayflower riding at anchor in it. The Pilgrim Fathers named their town Plymouth, after the town in England from which they had sailed. No colony was ever founded in braver fashion, and the people of the United States are justly proud of these heroic ancestors. And although the great American Republic is no longer a British colony, but a separate nation, we may join hands across the broad Atlantic and share a little in that pride. If you look at the map of America, you will see Plymouth marked in the state of Massachusetts. In that town, there is a hall called Pilgrim Hall, and in front of it stands a rock which is railed round and carefully preserved. It is the rock which the feet of the Pilgrim Fathers first touched when they landed to found New England. The people of America are proud to remember that they are descended from those stern, brave men and women. So they guard the stone as something precious.
and the twenty-second of December, the day on which the Pilgrim Fathers landed, is called Forefathers' Day, and is kept as a holiday. The breaking waves dashed high on a stern and rock-bound coast, and the woods against the stormy sky their giant branches tossed, and the heavy night hung dark the hills and water o'er, when a band of exiles moored their bark on the wild New England shore. Not as the conqueror comes, they the true-hearted came, not with the roll of stirring drums, and the trumpet that sings of fame. Not as the flying come, in silence and in fear, they shook the depths of the depths of the desert gloom with their hymns of lofty cheer. Amidst the storm they sang, and the stars heard, and the sea, and the sounding aisles of the dim wood rang to the anthem of the free. The ocean eagle soared from his nest by the white wave's foam, and the rocking pines of the forest roared, this was their welcome home. There were men with hoary hair amidst that pilgrim band. Why had they come to wither there, away from their childhood's land? There was woman's fearless eye, lit by her deep love's truth. There was manhood's brow serenely high, and the fiery heart of youth. What sought? they thus afar, bright jewels of the mine, the wealth of seas, the spoils of war. No, t'was a faith's pure shrine, people bringing a boat to shore, a band of exiles, moored their bark on the wild New England shore. Chapter 76. Charles I. How a woman struck a blow for freedom. Like Queen Elizabeth, King James had favorites. But unfortunately the favorites he chose were not good and wise men who helped him to govern well, but men who, although clever, were bad, and who thought only of themselves. Some of these men liked money and fine clothes, and James spent so much on them that he was always poor and in debt and this led him into quarrels with the people and Parliament. The Tudors had been a very autocratic race of kings. Autocratic is a word made from Greek words and means that the Tudors wanted to rule quite by themselves without help or advice from anyone. During the time of the Tudors, especially in the reigns of Henry the Eighth and Elizabeth, the power of Parliament had been much lessened. James tried to lessen it still more. James knew how autocratic Elizabeth had been, and he meant to be the same. But Elizabeth, although she had her own way in many things, knew when to yield and let the people have their way. James did not know how to yield. He wanted to be a despot, which is another word taken from Greek and really means master, but has come to mean cruel master. The king can do no wrong, said James. What he does must be right, and the people must obey and ask no questions. King James wrote several books, and in one of them he set down his ideas about the power of a king. But the people did not agree with these ideas. They thought many of the things which the king did were wrong. As they would not do everything he wished them to do, James dismissed Parliament and ruled for many years without calling another. When James died in 1625 A.D., no one was very sorry. He had reigned for fifty-eight years, thirty-six years as King of Scotland, and twenty-two as King of Great Britain and Ireland, and his people, English, Scots, and Irish were discontented with his rule. Yet in spite of all he had tried to do, the people were really nearer freedom than before, for they had shown that they would not quietly submit to the rule of a despot. James was succeeded by his son Charles. He had been taught by his father to believe that the king could do no wrong, and like his father, Charles wanted to be autocratic. Charles, too, dismissed Parliament, 
because he could not have entirely his own way. He tried to make the people pay taxes and give him money without the consent of Parliament, and this made them very angry. Like King James, King Charles had bad advisers, and one of the worst, perhaps, was his own wife, of whom he was very fond. She was a French princess called Henrietta Maria, and was a Roman Catholic. She hated the Puritans, who were growing more and more important in England. Charles hated them, too, and, with the advice of Archbishop Laud, who was one of his chief advisers, he treated the Puritans very hardly. Many of the people in Scotland had become Protestant. They were called Presbyterians, and, like the Puritans, they chose to have a very simple form of worship, and very simple churches. This did not please Charles. He said that the Scottish Church must use the same service as the English Church. He ordered a new prayer book to be made which was almost the same as the English prayer book. This he sent to all the Scottish ministers, commanding them to begin to use it on Sunday, 23rd July, 1637a. There was great excitement among the Scottish people when this order became known. On the Sunday morning many crowded to the Cathedral of St. Giles in Edinburgh, wondering what would happen. When the dean entered, it was seen that he was wearing a white robe instead of the black one in which the Scottish clergy usually preached. The dean little knew of the anger which was rising in the hearts of the stern-faced men and women round him, as the words of the new prayers rang strangely through the silent church. He began the service using the new prayer book, but he had not gone far when an old woman called Jenny Geddes sprang up. Thou false thief, she cried, wilt thou say mass at my ear? And with that she threw the stool upon which she had been sitting at the dean's head. In a moment the whole church was in confusion. The mass! The mass! Popery! Popery! shouted the people. Down with the pope! Down with him! The women rushed at the dean and tore his white surplice from his shoulders, and he was so hardly used that he ran the risk of being killed. The Bishop of Edinburgh went into the pulpit and tried to calm the people, but they would not listen to him. A Pope! A Pope! They cried, Down with him! Down with him! Down with him! At last soldiers were sent for. The church was cleared, the doors were locked, and the new service was read to the few who were in favor of it. Outside the crowd yelled and hooted, breaking the windows with stones and hammering on the doors, which were locked and barred against them. The bishop barely escaped with his life. He was carried through the crowd, surrounded by soldiers with drawn swords in their hands. All Scotland was in arms, high and low banded together, to resist the king. They drew up a paper which was signed by thousands, binding themselves to fight for the freedom of religion. This paper was called the National Covenant, and the people who signed it the Covenanters. Scotland was ready for war, and Charles was forced to recall the prayer book and allow the Scottish Church to be free. Charles promised the Scottish Church freedom, but he could never keep his word. Soon he raised an army intending to force them to do as he wished. But the Scots were ready to fight, and they marched into England to meet Charles. The English Puritans were on the side of the Scots, and for the first time in all history a Scottish army coming into England was welcomed by the English. The fighting ended in a victory for the Scots, and once more Charles promised them freedom in religion. If you should ever go to St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, you will see there a brass plate in memory of Jenny Geddes and her deed. It is set there 
not because it is right or wrong to use a prayer book, not because it is better to worship God in one way rather than another, but because it is right that people should be free to pray to God and worship God in their own way. Neither Pope nor King has a right to say how any man or woman shall pray and it is not because Jenny Geddes fought against a prayer book, but because she struck a blow for freedom, that we remember her. Chapter 77 Charles I The story of now the king and the parliament quarrelled, and at last fought. As parliament would not do exactly as King Charles wished, he ruled without one for nearly twelve years. During these years he was often in need of money, and raised it in many wrong ways. But at last he could get no more money by right or by wrong ways, and he was obliged to call a parliament. In 1640 A.D., what is known as the Long Parliament began to sit. It was called the Long Parliament because it lasted so long. The people chose the members for this parliament very carefully and they were not slow to show the king how strong they were. They beheaded one of the king's advisers because they said he had been guilty of treason. To commit treason means to do anything that is hurtful to the state or government. To commit high treason is to do anything hurtful to the king. The parliament also imprisoned Archbishop Lord, and three years later he was beheaded. King Charles had quarrelled with every Parliament he had had during his reign. Now the quarrels grew worse and worse. At last one day Charles marched to the House, followed by his soldiers, meaning to seize five members, who, he thought, were his worst enemy. Leaving his soldiers at the door of the House, Charles went in and marched up to the Speaker's chair. Mr. Speaker's chair, Mr. Speaker, he said, I must borrow your seat for a time. The Speaker rose and fell upon his knee before the King, the members standing bareheaded, while the King sat down in the Speaker's chair. Charles looked keenly round the house, but none of the five members were to be seen. They had been warned and were not there. He called them each by name. Only silence answered. Mr. Speaker, said Charles at last, where are those five members whom I have called? Are any of them in the house? Do you see them? said the Speaker, again falling upon his knees. I have neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this place, but as the house may be pleased to direct me. Ah, said Charles. I see the birds are flown. Then, after making a very angry and bitter speech, he left the house. As he passed out, the silence was broken by cries of rage, for the people felt that the king was trampling on all their rights. The quarrels grew worse and worse, and at last war broke out. War between Britain and Britain, English, Scots, and Irish all joined in this war, and it was called the Great Rebellion. The King and the Lords were on one side, and the Parliament and the people on the other. Those who followed the King were called Cavaliers or Royalists. Those who followed the Parliament were called Parliamentarians or Roundheads. Cavalier comes from a word which means horse, and the Cavaliers were so called because most of them rode upon horses. The roundheads were so called because they wore their hair short, instead of long and curling like the cavaliers. The roundheads were for the most part Puritans, while the cavaliers belonged to the Church of England. At this time there was no regular army in Britain, such as we have now, and a great many of those who fought were quite untrained. The King's army was in some ways better than the army of the Parliament, for it contained many gentlemen who were accustomed to danger, and who were accustomed to danger, and who were able to ride. 
the parliamentarians were chiefly working men who knew very little about fighting. But among them there was a brave, strong man called Oliver Cromwell. He knew how hard it would be for these working men to conquer if they were not taught how to fight. So he drilled them and taught them quickness and obedience. So thoroughly did they learn that they became most splendid soldiers and were called Oliver Cromwell's Ironsides. Never were such strange soldiers seen. In those days a camp was a wild, rough place. But from the camp of Cromwell's soldiers, instead of the sound of drunkenness and laughter, came the sound of psalm singing and prayer. To many of them the war was a holy war, a battle for the freedom of religion. Trust in God and keep your powder dry was Cromwell's advice to his soldiers, as one day they were crossing a river to attack the enemy. For four years the war went on. The royalist leaders were Lord Lindsay and the king's nephew, Prince Rupert. Prince Rupert was so fiery and eager in battle that he was called Dashing Prince Rupert. But although he was very brave, he was not a good general and often did rash thing. The chief of the Roundhead leaders were Oliver Cromwell, Ireton, and Fairfax. Many battles were fought, sometimes one side winning, sometimes the other. But at last, at a battle called Naseby, the Cavaliers were utterly defeated. Then Charles lost all hope. He had no money left and very few friends. He felt that his cause was ruined, and thinking that the Scots would be kinder to him than the English, he gave himself up to them. The Scots and the English were still friends, and they agreed that if Charles would grant to England the same kind of religion as Scotland, they would set him on the throne again. But Charles would not promise this, so the Scots gave him up to the Parliamentarian. But when the war was over, it was found that neither King nor Parliament ruled the land, but the army. The King being now a prisoner, the Parliament said there was no longer any need for the army, and told the soldiers to go back to their homes. But the soldiers refused to go. They knew how powerful they had become and they resolved to become yet more powerful and get possession of the king. One evening a man called Cornet Joyce, with about eight hundred soldiers behind him, rode to the house in which King Charles was kept prisoner. Going into the king's room he told him politely and kindly that he had come to take him away. After some talk Charles said he was willing to go, but as it was now late, Cornet Joyce must come again in the morning. Accordingly, at six o'clock next morning, the king rose, and, going out to the courtyard, found Joyce and all his soldiers waiting there, mounted and ready. I pray you, Mr. Joyce, said the king, as he looked at the company of stern men in steel armor, deal honestly with me, and show me your commission by a commission, the king meant a letter to say that Joyce really had orders to take him away. Here is my commission, said Joyce. Where? said the king. Here, said Joyce. Where? again asked the king. Behind me, said Joyce. Pointing to the mounted soldiers, I hope it will satisfy your majesty. Then Charles smiled and said, it is as fair a commission, and as well written as ever I have seen a commission in my life. It may be read without spelling. But what if I refuse to go with you? I hope you would not force me. I am your king, and you ought not to lay violent hands upon your king. I am you ought not to lay vile. Acknowledge none to be above me here. But God, we will not hurt you, your majesty, replied Joyce. Nay, we will not even force you to come with us against your will. So Charles consented to go with them, and asked, How far do you intend to ride today? As far as your majesty can conveniently ride, replied Joyce. I can ride as far as you or as any man here, 
said Charles, smiling, and so they set out. In this way the king became the prisoner of the army, instead of the prisoner of the army, instead of the prisoner of the parliament. Chapter 78 Charles I The Story of How the King Was Brought to His Death God gives not kings the style of gods in vain, for on the throne his scepter do they sway, and as their subjects ought them to obey, so kings should fear and serve their God again. If, then, ye would enjoy a happy reign, observe the statutes of our heavenly King, and from his law make all your laws to spring. If his lieutenant here, you would remain, reward the just, be steadfast, true, and plain. Repress the proud, maintaining I the right, walk always so as ever in his sight, who guards the godly, plaguing the profane. Mighty King Divine. This poetry was written by James to his son, and perhaps it would have been better both for James and Charles had they tried to rule, as the poem says kings ought to rule. After Charles became the prisoner of the army, letters and messages passed continually between him and Parliament, and between him and the leaders of the army. Both parties offered to replace the king, upon the throne if he would only promise them certain thing. But these things Charles would not promise, for all the time he was secretly plotting with his friends, and hoping to free himself. The leaders of the army treated Charles very kindly, allowing him to see his friends, and to have a great deal of liberty. This made it easy for him to escape, which he did, and fled to Carisbrook Castle in the Isle of Wight. But although he thought that he was going to friends, he found that he was again a prisoner, and more carefully guarded than before. The struggle for power between Parliament and army still went on, but Cromwell was master of the army, and he meant to be master of Parliament too. So one day when Parliament was about to meet, a man called Colonel Pride surrounded the house with soldiers. As they arrived, each member, who would not do exactly as Cromwell and the other army leaders wished, was seized and turned away. When this was done, there were only about fifty members left. This was called Pride's Purge, because he purged or cleaned away all those who did not think exactly as he did. It was still the long Parliament that was sitting, but people now called it the Rump Parliament because it was not a real parliament, because it was not a real part of one. Cromwell was master of king and parliament, but the army was too strong even for him. Against his will he was driven to do a deed from which he shrank. He was driven to condemn the king to death. Charles was accused of high treason against the nation, and was brought to London to be tried. This was a crime which had never been heard of before as high treason means a crime against the ruler. More than a hundred men were called as judges of the king, but scarcely half of them came. Many of them were angry with Charles, and wished him to be punished. But the punishment for treason they knew was death, and they did not wish the king to be killed. The judges assembled at Westminster Hall, and King Charles was brought before them as a prisoner. They who had always stood bareheaded in his presence, now sat with their hats upon their head. Seeing that, Charles, too, kept on his hat, but it was seen that his hair, which had been very beautiful, had grown grey, and that he looked old and worn. Charles had been foolish, he had been wicked, but now, in the face of death, he behaved with the dignity of a king. The men who sat before him he said, had no right to judge or condemn him. He would not plead for mercy. Three times he was brought before the court. Three times he refused to plead. At last the judges, without further trial, sentenced him to death as a tyrant, a traitor, a murderer, and a public enemy, calm and dignified as ever. Charles walked out of the hall after the sentence had been pronounced.
"'God bless your majesty,' cried a soldier as he passed, and was struck by his officer for daring to say such words. Methinks, said the king, pausing and smiling at the man, the punishment is greater than the fall. Three days later Charles the king walked for the last time through the streets of London, from St. James's Palace to Whitehall. The way was lined with soldiers. Soldiers marched in front of him and behind him, the air was filled with the noise of trampling feet and the sound of drum, man in hat with long hair and moustache being escorted by men with pikes Charles the King walked for the last time through the streets of London. The scaffold was raised outside the palace of Whitehall, and hundreds of people crowded to see the dreadful end of their king, some in joy, very many, in grief and awe. Charles knelt by the block amid deep silence. And when a man in a black mask held up the king's head, crying, Behold the head of a traitor, a groan burst from the shuddering crowd. He nothing common did or mean upon that memorable scene, but with his keener eye the axe's edge did try, nor called the gods with vulgar spite to vindicate his helpless right, but bowed his comely head down as upon a bed. Chapter 79 The Commonwealth The Adventures of a Prince King Charles was beheaded on 30th January 1649 A.D., and Parliament immediately proclaimed that kings were bad and useless, so England would have no more. The government would be a commonwealth. Common here means belonging to all and wealth. Although we now use it to mean money, at one time meant well-being or happiness. Commonwealth really means the well-being or happiness of all. No one was to be greater than another. All were to be equal. The House of Lords was therefore said to be useless and dangerous and was done away with. It was also made a crime for anyone to call Prince Charles King. Although he was the eldest son of Charles I, the people of Scotland and Ireland, however, were very angry when they heard what had happened. The Scots had never wished the King to be killed. They had hoped to force him to rule better. Now that he was dead, they proclaimed his son Charles King. At the same time, the Irish rebelled, and Cromwell and his Ironsides went to subdue them. Very many of the Irish were Roman Catholics, and some years before they had risen and cruelly murdered the Irish Protestants. Cromwell hated the Roman Catholics, and he intended now to punish them for their cruelty to the Protestants, as well as for rebelling against the Commonwealth as the government of Britain was now called. Cromwell remained nine months in Ireland, and so cruel and pitiless was he, that for many years no Irishman could hear his name without a shudder and a curse. The country was utterly subdued. Many of the people were killed. Others were sent as slaves to the West Indies, and all who could fled to far countries to escape the fury of Cromwell. When he had finished this dreadful work, Cromwell returned to England, and then marched into England, and then marched into Scotland. The Ironsides had never been defeated, and now they won battle after battle, and at last Charles decided to march into England and fight for his crown there. Cromwell was very much astonished when he heard what Charles was doing, and he hurried after him as fast as he could. The English did not flock to join Charles, as he had expected, and when the two armies met at Worcester, Cromwell's army was nearly twice as large as that of the Prince. A dreadful battle followed. The Scots fought gallantly for their Prince, but they were utterly defeated. Hardly any escaped, and those who were not killed were sold as slaves. Cromwell called this battle his crowning mercy, for with it Charles lost all hope of regaining his kingdom. It was fought 
on what Cromwell used to think was his lucky day, the 3rd of September. Charles fled from Worcester, and had many adventures before he reached safety. Great rewards were offered to anyone who would tell where he was hiding. Punishment and death threatened those who helped him. Yet so many were faithful to him that he escaped. He cut off his beautiful hair, stained his face and his white hands brown, and instead of silk and satin, he put on coarse clothes which were much patched and darned, so that he looked like a laboring man. Then, with an axe over his shoulder, he went into the woods with four brothers, who really were working men, and pretended to cut wood. All day long they stayed in the wood, and at night the four brothers guided the prince to another place. There they found so many of Cromwell's men that it was not safe for Charles to stay in a house. That night he slept in a hayloft. Next day, finding that even there he was not safe, he climbed into an oak tree and lay among the branches. As it was September, the leaves were very thick and hid him well. Charles lay very still and quiet. His heart thumped against his ribs, and he held his breath when some of Cromwell's soldiers rode under the tree. They were so close that he could hear them talk. The Lord hath given the ungodly one into our hands, said one. Yea, he cannot be afar off. We will use well our eyes. Perchance the Lord may deliver the malignant even unto us. But the kind green leaves kept close, and little did the roundheads think that the very man for whom they were looking was close above their heads and could hear every word they said. For a whole long day Charles lay in the oak, and at last Cromwell's men, having searched and searched in vain for him, went away. Then Charles climbed down from the tree and walked many weary miles till his feet were blistered and sore, and his bones ached. At length he reached the house of a royalist lady and gentleman, who were kind to him. The lady pretended that she had to go on a journey to visit a sick friend. Charles was dressed as her servant and mounted upon a horse, and the lady got up behind him. In those days, before there were trains or even coaches, ladies very often travelled like this. They did not ride upon a horse by themselves, but mounted behind a servant or a friend. For many miles Charles travelled as this lady's servant. Having many miles Charles travelled as this lady's servant, having many adventures and escapes by the way. As Charles was supposed to be the servant, he had, of course, to look after the horse. One evening, as he went into the stable, yard of the inn in which they were to spend the night, he found it full of Cromwell's men. One of them looked hard at the prince. My friend, he said, I seem to know your face. Like enough, replied Charles, I have travelled a good deal with my masters. Surely, said the man, you were with Mr. Baxter. Yes, replied the prince calmly, I was with him. But now make way, my man, till I see after my beast. I will talk to you later. So Charles busied himself with his horse, and escaped from the man who took him to be a fellow-servant. After many dangers, often being recognized in spite of his disguises, the prince arrived at Lyme Regis, and there a little boat was found to take him over to France. But when the captain's wife heard who was going to sail in her husband's boat, she was afraid. She was afraid that Cromwell might hear of it, and perhaps kill her husband. So she told him he must not go. I must go, said the captain, I have promised. You shall not go, said his wife, and seeing that talking did no good, she locked him into a room and took the key away. Charles and his friends waited in vain for the captain, and at last they left Lyme Regis in despair. After more adventures they reached Brighton and there they really did find a boat and a captain willing to take them over to France. The evening before starting, Charles was having supper at a little inn in Brighton, when the landlord came behind him and kissed his hand. Again he had been recognized. 
but the landlord was faithful and would not betray him. God bless your majesty, he said. Perhaps I may live to be a lord and my good wife a lady. He thought that if Charles ever came back to the throne, he would not forget those who had helped and served him when he was poor and in trouble. For more than six weeks, Charles had travelled in fear and danger among his bitter enemies. In spite of his disguises, many people had recognised him. Yet not one had betrayed him. Instead, they had taken a great deal of trouble and run many risks to help and save him, and now his difficulties and dangers were over. Very early next morning, while it was still almost dark, the little party crept down to the shore. In the grey dawn, Charles stepped on board the boat. The sails were set, and slowly he was carried away from his kingdom, which he was not to see again for many long days. Chapter 80 The Commonwealth The Lord Protector The British had hardly done fighting at home when they had to fight with enemies abroad. They went to war with the Dutch, who at this time had a very famous admiral called Van Tromp. The English, too, had a famous admiral called Blake. The Dutch and the British had several reasons for quarrelling. Each tried to spoil the trade of the other, and the Dutch would not acknowledge the new British government. This made the Parliament very angry. Several fierce battles were fought at sea, and when the Dutch won, Van Tromp hoisted a broom to his masthead as a sign that he intended to sweep the British ships from the seas. Blake and the English were very angry at this. They built and manned more ships as fast as they could, and once more sailed out to fight the Dutch. When the two fleets met, the fiercest, longest battle of this sea war took place. For three days they fought, but in the end Blake was victorious, and, bravely though he had fought, Van Tromp was obliged to lower his proud broom and sweep the remainder of his own fleet homeward. It was now about four years since King Charles had been beheaded. Cromwell was the strongest man in the country, yet no real ruler had been appointed, and the Romp Parliament was acting neither wisely nor well. Cromwell made up his mind to put an end to this. So one day he marched to put an end to this. So one day he marched to Parliament at the head of about three hundred of his soldiers. He himself went into the house, leaving some of his soldiers at the door, some in the lobby, and some on the stairs. He sat down in his usual place and listened for some time to the talking. Then suddenly he rose up and began to speak. He told the Parliament that the things which they did were unjust, that they were tyrants and worse. But your hour hath come, he cried. The Lord hath done with you, and putting on his hat, he stamped with his foot, and his soldiers rushed in. I will put an end to your babbling, he shouted. And at a signal from their master, the soldiers drove the members out of the hall, Cromwell calling out insulting names at them as they passed. The speaker refused to leave the chair and tried to address the members. But in the noise and confusion he could not make himself heard. Then one of Cromwell's friends took him by the arm and forced him to go. In a few minutes the hall was cleared of everyone except Cromwell's soldiers and followers. On the table lay the mace. The mace is the sign of the dignity and the lawfulness of Parliament. It is carried before the Speaker as he enters and leaves the House and lies on the table while the members talk together. It is a sign of law and order, just as the scepter is the sign of royalty and rule. Cromwell did not like any form or ceremony. He thought it was foolish and wicked. Take away that bauble, he said angrily, pointing to the mace. So it was removed. Cromwell's friends then left the house, he himself coming last and locking the doors after him. This was the end of the long Parliament. It had lasted for thirteen years. Cromwell and his friends now set to work to form a new Parliament, 
and one more to their liking than the last had been. In the last had been, instead of allowing the people to choose the members, Cromwell himself chose them. But this Parliament did not please him much better than the last, and in less than five months it was again dissolved. Cromwell was now asked to become ruler. Some of his friends wished him to take the title of king, but he refused, chiefly because he knew that his greatest friends were the soldiers, and they hated the name of king. If he took that name he was sure that they would turn against him and become his worst enemies. So he became ruler under the title of Lord Protector. Cromwell was not crowned and anointed as kings were, but there was a very solemn service held when a beautiful purple robe was placed upon his shoulders, the sword of office buckled to his side, and the scepter put into his hand. He was truly king in everything but name. Cromwell was not only a king, but a very stern and autocratic one. He wanted his own way quite as much as the Stuarts had done. Only he really thought of the good of the country, and the Stuarts thought only of themselves. The troubles of the Civil War now began to pass away, and under the stern rule of the Lord Protector, Britain began once more to be peaceful and prosperous at home, and famous abroad. All the Protestants of Europe looked to Cromwell for help and protection and so powerful was his name that he could always give help. Kings bowed and obeyed when Cromwell commanded, and Britain was famous as she had not been since the days of Elizabeth. Her soldiers were the best in the world. Her admirals won for her the name of Mistress of the Seas, a name which she has kept ever since. Yet the man who had won this great place for Britain lived in terror of his life. He was a tyrant, and like all tyrants, he was bitterly hated, and he knew it. Under his clothes he wore armor, he always carried weapons, and wherever he went he was followed and surrounded by a strong bodyguard. No one ever knew where he would sleep, for he moved about from room to room in his great palace, lest someone should attack him while he rested. At last, worn out in body and brain, the great Lord Protector died on 3rd September 1658 A.D. It was his lucky day. He first put arms into religion's hand, and timorous conscience unto courage manned. The soldier taught that inward mail to wear, and fearing God, how they should nothing fear. Those strokes, he said, will pierce through all below, where those that strike from heaven fetch their blow, astonished. Armies did their flight prepare, and cities strong were stormed by his prayer. In all his wars, needs must he triumph, when he conquered God, still ere he fought with men. Chapter 81 Charles the Second how the king came to his own, and how death walked in the streets of London. Oliver Cromwell had been so strong and powerful that it seemed quite natural to the people to the people to choose his son, Richard, as the next protector. But Richard was a very different man from his father. He had not that in him which makes a great soldier or a great ruler. The army, the parliament, and the people soon found this out, and troubles began. In a few months, Richard gave up his office of protector, and went away to live quietly in his house in the country. The people were tired of being ruled by the army. They were tired of the gloom and the sternness of the Puritans. They remembered with regret the days of Charles I, when people dressed in gay colours, when they sang and played when it was not thought wicked to have Christmas games or village dances, and they longed for these days to come again. They forgot how cruel and bad Charles had been. They remembered that he had a son, the son whom the Scots had already crowned king. General Monk, who had ruled Scotland under Cromwell, saw that many of the Scots had never forgotten their king. So, thinking great things, but saying little, he began to march to London. 
The Parliament and the army were already quarrelling, and as Monk passed through England, people flocked to him from all sides, begging him to try to bring peace and order into the country again. This was what Monk meant to do, how he had not settled, but letters and messages were secretly passing between him and Charles, who was at this time living in Holland. At last Monk reached London, and one day, when Parliament was sitting, he entered the house and told the members that there was a messenger at the door with a letter from Charles. Amid great excitement, the messenger was brought in, and the letter read. It promised pardon to all those who had rebelled against Charles I. It promised freedom to all to worship God as they thought right. It seemed to bring once more the promise of happiness and peace to Britain. The people rejoiced and shouted, God save the king! The Commonwealth was at an end. Britain had a king again. A few days later Charles landed at Dover, where he was met by Monk, and, mid the cheers and rejoicing of the people, rode to London. Charles landed upon his birthday, 29th May 1660 A.D., and people thought it was a good sign that he should have arrived upon such a happy day. The soldiers alone did not rejoice. They had always hated the name of king. They hated it still, and when Charles the Second rode gaily into London, the army, which was drawn up on Blackheath to do him honour, stood sullen, gloomy, and silent. For more than ten years the army had been the greatest power in the country. But Charles saw that, because the soldiers disliked him, for him it was a danger rather than a safeguard. So he disbanded the army and sent the soldiers back to their homes. Charles was very glad to return to his own country. From being poor and homeless, he had become the ruler over one of the greatest kingdoms of the world. But in spite of all he had suffered, he had not learned to be kind or good. As soon as Charles was safely on the throne, he forgot all the promises which he had made. Many of the people who had helped to put Charles I to death were punished, some of them being beheaded. The old quarrels about religion began again as fiercely as ever, for the king was a Roman Catholic at heart, although he dared not own it and pretended to belong to the Church of England. The new parliament was called the Cavalier Parliament, because it was so full of the king's friends, and they made laws which were very hard for the Puritans and Presbyterians. Scotland suffered much from these laws, and Charles sent a cruel man called Lauderdale to govern for him there. He, helped by another man called Claverhouse, tortured and put to death all those who would not worship God as the king commanded. During the reign of Charles the Second, there was another war between the Dutch and the British. The Dutch had good ships, brave sailors, and brave leaders. The British, too, were brave, but their ships were badly managed. The money which should have been used to pay and feed the sailors was wasted by the king and his friends. The war, however, went fiercely on, sometimes one side, sometimes the other, having the best of it. But the Dutch grew very bold, and at last sailed up the Thames, burning and destroying many of the British ships. Then, for the only time in all history, the roar of an enemy's guns was heard in London. The people went mad with fear and shame and anger. They thought the kingdom itself was threatened, and, recalling the days of Cromwell, asked themselves if he would have suffered an enemy so to insult his country. But the danger passed, and peace was made. While this war was going on, a terrible sickness called the plague broke out in London. It began in winter time. At first no one thought much about it, for such sickness was common in those days when people were careless about keeping their houses and towns clean. But, as the days became warmer, the plague became worse, and soon it was so terrible 
that all who could fled from the town. It was a dreadful time. No business was done, the shops were shut, the churches were empty, the streets, which used to be so full of people hurrying to and fro, were silent, deserted, and grass-grown. As soon as it became known that any one in a house had the plague, all who lived in that house were forbidden to leave it, lest they should carry the dreadful sickness to others. Then the door was marked with a great red cross, and the words, The Lord have mercy on us. At night the awful silence of the streets was broken by the sounds of heavy, rumbling carts, and the mournful cry of the men in charge of them, Bring out your dead, for those who died of this sickness could not be buried in a peaceful green churchyard where their friends could come to put flowers upon their graves. There were far too many of them for that. Those who died during the day were carried away in a cart at night, and buried all together in a great grave which was dug for them outside the town. The story is told of a boatman who, when his wife became ill of the plague, could no longer go near his house, but slept in his boat. He worked hard all day, and in the evening used to bring what he had earned and lay it upon a stone not far from his house. Then he would go a little distance off and call to his wife. When she heard his call, she sent one of their children out to take the money and the food which he had brought. They would speak to each other for a short time at a distance, and then the boatman would go away again, sad at heart, wondering if his wife and children would be still alive when he came again next evening. But at least he knew that his dear ones would not die of hunger, as so many of the poor people did whose friends had run away and deserted them. This dreadful sickness was greatly caused, and made much worse, by the dirt of the streets and the houses. In those days no one thought of keeping the streets clean. People threw all the rubbish from their houses into them, and there it lay rotting and poisoning the air. The streets, too, were very narrow, and windows small, so that little air or light could come into the houses. In fact, people never thought about fresh air and light. The doctors did not know how to cure this sickness. Make believe doctors offered the people all kinds of medicines, which could do no good, but which were eagerly bought. Many went mad with terror and horror, and at one time a thousand people died every day. But at last the dreadful summer passed, and with the coming of the winter and the frost, the terrible sickness gradually disappeared. Chapter 82 Charles the Second. The story of how London was burned. After the plague had passed away, another dreadful misfortune happened to London. At least at the time it seemed like a misfortune. But really it was a good thing. This was the great fire which caused much of the city to be burned to the ground. Many of the dirty houses and narrow streets were destroyed, and with them the last remains of the dreadful plague were also burned away. When the houses were built again, they were made better, and the streets were made wider, so that the great fire was not altogether a misfortune. The fire first broke out in a baker's shop. As most of the houses were built of wood, and the summer had been unusually hot and dry, the flames spread very fast. They leapt from house to house, and the people— seeing that it was useless to try to save their dwellings, tried rather to save their furniture and belongings by carrying them to other houses. But sometimes, as soon as they had done this, the fire would attack these too, and the people had to fly still further away, often in the end losing all that they possessed. For three days and nights the fire blazed and roared. A great cloud of smoke hung over the city by day, but at night there was no darkness, for the flames made it brighter than by day. The air was hot and stifling, and at last no one could go near the fire, so great was the heat. The earth seemed a blazing furnace, and the sky as if 
beaten out of burning copper. To stop the fire seemed impossible. It must burn and burn until nothing more was left to destroy. So houses were pulled down in order to make a gap between the burning ones and those which were still safe. But the work went on too slowly, and before the gap was big enough, the fire had reached the workers, and they had to flee for their lives. At last some one thought of the plan of blowing up the houses with gunpowder. This was done, and when the hungry flames reached the open spaces left by the houses which had been destroyed, they died away, for they could not overleap the ruins and attack the houses beyond. So the roar and crackle of the flames ceased, and the great cloud of smoke rolled away, but London, from the tower to Temple Bar, was left a smouldering blackened ruin, and two hundred thousand people were homeless. In memory of the great fire, a monument was raised on the spot where it first broke out, and may still be seen to this day. So fearful were people at that time about plots, and so bitter was the feeling about religion, that many thought the fire had been caused on purpose by the Roman Catholics. But there was never any real reason for believing this, and now everyone thinks that it happened by accident. About this time the King of France became very greedy, and wanted more land and power than he had a right to possess. To prevent him succeeding in his plans to get these, three other countries in Europe joined together, forming what was called the Triple Alliance. The three countries were Britain, Holland, and Sweden. Triple means three, and alliance means to join together, and the Triple Alliance was called so because three countries joined together. As you know, the French and English were old enemies and this alliance pleased the English, so that Charles was forced to join it, although he really did not care whether the French king was powerful or not. Charles thought most of all about his own pleasure. He spent a great deal of money, and he could not always make the commons give him more when he wanted it. Now he thought of a new way of getting money. He wrote secret letters to the king of France, offering to break with the Triple Alliance and to help him to fight against the Dutch. This he said he would do if the King of France would promise to give him a large sum of money every year. The King of France promised, and so Charles disgraced himself and his country, not only by breaking his word, but by becoming the servant of the King of France. Openly he pretended to be a Protestant, and the friend of Protestants. Secretly he was a Roman Catholic, and the friend of Roman Catholics. For a time Charles kept up the pretense of the Triple Alliance, and by telling the Parliament that he must have more sailors, in order to keep a check upon the French king, he got a large sum of money from them. He got still more money in other wicked ways, and then, to the anger of the people, he made war on the Dutch. But if France was greedy and Britain false, Holland was strong and stubborn. Bravely she fought under her great leader, William Prince of Orange. In two years Charles came to the end of his money, and he was forced to sign a peace called the Peace of Westminster, and leave France to fight alone. But he still continued to receive money from the French king. Charles was called the Merry Monarch because he was gay and laughter, loving. The people were glad at first to have so gay a king, for they were tired of the stern ways of Cromwell and the Puritan. But they soon found out that Charles was selfish and wicked, as well as gay, and his reign proved a very unhappy one for Britain. There was constant discontent, there were constant plots. The king plotted, Parliament plotted, Protestants plotted, and Catholics plotted, and Catholics plotted. But out of all the misery and discontent and injustice of these years, one good thing at least grew. This good thing was the passing of the Habeas Corpus Act. 
it was indeed no new act. It was as old as the great charter of King John, but like much in that great charter it had been set aside by king after king. By this act no person could be put into prison, and left there as long as the king pleased, or until he was forgotten by all his friends. It commanded that every person should be brought to trial, and either punished or set free. Habeas corpus is Latin for have his body, and means that the body of the prisoner must be brought into court at a certain time to be tried, instead of being left in prison for a long, long time, or perhaps sent into slavery and exile without any trial or any chance of proving himself innocent. This act is at least one good thing to remember of the reign of Charles the Second, who died in 1685 A.D. Having reigned for twenty-five years, he died as he had lived, careless, witty, laughter, loving. He was clever, and it is said that he never said a foolish thing, and never did a wise one. He was lazy, selfish, and deceitful, a bad man and a bad king. Yet Charles found both men and women to love him during his life and to sorrow for him at his death, because he was clever, good-tempered, and had pleasant manners. Chapter 83 James the Second of England and the Seventh of Scotland The Fiery Cross When Charles the Second died, he left no sons who might succeed him. So his brother James, Duke of York, came to the throne. James was a Roman Catholic, during the reign of Charles the Second, an act had been passed forbidding Roman Catholics to hold any public office. Yet, in spite of this law, James was made king. James was made king. James promised that he would not hurt the Protestant churches. He allowed a bishop of the Church of England to crown him, but part of the coronation service was missed. That part at which the king used to receive a Bible and be told to read, and be told to read, and believe it. The new king's cruel character soon began to show itself. By his orders, and in the name of religion, Claverhouse continued to murder and torture the Scots, in most terrible ways, because they refused again to accept the teaching of the English church. More wicked still, in England a man called Chief Justice Jeffreys, by his cruelties made for himself a name which has never been forgotten. He was a monster, an ogre more fierce and terrible than in any fairy tale. But James was not allowed to take possession of the kingdom without a struggle. In Holland, numbers of Protestants who had been driven out of Britain in the reign of Charles the Second were gathered together. They felt that now was the time to return and fight, for they knew that many of their fellow countrymen must hate a Catholic king. One of these exiled Protestants, a brave Scotchman called the Earl of Argyle, agreed to raise an army in Scotland, and an English noble called the Duke of Monmouth agreed to raise one in England. Monmouth thought that he had a better right to the throne than James, and with the help of Argyle, he hoped to be able to drive James from the throne and become king himself. The English people knew and loved Monmouth, and indeed during the life of Charles there had been a plot to set him upon the throne. When everything was arranged, the Earl of Argyle sailed from Holland with his little band of followers and landed in Scotland. He was one of the most powerful of the Scottish nobles although when he had fled from the country in the reign of Charles, the king had taken his land and money from him, he knew that he could trust to his clan to rise and follow him as soon as he returned. In those days there were no telegraphs and no postmen. There were even few roads among the wild highlands of Scotland and few people could read. So when a chief had need of his men, he gathered them by means of a sign which all could understand. This sign was the fiery cross. A rough cross was made from the wood of a yew tree. The ends of this cross were set alight, 
and afterwards the flames were put out by being dipped in the blood of a goat. The chief, with his own hands, then solemnly gave the cross to a swift runner. This man took it and ran as swiftly as he could to the next village. When the men of this village saw the fiery cross, they said, Our chief has need of us. And they at once prepared for battle, while the fiery cross was put into the hands of another swift runner, who carried it over hill and glen to the next village. On and on it went through all the countryside, the men in each village and farmhouse understanding what was needed of them, and, without a word, gathering to their chief. So it was that the clan Campbell gathered round their chieftain McCollum more, as they loved to call Argyle. But although the Earl's men were loyal to him, those who had come from Holland with him to serve as his captains would not agree and would not obey. Their foolish jealousy of their leader was so great that his army became disheartened and was scattered almost before there had been any real fighting. The Earl was once more forced to flee, dressed as a peasant, and followed by only one faithful friend he tried to escape. But as they were crossing a little river, they were seized by some of the king's soldiers. The earl, to save himself, sprang into the water, but the soldiers followed him. He was armed only with pistols, and in his spring into the water the powder had been wet, and they would not fire. He was struck to the ground and taken prisoner. When Argyle saw that it was useless to struggle any more, he called out, I am the Earl of Argyle. He knew what a great name his was, and he hoped that even the king's soldiers would tremble before it and let him go. But his name could not save him, and he was led a prisoner to Edinburgh. There the judges tried in vain to make him tell who were with him in the rebellion. He would not tell, and he was condemned to death. Bravely and calmly he met his fate. One of the last things he did was to write to his wife, Dear heart, forgive me all my faults, and now comfort thyself in him in whom only true comfort is to be found. The Lord be with thee, bless and comfort thee, my dearest. You, on his grave, were carved some lines which he himself wrote the day before he died. Although Argyle had refused to give the names of the other leaders of the other leaders of the rebellion, many were seized and beheaded. To one of them James said, You had better be frank with me. You know it is in my power to pardon you. It may be in your power, sire, replied the man, but it is not in your nature. The man was right. James never forgave. Chapter 84 James the Second of England and the seventh of Scotland. The Story of King Monmouth. A few days after Argyle reached Scotland, the Duke of Monmouth sailed from Holland and landed in England. He was received with great joy. The common people flocked to his standard, many of them armed only with scythes and pruning, hooks fastened to poles. Nine hundred young men marched before him, Twenty beautiful girls gave him a Bible splendidly bound and a banner which they had themselves embroidered. The roads, wherever he went, were lined with cheering crowds. A Monmouth, a Monmouth, the Protestant religion. The Duke's followers begged him to take the title of king. So on 20th June, 1685 A.D., the same day on which Argyle was led captive through Edinburgh, Monmouth was proclaimed king at Taunton, a little town in the south of England. But, like the real king, he was named James So, instead of calling him King James. His followers called him King Monmouth. King Monmouth did not enjoy his title long. In the dark of the early morning of the 6th July, a battle was fought between King James's men and the followers of Monmouth on the plain of Sedgemoor. Monmouth fought bravely, but when he saw that his men were being defeated, he turned and fled away, leaving them leaderless and hopeless. 
This was the last real battle ever fought on English ground. Monmouth tried to escape in disguise. He changed clothes with a poor shepherd, but the country was so full of the king's soldiers that he found it impossible to get away. For several days he lived in the fields, hiding in ditches and having nothing to eat but raw peas and beans. At last, miserable and ragged, half-starving from cold and hunger, he was discovered by the soldiers and taken prisoner to London. Bound with a cord of silk, he was led before King James, and falling upon his knees, he begged for mercy and forgiveness. But James never forgave. Monmouth, like so many other men, good and bad, was beheaded. The anger and vengeance of the king did not end with the death of Monmouth. His soldiers, under a dreadful man called Kirke, tortured and murdered, in a terrible manner, the poor rebels who escaped from Sedgemoor. Moore. Judge Jeffreys followed next, and so many people did he kill. Such terrible things did he do, that his journey through the country was forever after called the bloody assize. Assize means court of justice. At certain times in England, judges make what is called a circuit or journey through the country, when they hear what wrong things people have done, and when they judge and punish. But on this dreadful journey, Judge Jeffreys did not do justice. He did wrong and murder, and King James praised and rewarded him for it. Chapter 85 James the Second of England and the Seventh of Scotland The Story of the Seven Bishops Having put down two rebellions, James made up his mind to turn Britain into a Roman Catholic country once more. It was against the law for a Roman Catholic to hold any public office, but in spite of that, James began to turn away Protestants from many posts, and to put Roman Catholics in their places. The people grew more and more angry, but still James took his own way, growing bolder and bolder and bolder. At last he issued what was called the Declaration of Indulgence. In this declaration he said that all the laws against the Roman Catholics and against all others who did not belong to the Church of England, and who were called dissenters, were done away with. James hated the dissenters, that is the Puritans and Presbyterians. But he thought that if he made them free, they would side with him and help him to free the Romish Church also. But they did not do so. They knew that James was breaking the laws of the land in issuing this declaration and they would not accept freedom in an unlawful manner. The king ordered the declaration to be read in all London churches on Sundays, 20th and 27th May, and in all country churches on Sundays, 3rd and 10th of June. But nearly every clergyman in London and in the country refused to obey. After a great deal of talking and consulting, seven bishops wrote out a paper which they all signed. In this paper, the bishops told the king that they could not obey him, not because they wished people who thought differently from themselves to be cruelly and unkindly treated, but because the laws against these people had been made by Parliament. They had been passed by king, lords, and commons, and could only be recalled by the consent of king, lords, and commons. The king alone, they reminded him, had no power to recall a law, and, in ordering the clergy to read the Declaration of Indulgence in the churches, the king was ordering them to break the law. This they refused to do. By the time that this letter was written and signed, it was late on Friday evening. There was no time to be lost, and the bishops took it at once to the king. He received them kindly, but when he read the letter his face grew dark and angry. This is rebellion, he said. Sire, said the bishops, we are not rebels. We are true to your majesty. We wish to keep the laws of the land. I tell you it is rebellion, repeated James. 
Then one of the bishops, who was called Trelawney, fell upon his knees. Sire, he cried, do not say so hard a thing to us. No Trelawney can be a rebel. Remember that my family has fought for the crown. Remember how we served your majesty against Monmouth. We are ready to die at your majesty's feet, cried another. We helped to put down one rebellion. Why should we raise another? This is rebellion, this is rebellion. I will be obeyed, replied the king, growing more and more angry. I will keep this paper. I will remember you who have signed it. You are rebels. Go. But that that very night copies of the letter which they had written to the king were printed and sold to thousands of joyful people, who in reading it knew that seven brave men were fighting for their freedom. On Sunday morning the excitement was great. People crowded to the churches in thousands. Would the clergy read the declaration, or would they not, was the question which everybody asked. It was soon answered. In only four of the hundred London churches was it read. In these four churches, as soon as the first words were heard, the people rose and streamed out, so that when the reading was at an end, the churches were silent and empty. A week passed. The second Sunday came. Again thousands thronged to the churches. Again the declaration was unread. Excitement grew. Another week passed. Would the country churches read the declaration, or would they not? That question, too, was answered. The country clergy, like the London clergy, refused, and the land from end to end seemed to be filled with an outburst of joy. Then the king ordered the seven bishops, who had written the letter, and who had set the brave example, to be sent to the tower. As soon as this became known, the whole river was crowded with boats, and the banks thronged with people eager to see the bishops as they passed on their way to prison. When the bishops appeared, the people fell upon their knees begging for a blessing. All the way from Whitehall to the tower, the air was full of shouts of God bless your lordships. It was like a royal procession, rather than like rebels being led to prison. As the bishops entered the traitor's gate, the guards knelt before them begging too, for a blessing, and in the guardhouse the rough soldiers drank to the health of the brave bishops. All next day, to the anger of the king, great people crowded to visit the bishops, to cheer and comfort them in prison. And when ten of the chief dissenters went to see them, his anger knew no bounds. He called these dissenters before him to scold them, and ask what they meant by visiting their enemies. We are all Protestants, they replied. It is our duty to forget old quarrels, and stand by the men who are fighting for the liberties of the Protestant religion. For a week the bishops were kept in prison while all over the country people wondered anxiously what would happen to them. Bishop Trelawney belonged to Cornwall. The people there loved him very much, and they made a song about him of which the chorus was, And shall Trelawney die? And shall Trelawney die? Then thirty thousand Cornish boys will know the reason why. After being kept in prison for a week, the bishops were brought to court to be tried. The excitement was tremendous. The king and his friends did all they could to have the bishops punished. But it was in vain. The judges and the jury said that the bishops had done no wrong, and they were set free. From street to street the joyful news spread like wildfire. Bells rang, cannon boomed, bonfires blazed, people cheered and wept and sang. Another battle had been fought for freedom, another victory won and all England seemed mad with the joy of it. At night the houses were lit up. In nearly every window a row of seven candles appeared, one candle for each bishop. The streets were filled with rejoicing people, and not until day dawned, and the bells began to ring for morning service, did the weary, happy crowds go to their homes.
Chapter 86 James the Second of England and the Seventh of Scotland William the Deliverer Anyone could see that the people were everywhere ready for rebellion. The king alone would not see it, and went on in his own way. He was angry and sullen, but very obstinate. I will not give way, he said. My father lost his head by giving way, and he resolved to punish the people. But James had gone too far. The people were weary of a popish tyrant, and they made up their minds to have a Protestant king. So they asked William, Prince of Orange, to come to rule over them, the prince against whom Charles the Second had fought in the Dutch Wars. William had some claim to the throne. I will explain how. Charles the First had a daughter called Mary. She married a prince of Orange called William, and their son, also called William, was now Prince of Orange. He was thus the nephew of Charles the Second and of James the Second, and besides this, he had married his cousin, Mary, the eldest daughter of James the Second. Although their father, James, was a Roman Catholic, Mary and her sister, Anne, were both Protestants and except for their little brother, who was, at this time, a tiny baby, Mary was the next heir to the throne of Britain. So when the British saw that James meant to rule as a tyrant, and that there was no hope of any freedom or happiness for them as long as he was king, they sent messages to Holland begging William to come to take the crown. William consented to come, and began to gather his ships and men. And one day a letter reached James telling him what the Prince of Orange was doing. As James read, he turned pale, and the letter dropped from his hand. He had thought that he might ill, treat the people as he liked. Now he discovered his mistake and tried to undo the evil he had done. It was too late. His people had forsaken him. William was ready to sail, but for some days he was prevented because of the wind which blew from the west. At last it changed, and what was known for many years after as the Protestant east wind began to blow. It blew the prince and his great fleet to the shores of Britain. More than six hundred ships swept over the water, led by William in his vessel called the Brill. From the mast, head floated his standard, with the arms of Nassau and of Britain upon it, and in great shining letters the words, I will maintain the liberties of England and the Protestant religion. By night the dark sea glittered for miles with lights. By day the white sails glimmered in the wintry sun. Once before, in our story, a great conqueror called William had sailed to these shores with mighty ships and men. This was no conqueror, but a deliverer. Two men riding horses through a crowd the Deliverer had come. On the 5th of November, 1688, A.D., William landed at Torbay, in Devonshire. There, the stone upon which he first placed his foot is still to be seen, although now it is a town. Then it was a little lonely village, and the prince had to sleep the first night in a tiny thatched cottage, but over it, as proudly as over any castle, fluttered the great banner with its promise, I will maintain the liberties of England and the Protestant religion, through rain and wintry weather, over roads knee-deep in mud. The prince and his army marched northward, worn, wet, and muddy as they were. The people crowded everywhere along the way to cheer them. The prince rode upon a beautiful white horse. A white feather was in his hat, and armour glittered upon his breast. His face was grave and stern, his eyes keen and watchful. He looked a soldier and a king. As he rode along an old woman pushed her way through the crowd and afraid neither of the prancing horses nor the drawn swords of the soldiers darted to the side of the prince. She seized his hand and looking up into his face with eyes full of tears cried, I am happy now. I am happy now, I am happy now. And the grave and stern William smiled gently as he looked down upon her. The Deliverer had come. 
James the Second, his queen, and their little boy fled to France. No one wanted James. No one wanted James. No one regretted him. To go to France was the best thing he could do, and the king there received him kindly and treated him as an honoured guest. At Westminster a parliament was called, which arranged that William and Mary should be king and queen together. For although Mary had the better right to the throne, she did not wish to reign without her husband, nor did he wish to accept a lower rank than that of his wife. So ended the glorious revolution. It had been brought about with hardly any fighting at all, and the war between the King and Parliament was at an end, for William and Mary received the throne by the will of Parliament. Chapter 87 William the Third and Mary the Second. The story of brave Londonderry. Although most of the people received William and Mary joyfully, some, chiefly in Ireland and Scotland, still looked upon James as the rightful king. In Ireland, especially there were many Roman Catholics who would not acknowledge a Protestant king. The king of France hated William so he helped James with money and ships, which enabled him to set out for Ireland to win his kingdom again. James landed at a town called Kinsall, and the Irish people welcomed him with great joy. But he felt disheartened almost at once, for there had already been much fighting, and the country through which he had to pass was desolate and deserted and at times he and his men could find hardly enough food to keep them from starving. Most of the Protestants had fled from the land, or had shut themselves up in the two towns of Enniskillen and Londonderry. The soldiers of James besieged both these towns, but it was round Londonderry that the greatest fight took place. Londonderry is on a river called the Foyle, and the enemy not only surrounded the town on the land side, but they built a bar across the river so that no ships could come to the town with food or help. The walls were weak and the cannon few, and the Irish thought that the town could not hold out for long. The governor, too, was a cowardly man, and did his best to dishearten the people until it was suspected that he was a traitor. Indeed, he would have given in, but a brave old clergyman called Walker marched into his pulpit one morning with a sword in one hand and a Bible in the other, and preached such a rousing sermon that the people took heart and never lost it again through all the long weeks of hunger and suffering which they had to endure. It was a dreadful time. The people had hardly anything to eat, but they held bravely on hoping against hope that help would come to them from England. But day after day passed, and no help came. Rats, mice, dogs, and horses, all were eaten. Only tallow and skins remained. Still they held on. The soldiers were so weak, at last from want of food, that they could hardly stand, far less fight. They resolved to hold out for two days longer. Then the end must come. But just as the sun was setting on the 28th of July, the day before they were going to give in, the eager watchers on the walls saw the gleam of sails far down the river. Help! Help at last! How their hearts beat! How they shouted with all the little strength they had, as nearer and nearer sailed the ships. There were three of them. On they came, with all sail set, but how could they pass the dreadful bar which lay across the river? On they came. One ship, called the Mountjoy, took the lead, and sailing with all its force, it crashed against the boom, as the bar was called. With a tremendous noise, the boom shivered and cracked, but the Mountjoy was not strong enough to break it through. Shock was so fierce that the ship was thrown backward and stuck in the mud, for the river was shallow. A groan rose from the people on the walls, and their hearts grew sick with disappointment and fear. 
while the Irish soldiers on the bank cheered with triumph. But as the Mount Joy was thrown back, the second ship followed and dashed at the spot which the Mount Joy had hit. The boom, which was already cracked, gave way, and, amid the noise of joyful cheers and of tearing, splintering wood, she sailed gaily over. Londonderry was saved. That same night, eager hands unloaded the ships, and, for the first time for three months, the people had enough to eat. A day or two later the army of James burned the tents and cabins in which they had lived while besieging the town, and went away. But the struggle was not over. It lasted until the following year when William himself came to Ireland. Then there was a great battle between the soldiers of James and the soldiers of William. It was called the Battle of the Boyne because it was fought near a river of that name. James was beaten and fled again to France, and William, with the crown upon his head, entered Dublin, the acknowledged King of Ireland. Chapter 88 William the Third and Mary the Second The Story of a Sad Day in a Highland Glen the friends of James were called Jacobites, from Jacobites, which is Latin for James the Jacobus, which is Latin for James. There were many Jacobites in the north of Scotland. They rose under Claverhouse, the man who had treated the Covenanters so badly, and a battle was fought at Killiecrankie Pass. The Jacobites won the day, but their leader was killed, so, although many of the clans continued to be discontented, they were without a leader, and could do little. The discontent and rebellion went on for a year or two, and at last William determined to put an end to it. He proclaimed that he would forgive all those who had rebelled if they would take an oath before 1st January 1692 A.D., acknowledging him as king and promising to live quietly and peacefully under his rule. Those who did not take the oath would be punished. All the Highland chieftains, except the chief of the Macdonalds of Glencoe, took the oath. This chief was very unwilling to own William as king, and he could not bring himself to do so until the very last day. Then he started off from his lonely glen and went to the nearest town, where he expected to find one of the king's officers to whom he could swear the oath but to his dismay he found that he had come to the wrong town, and that there was no one there who could receive his oath. He started off again, as quickly as he could, to go to the right town. But it was deep winter, and travelling was very slow in those days, and he was six days late when he arrived. However, his oath was accepted, and he went home feeling safe and happy. But a man called the Master of Stair, who was governing Scotland for William and Mary, hated all Highlanders, and the Campbells, another clan, hated the Macdonalds. So the Campbells and the Master of Stair decided that, as the chief had been a few days late in swearing to obey William, they had a good excuse for killing all the Macdonalds. William was not told that MacDonald had sworn. He was made to believe that he had not done so, and that the whole clan was a set of robbers, and he signed an order for them to be destroyed. Although it is said that William did not know what he was doing when he signed this order, he ought to have known, and the massacre of Glencoe, as it is called, is the darkest spot on his reign. The master of Stair had the king's order, but he did not do his work openly. He sent Campbell and his men to live in Glencoe for nearly a fortnight, so that MacDonald should suspect nothing. The old chief received the men kindly, and treated as his guests those who were ready to betray and murder him. At five o'clock, one dark winter's morning, the Campbells crept silently out of the houses, and along the snow-covered paths to the scattered cottages. A few minutes later the glen was awake with the sounds of shots and screams. Campbell and his soldiers were at their work. Without mercy, men were killed almost in their sleep. 
Those who were able fled through the darkness and the snow with their wives and children, many of them only to die of cold and hunger among the lonely mountains and glens. The soldiers murdered all they could. Then they set fire to the empty houses and marched away, driving before them the cattle and horses belonging to the MacDonalds. And when the sun rose high over the valley of Glencoe, it shone only on blood-stained snow and blackened smoking ruins where peaceful homes had been but a few hours before. For some time Britain and France had been at war, for the French king hated William and would not acknowledge him as king of Britain. William spent a part of every year abroad directing this war and ruling Holland. While he was gone, Mary ruled in England. She governed so well and was so sweet and gentle that the people loved her dearly. They loved her far more than they loved her far more than they loved William, who was so quiet and stern as to seem almost sullen. But in 1694 A.D., Mary became ill of a very dreadful disease called smallpox and died in a few days. William had loved her very much, and he was very sad when she died. I was the happiest man on earth, he said to one of his friends. Now I am the most miserable. She had no fault, none. You knew her well, but you could not know, nobody but myself could know, her goodness. And if the king sorrowed, the whole country sorrowed with him. After the death of Mary, William ruled alone. At last the King of France made peace with William, perhaps because he was tired of fighting, perhaps because he was a little tired of helping James, who was really very dull and stupid. By this peace the French King consented to acknowledge William as the rightful King of Britain, and to give back the lands he had wrongfully taken from Germany and the other countries he had been fighting against. A few years later James died and Louis Exive. The French king forgot the promise he had made to William. He proclaimed the son of James to be king of Britain under the title of James the Third. This made the British very angry, although it really did not matter much. A French king might call James king of Britain, but that could not make him so truly. However, William wanted to go to war with France again for another reason and this act of the French king decided the people to do so. This other reason was that the king of Spain had died, and Louis wanted to make his own grandson king of Spain, so that France and Spain, so that France and Spain should in time come to be one kingdom. But some of the kings in Europe thought that it would be most dangerous to allow this. As then the king of France might become too powerful, and want more than ever to take lands which did not belong to him. So William and the other kings of Europe formed what was called the Grand Alliance, and the war which now began was called the War of the Spanish Succession, because the quarrel was about who should succeed to the throne of Spain. But before war was declared, William died. He had always been rather ill, although in spite of that, he had both thought and worked hard, and for some time now he had been very unwell. One day when he was out riding, he was thrown from his horse and broke his collar. This might not have hurt a strong man, but William was not strong, and a few days later, 8th March, 1702 A.D., he died. William was a great and brave man. He did much for Britain. Yet he was never loved by the people. They felt that he was a Dutchman, and that he cared more for Holland than for his kingdom of Britain, and that made it difficult for them to love him. Chapter 89 Anne, How the Union Jack Was Made William and Mary had no children, so Mary's sister, Anne, the younger daughter of James the Second, succeeded to the throne. From the very beginning of her reign, Britain was at war with France. And indeed, not only Britain, but all Europe was fighting on one side or the other. The British troops 
were led by a famous soldier called Marlborough. He won many battles, the chief of which were called Blenheim and Ramillies. This war of the Spanish succession went on for more than ten years, till all Europe was weary of fighting, and many places where there had been houses and gardens and green fields were nothing but deserted wildernesses. At last a peace was made called the Peace of Utrecht. By this treaty Louis acknowledged Anne as the rightful Queen of Britain, and also promised to send James the Pretender as the son of James the Seventh, was called out of his kingdom, and not to help him any more. Once before, Louis had promised something very like this to William, and he did not keep his promise. There were other agreements in this treaty, one of them being that Britain should keep the strong fortress of Gibraltar in Spain, which has belonged to the British ever since. Marlborough was a famous soldier, but he was also a great statesman, and indeed he and his wife, the Duchess of Marlborough, ruled the Queen for many years. He was brave and clever, but he was greedy and not quite honest. He made many enemies who succeeded at last in having him disgraced, and both he and his wife were sent away from court. The Duchess had a very bad temper, and she was so angry when she had to leave court that she smashed all the furniture in her rooms and threw the Queen's keys at the Duke's head when he was sent to ask for them. It was no wonder that the Queen, who was gentle and kind, had been afraid of the Duchess and had been ruled by her. Other clever men succeeded Marlborough, and another clever woman succeeded the Duchess, for Queen Anne was not a strong-minded woman, and she allowed herself to be ruled and led by favourites and statesmen. Like Queen Elizabeth, she had many great men around her, and although they thought more perhaps of making themselves famous and powerful than of what was best for the country, Still the country prospered. The greatest thing that happened in the reign of Anne was the union of the parliaments of England and Scotland. Since 1603 A.D., when James VI of Scotland became King of England, there had been very little real union between the two countries. For union means oneness, and although there had been only one king, there had been two parliaments, one in England, and one in Scotland, each making laws. Sometimes the Scottish Parliament would make laws which the English Parliament thought were dangerous. Sometimes the English Parliament would make laws which the Scottish Parliament did not like. It almost seemed at times as if the union of the crowns had done no good at all, and the two countries were ready to quarrel and separate. Wise men saw that there could be no real union until there was only one Parliament, until English and Scots met and discussed the laws together. Cromwell indeed had called English, Scottish, and Irish members to his Parliament. But it had been for so short a time, and in such troubled days, that people had almost forgotten about it. Even now it was not an easy thing to do but at last all difficulties were smoothed away. It was agreed, among other things, that each country should keep its own law courts and its own religion, but that they should have the same king, the same parliament, the same money, and the same flag, and that the country should be called Great Britain. The English flag was a red St. George's cross on a white ground. The Scottish flag was a white St. Andrew's cross on a blue ground. So to make one flag, the two crosses were placed one on the top of the other, and they made something very like the Union Jack. But not quite. The Union Jack was not complete until the Irish cross of St. Patrick, which is the same as a St. Andrew's cross, but was red on a white ground, was added to the other two. Then the flag we love was complete. The reason we call our flag the Union Jack is because James the Sixth used to sign his name in French, Jacques, which sounds very like Jack. His two flags, the English and the Scottish, 
came to be called the Jacks, and when the two were made one, the flag was called the Union Jack. When the Queen gave her consent to the Act of Union, as it was named, she called both Lords and Commons together, and made a speech to them. I desire and expect from all my subjects of both nations that from henceforth they act with all possible respect and kindness to one another, that so it may appear to all the world they have hearts disposed to become one people. This will give me great pleasure. Then the last English Parliament rose, and on 23rd October 1707 A.D. the first British Parliament met. It was a great state ceremony. Each Scottish lord was led to his place by two English lords. The Queen, in her royal robes, made a speech from the throne in which she heartily welcomed the new members. And ever since that day, in spite of difficulties and troubles, England and Scotland have really been one country. Queen Anne died on 1st August 1714 A.D. She was not a great queen, yet her reign will always be remembered as great. Like Elizabeth, she had clever men as her soldiers and advisers. And, as in the time of Elizabeth too, there were many writers whose books are still remembered and read. Four flags. St. George's Cross, St. Andrew's Cross, St. Patrick's Cross, and Union Flag of England, Scotland. Around the Union Jack Flag. Chapter 90. George I. The story of the Earl of Mar's hunting party. Queen Anne was the last of the Stuarts, and her husband and all her children died before she did. She had no near relatives except her brother, who was called the Pretender. He was a Roman Catholic and therefore could not succeed to the throne. For, in the time of William and Mary, a law had been mayor, a law had been made that no Roman Catholic should ever again wear the crown. The people had foreseen that after Queen Anne died, there might be quarrels as to who should reign next. So that, too, had been settled by law in the time of William and Mary. James I of England had a daughter called Elizabeth, who married the King of Bohemia, and her grandson George Elector, or King of Hanover, was the nearest Protestant heir to the throne. He was the great-grandson of James the Sixth. So, as soon as Queen Anne died, George was proclaimed king in England, Scotland, and Ireland, without any fighting or quarrelling. But although his grandmother had been British, George himself was as German as could be, and he could not even speak a word of English. He was fifty-five years old when he came to the throne, and was too old ever to learn the English language or English ways and manners. The Jacobites had never lost hope of having once more a Stuart king. Now they felt was the time to try. The new king was a German, and the people, they thought, would surely rather have a man of their own country than an old German to reign over them. The Earl of Mar, making believe that he was going to have a great hunting party, asked a number of the Highland lords to his house. They came, but soon it was seen that it was not deer they meant to hunt, and a large army gathered round Lord Mar and the standard of James the Eighth, which was the title the Pretender took. In their caps they wore his badge of a white cockade or rosette. The Pretender's standard was of blue silk, having on one side the arms of Scotland worked in gold, and on the other the Scottish thistle, with the motto, Nemo me impune lacessit, which means, those who touch me will suffer for it. It had also two streamers of white ribbon, on one of which were the words, For our wronged king and oppressed country, and on the other, for our lives and liberties. There was great rejoicing when the standard was unfurled, but scarcely had it been done when the golden ball fell from the top of the staff. That made the Highlanders very sad. 
for they were superstitious and thought it meant bad luck. But when our standard was set up so fierce the wind did blow, Willie, the golden knock down from the top onto the ground did far, Willie. Then second-sighted Sandy said, We'll day nay good at a uh, Willie, while pipers played fray right to left fi, furich wigs a were Willie. In the north of England, Lord Derwentwater and another gentleman gathered an army of Jacobites and proclaimed James King. But neither Lord Mar nor Lord Derwentwater were good generals. Having got their soldiers together, they did not seem to know what to do with them. So when King George's army met Lord Derwentwater's army, the Jacobites yielded almost without a struggle. In Scotland, the Jacobites under Lord Mar and the King's soldiers under the Duke of Argyle met at a place called Sheriff Moor near Dumblain. Lord Mar called a council of war and asked his captains, Shall we fight, or shall we go back? And all the captains called out, Fight, fight. Lord Mar agreed, and they all went to their places. No sooner did the Highlanders know they were to fight than a great cheer went through the army, every man tossing his cap in the air, every Scotchman there. Every Scotchman there was glad at the opportunity of fighting his old enemies, the English, with broadswords drawn, colours flying, and bagpipes playing. They rushed to battle, but brave and fierce, though the Highlanders were, they lacked a clever leader. So it happened that one half of Mar's soldiers beat one half of Argyle's, but the other half of Argyle's beat the other half of Mar's, so each side claimed the victory. There some say that we won, some say that they won, some say that Nane won at our man, but one thing I'm sure, that at Sheriff Moore a battle there was, which I saw man, and we ran, and they ran, and they ran, and we ran, and we ran, and we ran, and they ran, and they ran, and they ran, and we ran, and they ran, said one Jacobite general. We ought to fight Argyle once a week until we make it one. But Ma did nothing, and James, who had promised to come from France, did not arrive. So disappointed and discontented, many of the chieftains and their followers went home again. But at last James landed. He was greeted with great joy, and rode into Dundee with three hundred gentlemen behind him. Now, thought the Jacobites, we have a king. Now we will be led to battle and victory. But they were again disappointed. James was no soldier. He was pale, grave, and quiet. He never smiled, and he hardly ever spoke. The men soon began to despise him, and to ask if he could fight or even speak. Day after day passed, and nothing happened. "'What did you call us to arms for?' asked the angry Highlanders. Was it to run away? What did the king come for? Was it to see his people butchered by hangmen, and not strike one blow for their lives? Let us die like men, and not like dogs. If our king is willing to die like a king, there are ten thousand gentlemen who are not afraid to die with him. But it was of no use. Nothing was done. The pretender, Taking the Earl of Mar with him, slunk back to France, a beaten man for want of courage to strike a blow, and, sad and angry, the Jacobite army melted away. Some of the leaders escaped to foreign lands, others were taken prisoner to the tower, and afterwards beheaded. Among those was Lord Derwentwater. This rebellion is known as the Fifteen because it took place in 1715 A.E. O oh, far frae my hame full soon will I be. It's far, far frae hame, in a strange country where I'll tarry a while, return, and with you be, and bring many jolly boys to our ain country. I wish you all success till I again you see. May the lusty Highland and lads fight on, and never fl When the king sets foot aground and returns from the sea, then you'll welcome him hame to his ain country. God bless our royal king, from danger keep him free, 
when he conquers all the foes that oppose his majesty, God bless the Duke of Mar and all his cavalry, who first began the war for our king and our country. Let the traitor king make haste and out of England flee, with all his spurious race, come far beyond the sea. Then we will crown our royal king with mirth and jollity, and end our days in peace in our ain country. Chapter 91. George the Second. The Story of Bonnie Prince Charlie. George the First died in 1727 A.D., and was succeeded by his son George the Second. Like his father, he was very German. But he could speak a little English. He had a very clever wife called Queen Caroline, and she helped him to rule. He had also a very clever prime minister called Walpole. Walpole had begun to be powerful under George I, and although George II did not like him, he still remained in power. He was the first peace minister Britain ever had. Instead of urging the king and people to fight, he tried in every way he could to keep peace. He saw that the best thing for the country was to be at peace. He saw that it was best for the people to have time to sow and reap, to build ships, to make goods, and to trade with other countries, and that they could neither have time nor money to do this if they were always fighting. So he would not fight, and Britain grew prosperous. But the people did not all think as Walpole did. A quarrel with Spain arose, and, try how he might, Walpole could not keep the peace, and war was declared. Strange to say, the people rejoiced at the news. They decorated their houses, lit bonfires, and rang bells as if some great good fortune had befallen the country. They may ring their bells now, said Walpole sadly, but they will soon be wringing their hands. The peace which had lasted twenty years was broken, and Walpole was quite right when he said that the people would soon be wringing their hands, for the war with Spain was a miserable failure and brought much trouble and sorrow upon them. This war was followed by another called the War of the Austrian Succession. The Emperor of Austria died leaving his kingdom to his daughter, Maria Theresa, but some of the kings of Europe thought that they would take her lands from her and make their own kingdoms greater. To prevent this, the British fought for Maria Theresa against France and Spain, and George II and his soldiers defeated the French in a battle called Detingen. This is the last battle in which a British king led his soldiers himself. People began to see that kings could serve their countries in better ways than by fighting. While this war was going on, the Jacobites tried again to set James Stuart upon the throne. This time it was not James, but his son Charles, who landed in Scotland. He came with only seven followers, and at first the people were afraid and unwilling to follow him. But Charles was very different from his father. He was gallant and brave and handsome. He talked and smiled and won his way to the brave Highland hearts, till he was at the head of fifteen hundred men, all willing and ready to die for their king and prince. Go home, said one old chieftain to him, when he first landed. There is no safety for you here. I have come home, replied Prince Charlie. Charles Stuart, he said to another chief, called Cameron of Lochiel, has come to claim his own and win the crown of his ancestors, or die in the attempt. Lochiel, if he chooses, may stay at home and learn the fate of his prince from the newspapers, replied Lochiel. No, I will share the fate of my prince, and so shall every man over whom I have power. So in a dark highland glen the standard of the prince was raised. It was of red silk, and on it were the proud words, Tandem Triumphans, which means triumphant at last. And as the red silk folds fluttered out on the mountain breeze, it was greeted by the sounds of bagpipes and the shouts of the people. Then raise the banner, raise it high, for Charles will conquer or will die. The clans are leal and true men be, 
and show me who will daunt in thee. Our good King James will soon come home, and traitors have be put to shame. Old Scotland shall again be free. There's nane on earth can daunt a knee. After the raising of his standard, Charles marched south till he reached Edinburgh, his army growing as he went. Lochiel and his followers marched into Edinburgh, and there, at the market cross, amid the cheering of some of the people and the sullen silence of others, James the Eighth was once more proclaimed King of Scotland, a beautiful lady on horseback, with a drawn sword in her hand, gave the white cockade to those who crushed round her, impatient to enter the service of the prince. Later in the day, Charles himself rode into the town, and the people crowded to meet him, cheering and weeping, eager to kiss his hand or touch his clothes, covering even his boots with tears and kisses. The castle of Edinburgh was held by the soldiers of King George, and as the prince reached Holyrood, the old palace of the Stuarts, a cannon from the castle thundered out, and a shot struck the wall of the palace not far from where Charles stood. But he was neither startled nor afraid, and, turning, walked quietly into the palace. That night the prince gave a ball. The old palace, which had stood so long empty and silent, was gay with lights and flowers. The sounds of laughter and music were heard there, perhaps for the first time since the days of the beautiful Mary, Queen of Scots. Lovely ladies and brave men crowed to see and do honour to their bonny Prince Charlie, and they went away happy if they had touched his hand or heard his voice. But there were other things to do besides dancing. The army of King George under Sir John Cope had landed at Dunbar and was marching to Edinburgh. Charles decided to march out to meet him. Early on the morning of the 20th September, the Highlanders rose and made ready for battle. Prince Charlie placed himself at their head, and, drawing his sword, cried, Gentlemen, I have thrown away the scabbard. By that he meant that there was no turning back, and that his sword would never again be sheathed until he conquered or died, and the men, hearing the words, shouted and cheered as they followed him. Next day a battle was fought at Prestonpans, near Edinburgh. Prince Charlie and his men were up so early that they were ready to attack before Sir John Cope and his soldiers were prepared. The Highlanders gave them no time to prepare, but charged so fiercely and quickly, but charged so fiercely and quickly, that in about five minutes the battle was over. The soldiers of King George ran away, and Charles won a complete victory. Sir John ran away too, and was the first to bring the news of his own defeat to Berwick. Corp sent a challenge Frey Dunbar. Charlie, meet me in your door, and I'll learn you the art of war, if you'll meet me in the morning. Hey, Johnny Cope, are you waking yet? And are your drums a beating yet? Oh, haste ye up, for the drums do beat. Oh, fie, Cope, rise up in the morning. When Charlie looked the letter upon, he drew his sword the scabbard from, Come, follow me, my merry men, and we'll meet Johnny Cope in the morning. When Johnny Cope in the morning, when Johnny Cope to Berwick came, they spied at him. In faith, say he, I dinna ken. I left them a uh, this morning. Now, Johnny, troth ye were nay blate to come with the news o' oh, your ain defeat, and leave your men in sick a strait so early in the morning. A few hours after the battle, the Highlanders were back in Edinburgh, marching up and down the streets, playing The King Shall Enjoy His Own Again on the bagpipes. All the Jacobites rejoiced and thought that they had really triumphed at last. Chapter 92 George the Second, The Story of Flora MacDonald To your arms, to your arms, Charlie yet shall be your king, to your arms, all ye lads that are loyal and true, to your arms, to your arms, his valor name can ding, and he's on to the south with jovial crew, for Master Jovial Crew, 
for Master Johnny Cope, being men, in their arms, he put no trust, for he knew it was just that the king should enjoy his own again. To your arms, to your arms, my bonny Highland lads, we winna brook the rule o'er German thing. To your arms, to your arms, to your arms, we are bonnets and your plaids, and hey for Charlie and our ain true king. After the battle of Preston Pans, Charles returned to Edinburgh and remained there for some days gathering men and money. It was a gay time. There were constant balls and parties, and bonny Prince Charlie was loved more and more each day. The bonny prince, who could eat a dry crust, sleep on peas, straw, take his dinner in four minutes, and win a battle in five, was toasted everywhere. At last Charles and his army were ready and marched into England. But although no one resisted him, although he took several towns without a blow being struck, hardly any of the English joined him. The Highlanders grew weary of marching through strange country, and homesick for their mountains, and many of them deserted and went home. By the time Charles reached Derby, the leaders were so disheartened that they persuaded him to turn back to Scotland. Yet the people in London were awaiting his coming in terror, and King George was ready to run away. It is difficult to guess what might have happened had the prince gone on. But he did not. He turned again towards Scotland, and began the long, sad march homeward. The wearied army reached Glasgow at last. Having marched six hundred miles through snow and rain and wintry weather in less than two months, Charles now decided to take Stirling Castle. He met the king's army at Falkirk and defeated them. But after that, instead of trying to take Stirling, as he had intended, he listened to the advice of some of the Highland chiefs and marched northward. As Charles had defeated two generals, King George now sent his own son, the Duke of Cumberland, to command his army. At Culloden, near Inverness, the last Jacobite battle was fought. The royal army was much larger than the Jacobite one, and although the Highlanders fought with all their usual fierce courage, they were utterly defeated. Charles would have been glad to die with his brave followers, but two of his officers seized the bridle of his horse and forced him against his will to leave the field. The battle was turned into a terrible slaughter, for the Duke of Cumberland behaved so cruelly to the beaten rebels that ever after he was called the Butcher. The Stuart cause was lost, and bonny Prince Charlie was a hunted man. The King offered thirty thousand to any one who would take him prisoner. But although the money would have made many a poor Highlander richer than he had ever imagined it possible for any one to be, not one of them tried to earn it. Instead they hid their prince, fed him, clothed him, and worked for him. At last, after months of hardships and adventures, he escaped to France. Many people helped Prince Charles. But it was a beautiful lady called Flora MacDonald who perhaps helped him most. She served him when he was most miserable and in greatest danger. The whole country round was filled with soldiers searching for him. He scarcely dared to leave his hiding place, and was almost dying of hunger. No house was safe for him and he had to hide among the rocks of the seashore, shivering with cold and drenched with rain. With great difficulty and danger to herself, Flora MacDonald reached the place where the prince was hiding, bringing with her a dress for him to wear. The prince put it on, and together they went to the house of a friend, where Flora asked if she and her maid Betty might stay that night. This friend was very fond of Flora, and very glad to see her. She was a Jacobite, and when she was told who Betty was, she made ready her best room for the prince. A little girl belonging to the house came into the hall while Betty was standing there, 
and ran away frightened at the great tall woman. But no one suspected who she was. Disguised as Flora MacDonald's maid, Prince Charlie travelled for many days, escaping dangers in a wonderful way. For the prince made a very funny-looking woman. He took great strides and managed his skirts so badly that, in spite of the danger, his friends could not help laughing. They do call your highness a pretender, said one. All I can say is that you are the worst of your trade the world has ever seen. When there was no need for Flora to go further with the prince, they took a sad farewell of each other. I hope, madam, said he, bending over her hand and kissing it, we shall yet meet at St. James's. By that he meant that he still hoped to be king some day, and welcome her in his palace of St. James's in London. Then he stepped into the boat which was waiting for him, and Flora sat sadly by the shore, watching it as it sailed farther and farther away. Far over yon hills of the heather so green, and down by the corrier that sings to the sea, the bonny young Flora sat sighing her lane, the dew on her plaid and the tear in her ease. She looked at a boat which the breezes had swung, away on the wave like a bird on the main. She sighed and she sang, Farewell to the lad I shall ne'er see again. Farewell to my hero, the gallant and young, farewell to the lad I shall ne'er see again. The target is torn from the arm of the just, the helmet is cleft on the brow of the brave, the claymore for ever in darkness must rust. Red is the sword of the stranger and slave. The hoof of the horse and the foot of the proud have trod o'er the plumes in the bonnet of blue. Why slept the red bolt in the heart of the cloud when tyranny reveled in blood of the true? Farewell, my young hero, the gallant and good. The crown of thy fathers is torn from thy brow. This rebellion is called the Forty-Five because it took place in 1745 A.D. Man in tartan holding woman's hand under a tree, they took a sad farewell of each other. Prince Charlie reached France safely, but the rest of his life was sad. He was a broken, ruined man and he lived a wanderer in many lands. At last he died in Rome on 30th January 1788 A.D., the anniversary of the day on which Charles I had been beheaded. In St. Peter's at Rome there is a monument placed there, it is said, by King George the F Names, in Latin, of James III, Charles III, and Henry IX, kings of England. They were kings who never ruled, and are known in history as the Old Pretender, the Young Pretender, the Young Pretender, and Henry, Cardinal of York, brother of the Young Pretender. Chapter 93. George the Second. The Story of the Black Hole of Calcutta. Besides the Civil War, Britain had other wars to fight. France, England's old enemy, was still the enemy of Britain. Once again there was war between them and this time the fighting was not in France, nor in England, nor on the seas, but in far-off lands. Long ago in the days of Elizabeth, you remember that Englishmen sailed over the seas to the newly discovered country of America and made their home there. You remember how Raleigh claimed Virginia for England, and how later the stern Puritans sailed away in the Mayflower and founded a new Plymouth and a new England over the sea. Little by little these colonies, as such new countries, which are peopled by an old country, are called, grew, towns sprang up, harbours were built, and the colonies became a rich and powerful part of Great Britain. In another country called India, Britain had also possessions, and trade with India had become of great importance, and was carried on chiefly by a company called the East India Company. But France, too, had colonies in India and in America, and the French and the British became so jealous of each other that war broke out in both countries. The French were much stronger in India at this time than the British, and they made up their minds to drive the British away altogether. They might have succeeded too, 
but for the cleverness of a young man called Robert Clive. He was a clerk in the East India Company's office, and not a particularly good clerk either, because the work he had to do was not all the kind of work for which he was fitted. When war broke out, Robert Clive gave up being a clerk and became a soldier, and he soon showed that he was a clever one. Some of the native Indians fought for the French and some for the British, but Clive and his sepoys, as the native soldiers were called, won, and the French governor was obliged to leave the country. A few years later, one of the native princes who had fought for the French attacked the British who were living in Calcutta. He killed many of them, destroyed their houses and factories, and those who were left alive he shut up in a horrible prison called the Black Hole. There were 146 prisoners, and the Black Hole was so small that there was hardly room in it for them to stand. The windows were so tiny that hardly any air could come through them. When the prisoners were told that they were all to go into this dreadful place, they could not believe it. They thought at first that the prince meant it as a jest, but they soon found out that it was no jest but horrible, sinful earnest. In spite of their cries and entreaties, they were all driven in and the door fastened. It was a hot summer night. What little air came through the tiny windows was soon poisoned by being breathed over and over again. People fainted, went mad, died. The cruel Indians held torches to the windows and, looking in, laughed at the terrible sufferings of the poor prisoners, who cried for mercy as they beat upon the door, trying vainly in their agony to break it down. In the morning only twenty-three came out from the dreadful hole, alive. When Clive heard of this horrible deed, he marched against the native prince and utterly defeated him in a battle called Plassey. He drove him from his throne and placed another prince who was friendly to the British upon it. He drove the French from their fortress there, and ever since then the power of Britain has grown and grown in India, until today our king, the king of Great Britain and Ireland, is also the emperor of India. Chapter 94 George II the story of how Canada was won. While these things were happening in India, the French and British were fighting in America also. The French colonies there were called Canada and Louisiana. Canada lay north of the British colonies, beyond the St. Lawrence River. Louisiana lay west of the British colonies, beyond the Mississippi River. If you look at the map, you will see that in this way, the British colonies were quite shut in by the sea, and by the French on all sides. This did not please the British. They wanted to be able to enlarge their colonies, and to stretch out to the west, to the great forests and unknown land beyond Louisiana. The French, on the other hand, hoped to drive the British away from America altogether and they built forts along the rivers and lakes to keep them as far as possible from the west. There were many quarrels which grew more and more bitter, till at last war broke out. At first the British were not successful. But just as Walpole had been a great peace minister, Sir William Pitt, who was now in power, was a great war minister. He was quick to see what needed to be done, and just as quick in choosing the best men to do it. He did not ask whether a man was rich or powerful, or whether he had great relations. He asked, Is this the best man I can find to do this piece of work? So it came about that at this time the British all over the world were successful. Among the men whom Pitt sent to fight in America was a young man called James Wolfe. Wolfe was sent from England with eight thousand soldiers, and was told that he must take Quebec, the capital of Canada. He reached Canada and sailed up the St. Lawrence, greatly to the surprise of the French, for it was a very difficult passage, full of rocks and banks of sand. Yet Wolfe took his great war, ships where the French would have feared to venture with their little trading vessels. He anchored opposite Quebec, and landed his soldiers on the island of Orleans. Quebec was a very strong town. 
It was built upon rocks high above the river, and was defended by the great French general, Montcalm. For a long time, Wolfe tried in vain to take the town. Montcalm was too clever and watchful. Day by day passed, and Wolfe grew ill with care and weariness. Many of his soldiers were killed, and the fresh troops which he expected did not arrive. At last he decided upon a bold and daring plan. There was one place which the French did not guard very strongly, because they thought it was quite impossible for the British to attack them there. This was a steep cliff, but Wolfe noticed that there was a narrow pathway up this cliff, and he decided to take his soldiers by that path. He felt so doubtful of success, however, that he wrote a sad letter home before he made the attempt. I have done little for my country, he said. I have little hope of doing anything. But I have done my best. One dark night the British soldiers were rowed over the river. No one spoke. Everyone moved as quietly as possible. The oars even were muffled, so that the sound of rowing might not be heard by the French. Only Wolf, as his boat went silently down the river, repeated a poem to his officers in a low voice. The poem was called An Elegy in a Country Churchyard, and it had been written a few years before by an English poet called Gray. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lee, the ploughman homeward plods his weary way, and leaves the world to darkness and to me, now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight, and all the air a solemn stillness holds, save where the beetle wheels his, droning flight, and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. That is how the poem begins. It is a long poem, and very beautiful, and when Wolfe had finished repeating it, he turned to his officers and said, Now, gentlemen, I would rather be the author of that poem than take Quebec. The boat reached the Quebec side of the river, and Wolfe was among the first to spring ashore. Silently, quickly, with beating hearts and held breath, the men followed. Then, as silently and quickly, the boats put off again, for there had been room in them only for half the soldiers, and they returned to bring the rest. The climb up the narrow pathway began. It was so narrow in places that only one could go at a time. But every man was full of courage and hope. They struggled up as best they could, clinging on to bushes, rocks, roots of trees, anything that would give them the least grip for hand, or rest for foot. A regiment of Highlanders were among the first to lead the way, for they were used to scrambling and climbing among the rocks of their homeland. Nearer and nearer to the top they came, unseen and unheard by the French sentinels above. But at last the rustling among the bushes and leaves down the slope caught their ear. What was that? they asked, and fired at random down into the darkness. But it was too late. The first soldiers had reached the height. Others followed after them, and, terrified at the sudden appearance of men where they had thought no men could be, the French sentinels ran away, as soon as the British reached the top, they fell into fighting order, and when day broke, the sun shone on their red coats as they stood drawn up in line upon the heights of Abraham, as the place was called. At first the French leader, Montcalm, could hardly believe that he saw a right. Then he said quietly, They ought not to be. We must fight them, and I am going to crush them. A fierce battle followed. Wolf was struck in the wrist, but he tied his handkerchief round it and went on fighting and giving orders, as if nothing had happened. A second time he was hit. Still he went on. A third shot struck him in the breast. Then he sank to the ground with a groan. Wolf was quickly carried out of the fight, but nothing could be done for him. He was dying. His officers stood sadly round him, when suddenly one of them cried, See, they run, they run, who run? asked Wolf, opening his eyes and trying to raise himself. The enemy, sir, replied the officer, 
They are running everywhere. Thank God, said Wolf, I die happy. Then he fell back and never spoke again. The brave French leader Montcalm was also killed in this battle. So much the better, he said, when he was told that he was dying. I shall not live to see Quebec surrender. Quebec did surrender, and Canada was won, and ever since then it has belonged to Britain, and today it is one of the greatest of her colonies. A few days after Wolfe's sad letter reached home, another both sad and joyful followed. It told of the taking of Quebec. It told, too, of the death of the brave young leader. Not once or twice in our fair island story, the path of duty was the way to glory. He that ever following her commands, on with toil of heart and knees and hands, throw the long gorge to the far light as won his path upward, and prevailed, shall find the toppling crags of duty scaled are close upon the shining table. Lands to which our God himself is moon and sun. Such was he, his work is done, but while the races of mankind endure, let his great example stand colossal, seen of every land, and keep the soldier firm, the statesman pure, till in all lands and through all humans of duty be the way to glory. Chapter 95 George the Third, The Story of How America Was Lost George the Second died in October 1759 A.D., and was succeeded by his grandson George the Third, whose father, the Prince of Wales, had died some years before. George the Third had been born in England, and seemed more of an Englishman than either George the First or George the Second for that reason, and because he was young and handsome, the people were glad when he came to the throne. But he proved himself to be an unwise king, and it was during his reign that Britain suffered a great loss. The loss of all the American colonies except Canada. The wars which Britain had been fighting all over the world had cost a great deal of money. When Pitt saw a thing needed to be done, he did not stop to ask how much it would cost. He did it, and afterwards the country had to find ways and means of paying. War always costs a great deal and the country had been fighting so much that it was now deeply in debt. The king's ministers, therefore, had to find some new way of raising money. It seemed to them that, as the war in America had been for the benefit of the colonies, the colonists ought to pay some of the cost. This being so, King George decided to tax the Americans. You know what a tax means. If a certain thing costs one shilling a pound, and the government said, We will put a tax of two pence a pound on this thing, then it would cost one shilling and two pence, and the extra two pence would go to government to help to pay the expenses of the country, for it requires money to keep up a country just as much as to keep up a house. You also know that the king could not make the people pay taxes without the consent of Parliament. That was a right for which the people and Parliament had fought over and over again, and which they had won at last. And if Parliament consented to a tax, it was really the people who consented, as the members of Parliament were chosen by the people. Now the people of America sent no members to the British Parliament. When King George tried to make them pay taxes, they at once said, No, that is not just. It is against the laws of Britain. If we are to pay taxes, we must be allowed to send members to Parliament as England and Scotland do. If we are to pay taxes, we must have a share in making the laws and saying how the money is to be spent. This was quite reasonable, but King George was not reasonable. He said no. The Americans were very angry at this, and they made up their minds to do without the things which the king wanted to tax. This was very hard for them, especially as one of the things taxed was tea. You can imagine how difficult it would be to do without tea. While these things were happening, the great Pitt had been ill. When he was well again, and heard what George the Third and his foolish ministers had been doing, he was very angry. He said the Americans were quite right, and he talked so fiercely that all the taxes were taken off again, 
except the one on T. George insisted on keeping that on. He was very angry with both Pitt and the Americans. He called them rebels and Pitt the trumpet of rebellion. But the Americans would not yield even to one tax. There were meetings all over the states, and the young men banded together under the name of the Sons of Liberty. They swore to do anything rather than use taxed tea. At last ships arrived in Boston Harbor laden with tea. The Americans knew that if once that tea got ashore, it would be very difficult to keep the people from buying it. They determined that it should not be landed. While some of the wise people were talking and advising each other as to what should be done, about twenty young men dressed themselves as Red Indians. They painted their faces brown, stuck feathers in their hair, and put on clothes such as Red Indians wore. Red Indians are the natives of America, and, although they have nearly died out now, in those days it was quite common to see them even in the towns. With wild war whoops, these make believe Red Indians ran to the harbor. They sprang on board the tea ships. They seized the chests, opened them with their hatchets, and poured the tea into the water. Chest after chest, chest after chest was burst open, and the tea poured over the ship's side till three hundred and forty-two chests had been emptied and the harbour was black with tea leaves. Many an honest merchant looked sadly on, many a thrifty housewife sighed to see the waste. But no one stopped the work. It was the greatest tea-making that had ever been seen, and for long after it was called the Boston Tea Party. When King George heard about this tea party, he was very angry. To punish the people of Boston, he forbade any ships to go there at all, so that the trade of the town was ruined and the people became quite poor. He sent soldiers to frighten them into obedience, and did many other things in order to punish the rebels. But the Americans would not bear such treatment, and they talked of war. King George seemed to be quite pleased at the idea of fighting the Americans. We will soon bring them to their senses, he said. They will only behave like lions as long as we behave like lambs. I will show them that I mean to be firm, and they will soon be meek enough. But the Americans were not meek at all. They made ready to fight. Soon twenty thousand colonists were in arms, and George Washington, a young soldier, who had already shown his bravery and skill in fighting against the French, was their leader. The war began in the year 1775 A.D., and it was quite as dreadful as a civil war. The colonists looked upon Britain as their mother. Country, they talked of it as home, and now, for want of a little kindly feeling and understanding between them, mother and children were fighting bitterly. As time went on, the Americans became more and more determined not to give in. On the 4th of July, 1776 A.D., they very solemnly made their declaration of independence. We, the representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, solemnly publish and declare that these United States are, and of right, ought to be free and independent state. This means that the Americans felt that they were doing right and not wrong in fighting against the mother country. They felt that they ought to be free, and they declared that they were free and independent. Independent means standing alone, while the war was being carried on in the States. At home Pitt, the great war minister, who was now called Lord Chatham, was struggling for peace. He had worked very hard to make Britain great, and to make the colonies great. Now, he saw that all his work was to be ruined by civil war, and he tried to stop it. You cannot conquer America, he said. They are of our own blood. If I were an American, as I am an Englishman, I would never lay down my arms. Never, never, never. 
but the king and his friends would not listen to Pitt, and the war went on. Then a worse thing happened. France joined America against Britain. Britain, by driving the French out of America, had given the Americans peace. Now Britain's old enemy had joined with her own people against her. That was the worst blow of all. It frightened the Parliament, and some members wanted to acknowledge the freedom of America. Old and ill, although he was when Pitt heard of it, he rose from his bed and once more went to speak in the house. His voice was weak and feeble as he spoke. I am glad, he said, that I am still alive and able to lift up my voice against breaking up the empire. Pitt had wanted to give the Americans what they asked for, but now he wanted to fight with France. France, he felt, had no right in the quarrel. He would not yield to French threats what had been refused to America alone. But Pitt was old and feeble. The excitement of speaking was too much for the great statesman. He fell senseless to the ground and was carried home to die. Then not only France but Spain joined with America, and at last the bitter end came. Britain was obliged to give way, and, in 1782 A.D., after a war which had lasted nearly eight years, the United States were acknowledged to be a free and independent country, and Britain lost all her possessions in North America except Canada. Chapter 96 George III A Story of the Spinning Wheel While Britain was fighting and losing a great colony, Another battle was being fought and won. This was a peaceful battle, the battle of industries and inventions. To invent, really, means to find out, and people were now finding out all kinds of things which made living much more easy and comfortable. The two chief things which were found out about this time were, first, how to spin cotton, wool, and linen by machinery, instead of by hand. Second, how to use steam to make this machinery work, and how to use steam to make this machinery work, and how to make it draw trains along lines and carry ships over the sea. Before spinning, frames were invented. Women used to spin with wheels in their own homes. But that was such slow work that the weavers could not get enough yarn to keep their looms going, and because of that they could not make as much cloth as they might otherwise have done. They grumbled so much about this that clever people began to wonder if it would be possible to spin in some quicker way. Among these clever people was a man called Richard Arkwright. Richard Arkwright's father and mother were very poor, and they had a great many children, thirteen in all, and of those thirteen Richard was the youngest. As Richard's father and mother were so poor and had so many children, they had no money to spend in sending them to school, and in those days there were no free schools. So Richard hardly knew how to read or write. What he did know, he taught himself with the help of an uncle who was very kind to him. When Richard grew up, he became a barber. He rented a little cellar, and there he stuck up his red and white pole, which is the sign of a barber's shop. Then he waited for people to come to have their hair cut and to be shaved. But for some reason or other, very few people came. Perhaps it was because Richard's shop was little and dark and downstairs. Perhaps it was because he was always thinking of other things, and so did not make a very good barber. Whatever the reason was, few people came, and Richard became poorer and poorer. At last he had a great idea. If people would not come to be shaved for two pence, which was the usual price, why then he would shave them for one penny, and in this way cut out all the other barbers. So he wrote a big sign and pasted it over his doorway. Come to the subterraneous barber. He shaves for a penny, 
subterraneous means underground. It was not long before some people saw this sign. Hello, they said, what is this? Sav for a penny. Well, there is no harm in trying. So they tried, and Richard's shop became the fashion. It was crowded, while those of the other barbers were empty. The other barbers were very angry. But what was to be done? People were not likely to pay two pence when they could be shaved for one penny. But at last the barbers all agreed that they, too, should put signs saying that they shaved for one penny. Richard, however, did not want to lose all the trade which he had gained. He wrote out a new sign come to the subterraneous barber. He shaves for a half penny. So he was still the cheapest barber in the town. But shaving for a half penny did not pay very well. At this time nearly everyone wore wigs. Even people who had hair enough of their own cut it short and wore wigs of long hair, tied behind with ribbon, as you can see in the picture. Arkwright found out how to dye hair different colors, so he left off shaving and traveled about the country buying hair from people who were willing to sell it. Then he dyed it to the fashionable color and made it into wigs for fine gentlemen. This paid very much better than shaving people for a half penny, and soon Arkwright's hair was known to be the best in the country. He got on so well that he gave up his little shop in the cellar and took a better one. But Richard was not really interested in making wigs. What he really liked was machinery, and he spent all his spare time making models of a spinning frame. He got a man called Kay, who was a watchmaker, to help him, and Richard soon became so interested in his machinery that he neglected his business and became quite poor again. Richard's wife, finding that they were growing poorer and poorer, thought that this was all the fault of the models, so one day she smashed them, hoping her husband would go back to his wig-making. Richard was very grieved when he found his beautiful models broken, but far from giving up, he became even more determined to go on making models. He was so poor by this time, and his clothes were in such rags that he could not go out in the streets. Men in Tricon hats, outside of a shop Richard's shop, soon became the fashion. Richard got leave to set up his machine in a schoolhouse. The house was in a quiet place surrounded by a garden, so that Arkwright and Kay could work in peace. This was very necessary, for Richard Arkwright's wife was not the only person who wished to smash models or even machinery itself. The work, people were very ignorant, and they hated these new inventions, which they thought were going to take away their work. They hated them so much that, when the new inventions came into use, the work, people often broke into the factories and wrecked the machines. But even in his quiet garden, Richard was not quite safe, for two old women who lived not far off could hear the whirring and humming of the machinery. They were very frightened at these new, strange noises, which they thought must be made by evil spirits. They told people that the sound was as if the wicked one was tuning his bagpipes while Arkwright and Kay danced a jig. The people would have broken into the house to see what really was there, but they were too much afraid of the evil spirits. At last Arkwright conquered all his difficulties. His spinning frame was a success and although his troubles did not end for a long time, he at length made a great fortune and died Sir Richard Arkwright. He not only made a great fortune for himself, but he helped to make Britain wealthy. After Arkwright's invention came into use, the looms could make so much cloth that the merchants had enough not only to supply Britain, but to sell to other countries. Britain began to be called the workshop of the world, and a few years later, a great Frenchman called us a nation of shopkeepers, a name of which we have no reason to be ashamed. Other men besides Arkwright invented spinning frames.
but I have told you about Arkwright because his was the first really successful frame, and the machines which are used to today are almost the same as those he invented. Arkwright built mills and taught his work, people how to use the machines, and from his time the great factories began to grow up, which now give work to so many people, and which have made so many towns rich and famous. Arkwright's frames were first worked by water, so that a factory could only be built near a stream. But later, when Watt and Stevenson discovered the power of steam, they were worked by steam. When Watt and Stevenson made their engines and built railways, when British steamships carrying British goods sailed proudly over the seas, Britain was more than ever mistress of the waves, and she was also the workshop and the market of the world. Chapter 97 George the Third, England expects that every man will do his duty. This island loves thee well, thou famous man, the greatest sailor since our world began. In 1789 A.D. a revolution broke out in France. The French people rose against their king and queen, and killed them, and many of the nobles as well. Then they declared the country to be a commonwealth or republic, as the English had done in the time of Cromwell. At this time William Pitt the Younger, son of the great William Pitt, Lord Chatham, was Prime Minister. He, unlike his father, was a peace minister. Britain, with her new factories and new trade, was growing wealthy, and Pitt tried hard to keep the country at peace. But he tried in vain, for France declared war. Once more, for nearly twenty years, Britain was fighting by land and by sea. The French were led by Napoleon Bonaparte. He was one of the most wonderful men who have ever lived, beginning life as a poor, unknown soldier. He soon rose to be leader of the French army. He rose and rose until the people made him Emperor of France. His one desire was to be great and powerful, and he did not care how others suffered or how many people were killed so long as he had what he wanted. He made war all over Europe. He conquered kings and gave away their thrones and crowns to his own friends and relatives and only the British were strong enough to stand against him. Napoleon made up his mind to conquer Britain. He raised an army, which he called the Army of England, and he made a medal in honour of the conquest of Britain which never took place, and engraved upon the medal, struck at London, although he never reached there. It was like Caligula, and his army gathering shells on the shore, for Napoleon and his men came no nearer conquering Britain than those old Romans did. Many of the Irish hated the English, and would have been glad to help the French. Napoleon knew this, and he decided that Ireland was the best place at which to begin the attack. He fitted out a great fleet with the intention of landing in Ireland. But his ships were shattered by the winds, as the ships of the Armada had been, and nothing came of this invasion. A little later, the French really did land in Ireland. But the King's army was ready for them, and they were forced to go away again. Up till this time Ireland had still a separate Parliament, just as Scotland had before 1707 AD. Ireland made laws for itself, and in fact, except that it had the same King as Britain, there was no union between the countries. Pitt and the other wise men felt that this was not right. They saw how much more difficult it would be for Napoleon to conquer Ireland if it was really united to England and Scotland. So they worked hard till at last it was arranged that the Irish Parliament should join the British. In January 1801 A.D., the first imperial parliament was called and since then, English, Irish, and Scottish members have sat together in the same house and have made the laws for the whole land. On the 1st of January, King George made a proclamation saying that his title should now be George the Third, 
by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith. For the first time since the days of Henry V, the King of Britain no longer called himself King of France too. For in spite of the fact that the kings of Britain had never really been kings of France, they had always claimed the crown of France as a right. The great seal was also changed, and the royal standard, instead of bearing the arms of England and the fleur-de-lis of France, now bore the arms of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Meanwhile, British ships, under the great sailor Nelson, were victorious by sea, and on land British soldiers hindered and spoiled Napoleon's plans. At last, as everyone was tired of the war, peace was signed, but peace did not last long. The following year war broke out again, and Napoleon threatened once more to invade Britain. But the British built watch, towers and beacons along the coast, so that warning could be sent from town to town if the dreaded tyrant should come. The young men drilled as volunteers to guard their homes. Everyone was ready for the ogre Napoleon who never came. While these preparations were being made at home, Nelson swept the seas searching for the French and Spanish navies, and at last they met in Trafalgar Bay off the coast of Spain. A few days before they met, Nelson wrote to a friend, Here I am watching for the French and the Spaniards like a cat after the mice. If they come out, I know I shall catch them, but I am also almost sure that I shall be killed in doing it. On the 21st October 1805, Ada the battle began. Every captain in the fleet had received his orders and knew exactly what to do. But Nelson felt there was still something wanting, and from the top gallant mast of his own ship, the victory, a message was signalled through all the fleet. England expects that every man will do his duty. The message was greeted with cheer upon cheer from every ship along the line, and every sailor felt his courage rise. The battle soon became fierce. Shot and shell flew thick and fast. Once, as Nelson and Hardy, the captain of the victory, stood on deck together, a shot fell between them, tearing off one of Captain Hardy's shoe buckles. Each looked at the other, fearing he was wounded. Then, seeing neither of them were hurt, Nelson smiled and said calmly, This is too warm work, Hardy to last long. Everything went well with the British. Already it seemed as if the victory was sure, when a chance shot struck Nelson and he fell forward on the deck. They have done for me at last, Hardy, he said, as some sailors, seeing their dear Admiral fall, ran forward to carry him to a safe place. As Nelson was being carried past those who were fighting, he covered his face and the stars and medals on his coat in case they should see that he was wounded and feel discouraged, for his sailors loved him dearly. The great admiral was dying fast, but before he died, Hardy was able to bring him the news that victory was theirs, and that fourteen or fifteen of the enemy's ships had surrendered. I hope, said Nelson, that none of our ships have struck their colours. No, my lord, there is no fear of that. That's well, that's well, he answered. Sailors surrounding injured man on the deck of a ship they have done for me at last. Hardy, said Nelson, kiss me, Hardy. He said a little later. Hardy knelt and kissed him. I am satisfied now, he said. Thank God I have done my duty. These were his last words. With the Battle of Trafalgar, which was fought on 21st October 1805 A.D. Napoleon's power by sea was utterly shattered, and Britain was saved from all fear. The little ribbon of water between France and England was enough to keep her safe from the threats of the master of half Europe. T'was in Trafalgar's bay we saw the Frenchman lay. Each heart was bounding then. We scorned the foreign yoke, our ships were British oak, and hearts of oak our men, our Nelson marked them on the wave, 
Three cheers our gallant seamen gave, nor thought of home or beauty. Along the line the signal ran. England expects that every man this day will do his duty. And now the cannons roar along the affrighted shore. Our Nelson led the way, his ship the victory named. Long be that victory famed, for victory crowned the day. But dearly was that conquest bought. Too well the gallant hero fought, for England, home, and beauty. He cried as midst the fire he ran, England expects that every man this day will do his duty. At last, the fatal wound, which spread dismay around, the hero's breast received. Heaven fights on our side, the day's our own, he cried. Now long enough I've lived, in honour's cause my life was passed. In honour's cause I fall at last, for England home and beauty. Thus ending life as he England confessed that every man that day had done his duty. Chapter 98 George the Third, The Battle of Waterloo Napoleon hated Britain so much that besides fighting against her with soldiers, he tried to fight in another way. He tried to fight in another way. He tried to ruin British trade. Napoleon forbade other countries to trade with Britain. But it was of little use, and so ill did he succeed that his very own soldiers were dressed in British-made cloth, and wore British-made boots. As Portugal still traded with Britain, Napoleon made that an excuse for invading Portugal. At the same time, he seized the King of Spain and his son, and forced them to sign a paper saying that they gave up the throne of Spain. Napoleon then made his own brother, Joseph Bonaparte, king. But although the king and prince had been forced to sign away the throne, the people of Spain had something to say about it. They refused to have Joseph Bonaparte as their king. They rose to a man and rebelled against him, and they asked the British to help them. So two years after Trafalgar, the Peninsular War began. It is called the Peninsular War because it was fought in and for the peninsula formed by Spain and Portugal. At first the war was not very successful, but when Arthur Wellesley, afterwards Lord Wellington, took command, things went better. Gradually the French were driven back to France, and the war ended with the Battle of Toulouse. On 14th April, 1814 A.D., while this war was going on, Napoleon had also been fighting with Russia. There he was utterly crushed. Everywhere, the peoples he had conquered revolted against him. And, a few days before the Battle of Toulouse, he had been made to give up the throne of France, and was banished to the island of Elba. Of the many kingdoms which Napoleon had conquered, this little island in the Mediterranean Sea was all that he was allowed to keep. But he soon grew tired of playing at being emperor there. The following year, while the kings and princes of Europe were gathered at Vienna, trying to bring order and peace to the lands which Napoleon had upset with his wars and conquests, he left Elba and made straight for Paris. Cruel and selfish though he was, his soldiers loved him, for he had so often led them to victory. When he suddenly appeared among them, they flocked to him, and the people cheered and welcomed him. Once more, Napoleon was emperor of the French, but this time his rule only lasted one hundred days. The kings and princes at Vienna had not been able to agree about settling the affairs of Europe, but when they heard that Napoleon was once more in Paris, fear of him made them all unite. They gathered their armies for a great struggle against the terrible emperor. Wellington had command of eighty thousand men, but only about half of these were British. The rest were Dutch, Belgian, and German. Blucher, the great German general, had another army of one hundred and fifty thousand men, and there was yet 
a third army of Russians and Austrians, and all these armies marched towards France. But Napoleon did not wait for them to come. He marched out to meet them, and a great battle took place on 18th June, 1815 A.D., at Waterloo, not far from Brussels. Ah, said Napoleon, at last I shall measure swords with this Valento. For although the French and British troops had often met, Napoleon had always been fighting elsewhere, and had never met Wellington in battle. The fight was fierce and long, and as Wellington watched and directed, he anxiously looked for Blucher and his Prussians, who had promised to join and help him. Knight or Blucher, said Wellington, Knight or Blucher, for he knew that the coming of either would put an end to the dreadful fight. At last, about seven in the evening, Blucher and his Prussians came. Then Napoleon made one more desperate struggle for victory. The soldiers of his old guard, who had been kept in reserve, were ordered forward, but they broke and fled before the British charge. Napoleon, as he watched, became deathly pale. All is lost, he said, turning to his officers, who surrounded him, we must save ourselves, and he rode from the field, not till after the battle did Blucher and Wellington meet. In German fashion, the old Prussian general threw his arms round Wellington, and kissed him. It was a great victory, and by it Europe was saved from tyranny, yet Wellington was sad as he looked round on the dead and the dying. The British troops were worn out with the long day's fighting, but the Prussians were still fresh, and Blucher started off to chase the flying Frenchmen, who ran as fast as they were able. They hid in the woods and ditches and threw away their arms, knapsacks, and everything they could, so that they might run the faster and escape from the pursuing Prussian. They fled till they passed the borders of France, where they scattered to their homes, a broken, beaten army, never to be gathered together again. Napoleon gave himself up to the British. He was taken to England on board a British man, of war called the Bellerophon, but he was not allowed to land. He was kept on board the Bellerophon until the kings of Europe decided to send him to St. Helena, a lonely island in the Atlantic Ocean. There he could do no harm, and there he stayed until he died, six years later. Three men on horseback, greeting each other, not till after the battle did Blucher and Wellington meet. Chapter 99 George the Fourth, the first gentleman in Europe. George the Third died in January 1820 A.D., and was succeeded by his son George the Fourth. George the Fourth had already been reigning as regent for ten years, for during that time his father had been mad and so unable to rule, and towards the end of his life he had become blind and deaf as well. George the Third was called Farmer George, because he liked a peaceful country life, and would have been a very good farmer, although he was not a very wise king. He had reigned sixty years, including the last ten, during which he did not really rule. George the Fourth was called the first gentleman in Europe, because he was handsome and had fine manners, very different from those of his homely father. He tried to make friends with all his people through his fine manners. Soon after he became king, he went to Ireland, where the people received him with great joy. He made speeches to them, and laughed and cried with them. He wore the Order of St. Patrick on his breast, and great bunches of shamrock in his cap. He told them that he loved his Irish people, and that he was Irish at heart, and altogether acted his part very well. But it was merely acting, for George the Fourth only cared for himself, and was not in the least a good king. The warm-hearted Irish people, however, believed in him, and, when he sailed away again, 
Some of them were so eager to catch a last glimpse of their king that they fell into the sea and were nearly drowned. George next went to Hanover, for he was king of Hanover as well as king of Britain. There he talked German and wore a Hanoverian order, sang German national songs, and told the people with tears in his eyes that he was truly German at heart, and perhaps the German people believed him too. Next he went to Scotland. Since the time of Charles I, no king had visited Scotland, and the people crowded to welcome him. The road from Leith to Edinburgh was lined with gentlemen to do him honour, and as King George drove along through the lines of cheering people, it was seen that he was dressed in Stuart Tartan, and that he wore the order of the thistle. George had wept and laughed with his Irish subjects. Yet when a chance came for him to prove that he loved them, as he had said he did, he did not willingly take it. In the fierce old days, the Roman Catholics had killed and tortured the Protestants whenever they had the power, and in dread of them, an act had been passed forbidding Roman Catholics to hold any public office. Those days were long past. No one was now killed or tortured because of his religion. Yet the laws against the Roman Catholics still remained. No Catholic might be an officer in the army or navy. No Catholic might sit in Parliament or serve his country in any way. Yet nearly all the Irish people were Roman Catholics, and generous men for many years had felt these laws to be unjust. The younger Pitt had tried in vain to make George the Third do away with them. Now wise men tried to make George the Fourth repeal them, but the king, who said he was Irish at heart, refused. My father, he said, would have laid his head on the block rather than yield, and I am equally ready to lay my head there for the same cause. The great Duke of Wellington was Prime Minister at this time, and as he had conquered Napoleon in war, so now he conquered George the Fourth in peace. He stood firm, and at last the king was forced to give way. A bill called the Catholic Emancipation Act, which means Freeing Act, was passed by Parliament. Since then, Roman Catholics have been allowed to sit in Parliament to be officers, or to hold any other post which is open to Protestants, although no king may rule in Britain unless he is a Protestant. George the Fourth died in June 1830 A.D., having reigned ten years. He was an utterly selfish man and a bad king, yet the British nation had grown so strong that even a bad king could not do much harm while there were great men around him to work for their country. Chapter 100. William IV. The Story of Two Peaceful Victories. George IV had only one child, a daughter, and she died some time before her father. So he was succeeded by his brother William, who was sixty, five years old when he came to the throne. William was called the Sailor King because he had served in the navy. He was bluff and rough and good-natured, not at all like a king. He used to be fond of strolling about London with a walking stick or an umbrella, just like an ordinary man. But British people have always loved a sailor, so they were glad when William became king, and hoped that he would prove a better one than George the Fourth. that some of his people had not much reverence for him, is shown by one man who wrote of him. He seems a kind, hearted, well-meaning not. Stupid, bustling old fellow, and if he doesn't go mad, may make a very decent king. Later the same man called him one of the silliest old gentlemen in his dominions, if he had been left to himself, the well-meaning old fellow, would have been quite pleased to jog along without troubling about his kingdom or his duties. But that was not to be. The days of the clatter and jangle of steel armour were over. The roar and crackle of musket and cannon were silent for the time, but in the peace and silence men were thinking and planning and working for the good of the nation. For hundreds of years the people of Britain 
had had the right of choosing men to send to Parliament to tell their troubles and their wrongs, and to help to make just laws for the ruling of the country. The whole nation, of course, cannot go to Westminster, for no building would be large enough to contain them all, and the talking would never be finished, and no laws would ever be made. So each county and each big town chooses a man who goes to Parliament to speak and vote in the name of those who send him. That is what is intended, but at this time the reality was something quite different. During the hundreds of years which had passed since it had been first arranged which towns should send members to Parliament, there had been many changes. Places which had once been large towns had, for some reason or another, become deserted. Where there had been houses, churches, shops, and crowded busy streets, there was now perhaps only one lonely house, or perhaps only a deserted hillside. Yet that lonely house, or deserted hillside, continued to send a member to Parliament. On the other hand, since factories had been built, great towns had sprung up, where hundreds of years before there had been perhaps only a single cottage. But these great towns, with all their hard-working people, had no right to send a member to Parliament, and could have no voice in making the laws. This seems very absurd. Nowadays we think it would be quite easy for any sensible man to see that this state of affairs was wrong. But a hundred years ago many sensible people did not see it. They were pleased with things as they were, and very angry with those who tried to alter them. But some people were quite determined they should be altered, and two men called Lord Grey and Lord John Russell brought into Parliament what is called the Reform Bill. This bill took the right of sending anyone to Parliament away from the bare and lonely hillsides, and gave the right to the new and busy towns, so that the people should really be represented, that is, should have someone in Parliament to act and speak for them. There was a long and fierce struggle before this bill became law. You know that there are two Houses of Parliament, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. A bill to become law must be read in both Houses, and must be voted for by the greater number of the members in each. That is, more than half the members must vote for it. For instance, if there were only one hundred members, at least fifty, one must vote for a bill before it is said to have passed. Having passed both houses, it must receive the consent of the king before it can become law. After a great deal of difficulty, the commons were made to consent to the reform bill. But the lords did not want it, neither did the king, and again and again and again and again they refused consent. The country, however, had become so determined about it that there were riots everywhere when it became known that the lords would not pass the bill. The people who had been quite ready to love their king began to hate him, and instead of cheering when he appeared, they hissed and groaned. So bitter did the feeling become that the friends of the bill feared there would be another revolution and at last they forced the king to give his consent. The lords followed, and the bill became law. One more step towards liberty had been taken. Another great thing which happened during the reign of William the Fourth was the freeing of slaves. For many years people had been in the habit of stealing black people from their homes in Africa, and selling them as slaves in the colonies. People had grown so used to it that they did not see how wicked and cruel this was. These poor black people were taken to market and sold like cattle. They were branded like cattle, and beaten like cattle, and beaten like cattle. They had to work very hard, were paid no wages, and were often very cruelly treated. All masters, of course, were not cruel. Some of them were even kind to their poor slaves, but still they had very unhappy lives. They had no rights whatever. Their children might be taken from them and sold. Sometimes even husbands and wives were sold to different masters, and never saw each other again. 
A master might treat his slaves as badly as he chose, and no one could punish him. In the old, rough, wild days, no one cared about the sufferings of these poor black people. They were only niggers, and made for work and suffering, and nothing was thought about it. But, as time went on, people became less rough and more kind-hearted, and good men began to try to make people see the wickedness of slavery. For some years, a man called Wilberforce had been doing his best, and now he was joined by others, among whom was Macaulay, the father of the great writer. Mr. Macaulay had himself been a manager of a sugar plantation in the West Indies where slaves worked, but he gave up his post because he could not bear to see the misery and unhappiness of the slaves, and came home to try to do something for them. It was not a very easy thing to do, because all the work on the sugar and coffee plantations in the West Indies was done by slaves. The planters said they would be ruined if the slaves were made free, as the black people would not work unless they were forced to do so. Besides, they had paid a great deal of money for their slaves, and it seemed unfair that they should be made to lose it all. But, at last, all difficulties were smoothed away. The British Parliament said they would give twenty millions of money to the planters to make up for what they would lose in freeing their slaves, and in the year 1834 A.D. most of them were set free. Many other things were done during the reign of William IV, which you will find more interesting when you grow older. He died on 20th June 1837 A.D., having reigned seven years. Chapter 101, Victoria, the Girl Queen Many years ago, in a big airy schoolroom, a little girl of eleven sat with her governess. The little girl had many lessons to learn, far more, it seemed to her, than other little girls of the same age, and sometimes they were terribly dull and uninteresting. But today they were not so, for she had found in her history book a page which showed how kings were descended from each other. This was very interesting. The little girl read the page carefully. Then, looking up into the face of her governess, she said gravely, So I shall be Queen of Britain one day. Then, slipping her hand into that of her governess, I will be good. She added, I will be good. I see now why I have to learn so many lessons. This little girl was Princess Victoria, the daughter of the Duke of Kent. Younger brother of William the Fourth, William the Fourth had two children but they died while they were babies. The Princess Victoria's father had died when she was a baby, so she was the heir to the throne. When William lay still and quiet in the great palace at Windsor, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Chamberlain stepped into a carriage and drove fast to the palace of Kensington, where the princess lived with her mother. It was five o'clock in the morning when they arrived there. They knocked and hammered for a long time before they could rouse the sleepy porter, but at last they did so and got into the palace. But it seemed as if they were not to see the princess, and that was what they had come for. At last, after they had waited for a long time, a lady came to them. The princess is sleeping so peacefully, she said, I cannot wake her. We have come to see the Queen on affairs of state, said the Archbishop. Even her sleep must give way to that. The Queen. That was a very different matter. In a few minutes the new-made Queen came into the room. Her brown hair was hanging over her shoulders. A shawl covered her nightdress, and only slippers were on her little bare feet. She was hardly awake, and she wondered, perhaps, if she might not still be dreaming. And there, in the early morning sunshine, these two grave gentlemen, the Archbishop and the Lord Chamberlain, knelt to kiss the hand of this girl of eighteen, who was their queen. Since the time of George I, the kings of Britain had also been kings of Hanover. But in Hanover there was a law that no woman could ascend the throne. Victoria could not be queen of Hanover, so the crown passed to the Duke of Cumberland, 
another of the brothers of William IV, the British people were not very sorry to be rid of Hanover, and they were quite glad to be rid of Hanover, and they were quite glad to be rid of the Duke of Cumberland, for no one loved him. Not long after Queen Victoria came to the throne, she married her cousin, Prince Albert of Coburg Gotha. Very often kings and queens cannot choose whom they will marry as other people can. They have to do as they are advised and marry for the good of their country and people. But it is pleasant to know that this queen and prince really loved each other and that they were happy together with their children, just like ordinary people. Britain had been long at peace, and I wish I had no more wars to tell about. But, unfortunately, during the reign of Victoria there were many wars, although wise men did all they could to avoid them, for we see now more and more clearly how cruel and terrible a thing war is. I cannot tell you about all these wars and their reasons. Indeed, I cannot tell you about nearly all the important events which have happened since Victoria began to reign. Things happen, and changes come now much more quickly than they used to do, and to tell of all the wonderful events of the nineteenth century would fill a whole book, and much of it would not interest you. Chapter 102 Victoria When Bread Was Dear some time after Victoria began to reign, the poor people were in great distress. Work was scarce, and bread was dear, and many died of hunger. Long ago, most of the people in Britain used to live by cultivating the land, that is, by plowing, sowing, and reaping. In those days, enough corn was grown in Britain to feed all the people. But as years went on, the great lords, who owned the land, found that they made more money by rearing sheep for their wool than by growing corn and wheat for food. So year by year, less and less corn was grown in the island. Year by year, too, more babies were born and grew up into men and women, so that there were more people to feed. Then discoveries began to be made, and factories were built, and the people who used to plow and sow went into the towns to work in the factories. And so, because it became more difficult to find people to do farm work, still less corn was grown. Gradually, the supply of corn became very small, and, in consequence, very dear, for it always happens that if there is only a little of something which a great many people want, that article becomes very dear, and only those who are well off can afford to buy it. That is what happened to corn in Britain. There was not enough for all, and it became so dear that only the rich people could buy it, and the poor people starved. Bread was so dear that, however hard men worked, they could not earn enough to feed themselves and their children. There was plenty of corn in other parts of the world. In fact, people in other parts of the world had more than they wanted. They would gladly have sold it to Britain, and have bought instead the beautiful cloths which were being made in the British factories. In that way, the people in Britain would have had plenty to eat, and the people in other parts of the world would have had better clothes to wear and everyone would have been happier and better off. But, unfortunately, some years before this, a law had been passed that no foreign corn might be brought into the country until British corn cost eighty shillings a quarter, which is very, very dear indeed. The people who made this law meant to be kind to the farmers and help them to get a good price for their corn, but they did not see how unkind they were to the poor. At last a few people saw what a dreadful mistake these corn laws, as they were called, were, and they began with all their might and main to try to have them altered. The chief of these people were John Bright, Richard Cobden, and Charles Villiers. 
but they found it was very difficult to make others think as they did. For a long time they fought in vain, while the people grew poorer and poorer, starving, struggling, dying. Even little children and old men had to work hard all day long, always hungry. Child, what has thou with sleep to do? Awake and dry thine eyes. Thy tiny hands must labor too. Our bread is taxed, arise, arise, and toil long hours twice seven, for pennies two or three. Thy woes make angels weep in heaven. But England still is free, hopeless woe. Our bread is taxed, our rivals thrive, our gods will have it so. Yet God is undethroned on high, and undethroned will be. Father of all, hear thou our cry, and England shall be free. But there was worse still to come. In Ireland nearly all the poor people lived on potatoes only. And the potatoes all went bad. In a few weeks the food which ought to have lasted for a whole year became rotten. This was such a terrible misfortune that some of the men who had been against the repeal of the Corn Laws went over to the other side and tried to do away with them as fast as they could. Among these men was Sir Robert Peel, who was now Prime Minister. They knew that unless corn could be brought cheaply into Ireland, there would be a famine, and the people died. In hundreds, little children cried in vain to their mothers for something to eat. The mothers had nothing to give. It was a dreadful time, worse than any war. Rich people sent money and food to the poor, starving Irish. But in spite of everything that was done, the misery was terrible. Some of the food and money came from the United States of America, from the colonies which Britain had so lately lost. The owners of ships and railways did what they could too, and all parcels which were marked for Ireland were carried free on their trains and ships. When at last the famine was over, it was found that nearly a quarter of the people in Ireland had died, but the Corn Laws had been done away with. Chapter 103 Victoria Peace Queen Victoria's husband was called the Prince Consort. He was a clever man, and, after he married Queen Victoria, he tried to do all he could for Britain. Although he was German, he learned to speak English almost perfectly, a thing which some of our German kings had never troubled to do. The prince wanted to help trade, and to keep peace. So he asked people to come from all parts of the world, and bring with them the beautiful and useful things which were made in their countries, and also the things which grew there, such as plants and fruits. These were all to be gathered together in one great building, so that the people of each country might see what the people in other countries were doing, and, having seen, might go home with new ideas. In this way, the trade of the whole world would be helped. The prince thought, too, that if people of different countries met together and came to know each other in this friendly manner, they would be less likely to want to fight with each other. Although we have since had many great exhibitions or world's fairs then, it was quite a new idea. It was so new that many people did not like it. They thought that it would be bad for Britain to bring a number of foreigners there. But in spite of difficulties, the prince had his way. One great difficulty was how to make a building quickly enough and big enough to hold the beautiful things which were to be brought from all over the world. The prince wanted to have a pretty building, and no one could think of anything except ugly brick sheds. At last a gentleman called Sir Joseph Paxton said, Why not use glass and iron? And he sat down and drew a sketch of what he thought the building ought to be. This idea of a glass house was quite as new as the idea of having an exhibition at all, and the prince was delighted with it. Very soon a palace of glass began to rise in Hyde Park, and it seemed so beautiful that the people called it the Crystal Palace. 
and very beautiful indeed it looked on the opening day. It gleamed and glittered like a fairy thing. It was decorated with the flags of all nations, with palms and flowers, with statues and fountains, and crowded with people from every country in the world. Queen Victoria opened the exhibition, and she was glad and happy, both because it all looked so beautiful, and because she knew it was the thought of her husband whom she loved so well. Bands played, a great choir sang, the world seemed full of sunshine and joy, and, lo, the long laborious miles of palace, lo, the giant isles rich in model and design, harvest tool and husbandry, loom and wheel and enginery, secrets of the sullen mine, steel and gold, and corn and wine, fabric rough or fairy fine, wonder, out of west and east, and shapes and hues of art divine, all of beauty, all of use, that one fair planet can produce, brought from under every star, blown from over every main, and mixed, as life is mixed with pain, the works rain, from growing commerce, loose her latest chain, and let the fair white-winged peacemaker fly to happy havens under all the sky, and mix the seasons and the golden hours, till each man find his own in all men's good, and all men work in noble brotherhood, breaking their mailed fleets, and armed towers, and ruling by obeying nature's powers, and gathering all the fruits of earth, and crowned with all her flowers. The exhibition was a great success. Never before had there been so many people from strange countries gathered together in London. Never before had so many beautiful and curious things been seen all at once. When it was over, the Crystal Palace was not destroyed, but was taken down and built up again at another place. There it has remained ever since, and is still one of the sights of London. But although people hoped great things from this friendly gathering, their hopes were not fulfilled. Three years later, after a peace of forty years, Britain was again at war. Chapter 104 Victoria War Russia is a great country in the east of Europe. But if you look at the map, you will see that, although it is very large, it has not much seashore. That is bad for a country, for, unless it has seaports, its ships cannot easily sail to other countries with goods and bring back their goods in exchange. To the south of Russia lies the Black Sea, but then half of the shore of that sea belonged to Turkey, and Turkey had the right to keep the ships of other nations out of the Black Sea. Russia was very angry at this, and formed plans to conquer Turkey and take possession of the country. The Emperor of Russia had another reason for wishing to fight with the Turks. The Turks, you know, are Mahometans, but many of the people who lived in Turkey had become Christian. The Emperor thought that these Christians were badly treated by the Turks, and he wished to protect them. This made the Sultan very angry, for he said that the Emperor was not really anxious about the happiness of the Christians, but merely wished to interfere with his rule. The Russian emperor hoped that the British would help him to fight the Turks, and he offered to divide Turkey when conquered with Britain. But the British were on good terms with the Turks, and they had several reasons for not wishing Russia to conquer Turkey. So, unfortunately, when war at last broke out, they sided with the Turks against the Russians, as did the French, who also thought that it would be a bad thing if Russia conquered Turkey. For the first time, France and Britain, instead of fighting against each other, fought side by side. Lord Raglan led the British army, Marshal Saint Arnaud the French. The war was fought in the Crimea, a little peninsula in the Black Sea, and from that it was called the Crimean War. 
both the French and the British sent fleets into the Black Sea, but they did not do much, as the war was chiefly fought on land round the fortress of Sebastopol, which the Allies, as the armies of Britain, France, and Turkey, were called besieged. Ali comes from the same word as alliance, and means the friends or those who had joined together. Britain had been at peace for forty years, and although the soldiers had not forgotten how to fight, it seemed as if those in command had forgotten how to plan a war. The winter in Russia is terribly cold, and the people who had charge of sending out clothes to the soldiers sent the things to the wrong places. So when the soldiers were shivering with cold at one place, great stores of warm clothing would be lying at another, perhaps not many miles off, but quite out of reach. Once a whole shipload of boots arrived, and when they were unpacked, they were found to be all for the left foot. Terrible storms arose too, which wrecked the ships which were bringing stores of food. These storms not only wrecked the ships, but they tore down and blew away the soldiers' tents, so that they had to sleep in the open air in the snow and bitter frost. They had nothing upon which to sleep except wet straw, and often they had no bed, clothes at all, and this in cold so dreadful that if a man took hold of a piece of iron it would freeze to his hand so that he could not leave go without tearing away the skin. So great was the suffering that many of the soldiers became sick and ill. The hospitals were soon filled, and many more died of disease than were killed by the Russian. In those days there were very few proper nurses, and the poor sick soldiers were very badly cared for until a lady called Florence Nightingale went out to the Crimea, taking with her other ladies as nurses. When Florence Nightingale and her nurses arrived in the Crimea, the dirt and horror of the hospitals were dreadful. The great wards were crowded from end to end, with sick and wounded, dead and dying. No one did anything for the poor soldiers. Their wounds even were often not dressed. They were brought there to die. But Florence Nightingale worked so hard that soon the hospitals were sweet and clean, and the men grew well instead of dying. The soldiers loved and adored her, and she never seemed to tire of working for them. Long after everyone else had gone, she would walk through the wards carrying a lamp in her hand, moving softly from bed to bed, doing what she could for the poor wounded men. She would speak to one and another, said one poor fellow afterwards, and nod and smile to many more. But she could not do it to all, there were so many of us. But we could kiss her shadow as it fell, and lay our heads on our pillows again, content. Lo, in that house of misery, a lady with a lamp, I see pass through the glimmering gloom, and flit from room to room, and slow, as in a dream of bliss, the speechless sufferer turns to kiss her shadow, as it falls upon the darkening wall, as if a door in heaven should be opened, and then closed suddenly. The vision came and went, the light shone and was spent. On England's annals, through the long hereafter of her speech and song, that light its rays shall cast from portals of the past. A lady with a lamp shall stand in the great history of the land, a noble type of good, heroic womanhood. Once Florence Nightingale went out into the trenches among the soldiers to get a good view of Sebastopol. When it became known that she was there, they sent up such a shout that the Russians behind their strong battlements heard it and trembled, not knowing what it might mean. There was not a man there but honoured her as he would a queen. Florence Nightingale worked so hard that at last she too became ill of the terrible Crimean fever. 
Then there was sorrow indeed. Little could the men do for her who had done so much for them, but even in that wild place they found flowers to bring to her, to cheer her loneliness. And she did not die, but still lived to bring joy to many. Since Florence Nightingale worked among the soldiers in the Crimea, army nurses have worn red crosses upon their sleeves, as the Crusaders did long ago. But those who wear the cross today do not go to battle to fight, but to help the wounded and the dying. Over the hospitals on the battlefield too flies the Red Cross flag, and no enemy ever fires at it, or injures anyone who wears the Red Cross badge. The British soldiers were brave, and in spite of sickness and suffering they fought gallantly, but they were often badly led and many mistakes were made. One dreadful mistake was made at a battle called Balaclava. There was a brigade of cavalry called the Light Brigade. Lord Raglan sent a message to the officer in command, telling him to prevent the Russians carrying away some guns. The officer thought he was meant to charge right forward, and he did so, but it was a mistake. He and his men rode straight to death. For a mile and a half they rode with Russian guns in front of them, Russian guns on either side of them, thundering death. When their comrades saw what the Light Brigade was doing, they stood watching in horror and wonder, as six hundred men of the brigade rode down the lane of fire and smoke, and disappeared in the bank of smoke beyond. It was horrible. What was happening to these gallant soldiers? They rode straight up to the Russian guns and drove the gunners away, but they could not stay there. The whole Russian army was arrayed against them, so they rode back again, back through that awful lane of shot and shell. Six hundred and seven men went, only one hundred and ninety-eight returned. It was a splendid show of bravery, but utterly useless. What was the order given? What were the men meant to do? No one can answer the question. It is magnificent, said a French officer who saw it. But it is not war. Yet all the world saw what Britons could do in obedience to a command. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the six hundred. Forward the light brigade. Charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Forward the light brigade. Had blundered. Theirs not to make reply. Theirs not to reason why. Theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, volleyed and thunt of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed it with shot and shell. Into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the six hundred, flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered, plunged in the battery. Smoke right through the line they broke. Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, not, not the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of six hundred. When can their glory fade? All oh, the wild charge they made, all the world wondered. Honour the charge they made, honour the light brigade, noble six hundred. The siege of Sebastopol lasted about a year, during which time the Sardinians joined the Allies. Sardinia was a very small kingdom, 
but the people were brave. They wanted to take a place among the great powers of Europe, and the Allies were very glad to have their help. During the winter, too, the Russian Emperor died. He was so sad and disappointed because his soldiers were being beaten that he did not care to live. He died of a broken heart. When the Emperor died, people hoped that the war would come to an end, but it did not. His son, the new Emperor, still carried it on. At last, the French and British made a fierce attack on Sebastopol, and although they did not succeed in doing all they meant to do, the Russians felt that they could hold out no longer. Next morning Sebastopol was empty and in flames. The Russians had set it on fire and fled. After this the war soon came to an end, and a few months later peace was signed. Russia had failed, and Turkey was neither conquered nor divided. Chapter 105 Victoria, the land of snow. In days long, long ago, men knew very little of the world and all the countries it contained. But in the time of Henry the Seventh, great sailors began to sail as began to sail into far seas and discover new lands. From that time onward, there have been many great and daring sailors who have sailed the seas and discovered more and more lands until the blue of our maps has become marked with islands and continents. The way to India and China is long, and in the days when there were no steamers, it was dangerous too. In the time of King Henry the Seventh, a man called Sebastian Cabot tried to find a short way to India by going round the north of America through the Arctic Ocean. This began the quest of what was called the Northwest Passage. For hundreds of years men struggled to find this northwest passage, but all in vain, and many brave lives were lost in the bitter frost and snow of the far north. As new lands were discovered, the map of the Arctic region began to be filled in bit by bit, but the northwest passage remained undiscovered. At last the British government decided in 1845 A.D to send out an Arctic expedition, and Sir John Franklin, who had already been on two voyages of discovery to Arctic regions, was put in command. Sir John was no longer a young man, but he loved the sea and the north, and he went out like an old sea lion, eager to find the long-sought passage. He sailed away with two ships, called the Terror and the Erebus, manned by a hundred men and more. The last good by was said, the last handshake given, and away sped the ships further and further north into the white and silent land, never again to return. A year passed, then another. At home, anxious hearts waited and waited for news, but no news came. Then, as nothing was heard of the ships and their gallant crews, both Sir John Franklin's wife and the British government sent out expeditions to try to find the Terror and the Erebus. These new ships sailed to the north, keeping as much as possible in the course Sir John had gone, but they could find no trace of him. Here and there sailors landed on the bare white shores which they passed and left supplies of food under great heaps of stones or cairns, as they are called, they also left letters telling which way their ships had gone. This they did hoping that some of Franklin's men might pass that way and find the food and letters. The sailors also caught white foxes which run about wild in these cold countries. Round the necks of these foxes they put copper collars on which were engraved directions how to find the ships and the stores of food. The foxes were then let loose again in the hope that some of them might find their way to the Terror and the Erebus and bring comfort and encouragement to Sir John and his men. But nothing was of any use. No sign of Franklin and his brave men could be found, although expedition after expedition was sent out. At one time as many as fifteen ships were looking for Franklin, but each one failed. Men dragging a sled through the snow toward two ships, the ships were called the Terror. 
and the Erebus. At last, after about twelve years, the searchers were rewarded. They found a cairn in which was a tin can, in which was a tin can containing a paper which had been put there by one of Sir John's men. This paper told how, at last, the Northwest Passage had been discovered, how Sir John had died a few days later, and how, as the ships were stuck fast in the ice, and could not get through to the sea beyond, the men had at last left them, and started southward on sledges. That was all. None of the men ever reached home again. They all died of cold and hunger, and here and there along the way they had gone their skeletons were found bleached and white. The people who live in the cold far north are called Eskimos. When they were questioned, some of them remembered having seen white men traveling southward with a sledge. But they were very thin, said one old woman. They fell down and died as they walked. The Eskimos had among them silver spoons and forks, which the searchers knew had belonged to Sir John. These were all collected and brought home, but of the ships themselves nothing was ever seen. All through the long search it was Lady Franklin who urged the explorers on, and when at last she knew that her dear husband was indeed dead, she raised a tomb to his memory in Westminster Abbey. She herself wished to write the words which were to be carved on the stone, but she died before they were written. The great poet Laurier Tennyson wrote them instead, not here. The white north hath thy bones, and thou heroic sailor soul art passing on thy happier voyage now towards no earthly pole. Although it is now known that there is a northwest passage, it is also known that it can be of no use for trade, even if the passage was not blocked with ice. The danger and suffering from the cold are too great to be endured. There are still wonderful things to be learned in the cold, white north, and there have been many Arctic expeditions since the death of Sir John Franklin. But I have told you about him, because he was one of the most famous Arctic explorers. He really discovered the Northwest Passage, and his death in the far north caused many other expeditions to be sent out, and, although they did not find Sir John, they learned much that was new about the Arctic regions. Chapter 106 Victoria The Siege of Delhi a hundred years had passed since the terrible night when the British had been murdered in the black hole of Calcutta. A hundred years had passed since Clive had gained the victory of Plassey. Since then, the British power in India had steadily grown and grown until, instead of a few sepoys, there was a great Indian army. Instead of a few factories, the whole of India was under the rule of Britain and British rule in India seemed firm and certain. But suddenly, from out the calm, rebellion blazed. New guns had been sent to India for the use of the sepoys. The powder and shot for a gun is made up with paper into what is called a cartridge. In those days, the end of the cartridge had to be bitten off before it could be used. The paper of these cartridges was greased and somehow the sepoys came to think that the grease was a mixture of cow's fat and pig's laird, and they refused to use the cartridges. These Indian soldiers were not Christians, but Brahmins and Mohammedans. The Brahmins worshipped the cow, and they thought that it was dreadfully wicked to put into their mouths, or even touch, what they held as sacred. The Mohammedans, on the other hand, thought that pigs were unclean animals, and their religion forbade them to touch anything which was considered unclean. So they, too, felt that it would be wicked to use the cartridges. The governor, Lord Canning, sent out a proclamation telling all the people that the cartridges were not greased, either with cow's fat or with lard. But the sepoys did not believe him, and a terrible rebellion known as the Indian Mutiny, broke out. It was a most dreadful time. 
There were very few British soldiers in India, and Lord Canning knew that it would be many weeks before others could arrive from Britain. But the British had been fighting in Persia, and Lord Canning sent for the soldiers there, and also for some who were on their way to fight in China. The mutiny first broke out at a place called Meirut. There, the native soldiers one day suddenly fired upon their officers and killed some of them. Then they murdered many of the white people in the town, broke open the gales, and freed the prisoners, who joined in rioting and plundering. But at last the few British soldiers who were there succeeded in driving the sepoys from their barracks, and they fled to Delhi, another town near. At Delhi there lived an Indian emperor of about eighty years old. He was an emperor only in name, for his whole empire was under British rule. But now the sepoys, driven from Meirut, rushed to his palace and loudly clamoured for him to come and be their emperor once more. They would no longer have British rulers, they said. They would sweep them from the land. Dreadful deeds were done in Delhi, but British troops besieged the town and took it again. When the mutiny was over, the old emperor was put in prison where he died. At a place called Cornpore, some of the most cruel acts were done. There were only about three hundred British troops there, and more than three thousand sepoys. Sir Hugh Wheeler, who was in command, was a very old man. He knew that with his few soldiers he could not hold out against so many sepoys, and he sent to Lucknow to Sir Henry Lawrence for help. But alas! Sir Henry could not help him, for Lucknow, too, was in great danger, and he need every one of his men. So Sir Hugh sent to a native called the Nana Sahib, and asked him for help. The Nana Sahib had always pretended to be a friend, and Sir Hugh believed that he was. Really, he hated the British. Now he came with three hundred men, professing to be glad to help them. He got into Kanpur with his soldiers and his guns, and then he turned against the British. Sir Hugh and all the white people had gathered into an old hospital for safety. The magazine, the place where the gunpowder and fire, arms were kept, would have been a far better refuge for them. It is difficult to understand why Sir Hugh did not go there, but he did not, and it fell into the hands of the sepoys. The hospital was surrounded by a low wall of mud, which was all the defence there was between the white people and the shrieking, yelling mob of sepoys. Within these walls there were nearly one thousand white people, and more than half of them were women and children. The sepoys thought that it would be easy to kill them all, but they found out their mistake. The white people fought fiercely, and the sepoys were driven back again and again. The suffering within the old hospital was dreadful. The women and children died by hundreds. The fierce Indian sun blazed down upon the almost roofless house. There was little to eat and less to drink. Water could only be had from a well which was within the range of the enemy's guns. To go for water seemed to the bravest to be going to certain death. During the whole siege, not a cupful could be spared to wash with. Thousands of yelling sepoys were without the low mud walls, yet so great was their dread of the white men that they dared not leap over. At last the Nana Sahib, out of the deep wickedness of his heart, proposed terms. He promised that all who would lay down their arms should be allowed to leave the town, that he would give them boats to take them to another town where they would be safe, and that they should have food for the journey. All he asked was that they should go away. What joy there was within the hospital when it was known that the terrible siege was at an end. The women and children were utterly worn and weary. The men were wounded, sick and hopeless. The joy and relief were almost too great. The day came. Everything was ready. 
and the long, slow procession passed down to where the boats were waiting on the river. Gently the sick and wounded were placed under the straw awnings, with which the boats were covered to protect the passengers from the blazing sun. Then the women and children stepped in, lastly the men. The Indian rowers took their places and pushed off, when suddenly a trumpet was heard. In a moment the straw-thatched roofs of the boats were in flames, and the rowers, throwing down their oars, made for the shore. A moment later both banks blazed and roared with gunshots, and a horrible rain of bullets fell upon the boats. To make the horror worse, the boats drifted upon the mud banks and stuck fast. The women and children who were still alive were taken ashore again, and shut up this time in a place called the Savada House. The men were all killed, so the Nana Sahib kept faith, but the British were coming. General Havelock and his brave soldiers were not far off, and the Nana made haste to finish his cruel work. He ordered his sepoys to fire at the women and children through the windows of the Savada house. Even the sepoys, however, turned from this awful work and aimed high, so that the shots fell upon the roof and did no harm. But in the evening five men went into the house. Horrible shrieks were heard, then all was silence. The work was finished. All the women and children were dead. The bodies of those poor women and children were thrown into a well, and when the British took Cawnpore, the horror of that well was one of the first sights they saw. Now it is covered over. A marble angel holding a palm branch guards the spot, and a garden blooms where that ghastly house stood. The Nana Sahib was never punished. When his sepoys were defeated before Cawnpore, he galloped away and was seen no more. People said that he was not a man, but an evil spirit, and that when his work was done, he vanished as a spirit would. Chapter 107 Victoria The Pipes at Lucknow Lucknow, too, was besieged, and terrible things were happening there. The chief officer at Lucknow was Sir Henry Lawrence, who had so sadly to refuse to send help to Cawnpore. He was a brave and wise man, but he was killed almost at the very beginning of the siege. One day, while he was talking with some of his officers, a shell burst into the room. When the smoke cleared away a little, someone said, Are you hurt, Sir Henry? Then Sir Henry said quietly, I am killed. He died two days later. Never yield, he said. Let every man die at his post rather than yield. For nearly three months the siege went on. The white people were shut into a strong place called the Residency, and although they were better off than the poor people at Cawnpore, many died of wounds and sickness. It was three months of horror beneath a blazing sky, amid the shriek and roar of cannon. Men grew hard-eyed and gaunt. Women drooped and faded. Would help never come? At last General Havelock, having defeated the Nana Sahib, marched towards Lucknow. But he had lost so many of his men that he dared not attack. He was obliged to wait for more soldiers, and the waiting was hard for men with the memories of Cawnpore in their hearts. But at last Sir James Outram joined Havelock, and together they marched to Lucknow. As week after week passed, and no help came, the brave defenders of Lucknow grew sick with longing and despair. One evening a sergeant's wife called Jessie, who had been ill, was lying asleep while her mistress, who had been nursing her, sat by her side. Jessie stirred and muttered in her sleep, then, suddenly springing up and turning her startled eyes on her mistress, she cried, Dinna ye hear them? Dinna ye hear them? Dinna ye hear them? 
the lady thought that Jessie had gone mad. Jessie, dear, lie down, she said. You are not well. No, no, cried Jessie. I'm well, I'm well. It's the Campbells I'm hearing. Dinner ye hear them, dinner ye hear them. It was indeed the sound of the pipe. Soon, not only Jessie, but all that weary band heard the glad sound. The terrible agony of waiting was over. General Havelock and his Highlanders were at the gates. Lucknow was relieved. Pipes of the misty moorlands, voice of the glens and hills, the droning of the torrents, the treble of the rills, not the brays of broom and heather, nor the mountains dark with rain, nor maiden bower, nor border tower, have heard your sweetest strain, dear to the lowland reaper, and plaided, mountaineer, to the cottage and the castle, the Scottish pipers are dear. Sweet sounds the ancient pibroch or mountain, lock and glade, but the sweetest of all music the pipes at Lucknow played. Day by day the Indian tiger louder yelled and nearer crept. Round and round the jungle serpent near and nearer circles swept prey for rescue, wives and mothers. Pray to-day, the soldier said, too. Morrow death's between us and the wrong and shame we dread. Oh, they listened, looked, and waited till their hope became despair and the sobs of low bewailing filled the pauses of their prayer. Then up spake a Scottish maiden with her ear unto the ground, Dinner ye hear it, dinner ye hear it. The pipes of Havelock sound, hushed the wounded man his groaning, hushed the wife her little ones. Alone they heard the drum-roll and the roar of sepoy guns. But to sounds of home and childhood the highland ear was true as the mother's cradle crooning the mountain pipes she knew. March of soundless music through the vision of the seer, more of feeling than of hearing, of the heart than of the ear. She knew the droning pibroch, she knew the droning pibroch, she knew the Campbell's call. Hark, hear ye no, MacGregus, the grandest of them all. Oh, they listen, dumb and breathless, and they caught the sound at last, faint and far beyond the goomtee rose and fell, the piper's blast, then a burst of wild thanksgiving mingled woman's voice and man's. Good be praised, the march of Havelock clans, louder, nearer, fierce as vengeance, sharp and shrill as swords at strife came the wild MacGregor's clan call, stinging all the air to life. But when the far-off dust cloud to plated legions grew, full tenderly and blithesomely the pipes of rescue blew, round the silver domes of Lucknow, Moslem mosque and pagan shrine, breathe the air to Britain's dearest, the air of Auld Lang Syne. Or the cruel roll of war, Drums rose that sweet and home-like strain, and the tartan clove the turban as the goon-tea cleaves the plain. But although the coming of Havelock and his men saved Lucknow for a time, they were not strong enough quite to defeat the sepoys and take all the women and children to a safe place. So the siege began again and lasted for about two months more. But at last Sir Colin Campbell landed in India, and a few days later marched to Lucknow. This time it really was relieved, woman speaking urgently to other woman, dinna ye hear them. Dinna ye hear them? It's little more than a week later, General Havelock, who had fought so bravely for his countrymen, who had endured so much to bring them help, died. India is very far from Britain, and in those days news travelled very slowly. So the queen, not knowing that Havelock had died, made him a baronet, laid him a baronet, that is, she gave him the title of Sir, in reward for his brave deeds. But three days before the queen did this, the brave general was lying still and quiet, resting after his great labours. 
General Havelock was a good as well as a great man. Like Cromwell, he taught his soldiers to fight and to pray, and Havelock's saints, as they were called, were well known in India. But Havelock's saints, like Cromwell's Ironsides, showed that they could fight as well as pray. After the relief of Lucknow, the mutiny was nearly at an end, Lord. Canning made a proclamation offering pardon to all except those who had actually murdered the British, and gradually the country became peaceful again. The East India Company, which until now had practically ruled India, was done away with, and the Queen took the government into her own hands. As Victoria could not herself live in India, she appointed a viceroy. Viceroy means one in place of a king. Lord Canning, who, through all the terrible days of the mutiny, had proved himself to be a good governor, was made the first viceroy. Chapter 108 Victoria Under the Southern Cross Let no one think much of a trifling expense. Who knows what may happen a hundred years hence? The loss of America, what can repay? New colonies seek for in Botany Bay. In the days of King George the Third, there was a great sailor called Captain Cook. He made many voyages into unknown seas and discovered new lands. Among these lands were the islands of Australia and New Zealand. It was in April 1770 A.D. that Captain Cook first landed in Australia, in a bay which he called Botany Bay because there were so many plants of all kinds there. At that time, the island was inhabited only by wild black savages, and Captain Cook took possession of the whole eastern coast in the name of King George, calling it New South Wales. While America was a British colony, wicked people, instead of being sent to prison for punishment, as they are now, were sent to work on the cotton plantations or farms there. After America was lost, convicts, as these wicked people are called, could no longer be sent there, and British statesmen began to look round for some other country to which they could be sent. Then it was that Australia was thought of. It was decided to form a convict colony there. It was hoped that free people would go too and that soon Australia would become as great a colony as America had been. So there sailed out from England a little fleet of ships, carrying Captain Philip as the governor of the new colony, and nearly a thousand people, of whom more than seven hundred were prisoners. The rest were officers and marines to guard the prisoners. They took with them food and clothes enough to last two years. Also, tools for building houses, and ploughs, and everything needed for farm work. As the ships passed the Cape of Good Hope, they stopped there to take in more food, and also animals with which to stock the farms which the British hoped to make in Australia. They took so many animals on board that the ships looked more like Nika's arks than anything else. When the ships reached Australia, Captain Philip landed. A flagstaff was planted, and soon the Union Jack floated out to the sound of British cheers. The health of the king was drunk, and then Captain Philip made a speech to the convict. He told them that now, in this new country, they had another chance to forget their wicked ways and to become again good British subjects. It was the first speech which had ever been made in the English language in that far land, and when he had finished, the silence of the lonely shore was again broken by the sound of British cheers. So the town of Sydney was founded. Governor Philip and his strange company of rough bad men soon set to work. Everything had to be done. Trees had to be felled and stones quarried and broken for the building of houses and the making of roads and harbours. There was so much to do that little time was left for farm work, and the settlers in this new colony nearly starved. It seemed as if the people at home had forgotten them, for the food which they had promised to send never came. 
Day by day, eager eyes looked out vainly over the blue sea, straining for the sight of a white sail. But no ship came. Prisoners and warders alike grew gaunt and pale. Nearly all their food was gone. The governor even gave up some sacks of flour which were his own. I do not wish, he said, to have anything which others cannot have. If any convict complains, he may come and see that at Government House we are no better off than he is. Still no help came. Little work could be done by men who were starving, and the weary days dragged slowly past for the handful of white people who, utterly cut off from all others, were ignorant of what was happening in the great world, which lay beyond the blue wave. But even in the darkest hour, they never forgot that they were Britons. Our distress did not make us forget that this was the birthday of our beloved king, wrote one. In the morning flags were displayed, and at noon three volleys of musketry were fired as an acknowledgment that we were Britons, who, however distant and distressed, revered their king, and loved their king, and loved their country. At last, after three years, a sail was seen. Oh, what joy! Help at last! And news at last from home! But alas! The new ship brought little food, and many more convicts. It brought, however, the assurance that the little colony was not forgotten. Other ships had been sent with food, but they had been wrecked on the way. A fortnight later another ship arrived, then another and another. The colony was saved for the time at least, although famine threatened them again more than once. At one time things were so bad that when any one was asked to dine at Government House, he was requested to bring his own bread with him. In a few years free settlers began to come to Australia. They were farmers, and soon corn was grown in such quantities that the colony was freed from all fear of famine. Later still, a gentleman brought wool-bearing sheep to Australia, that is, sheep which have fine fleeces, and now the rearing of sheep for their wool is one of the chief industries of Australia. As the free settlers increased in number, they objected to having convicts sent among them. For, because of these wild bad men, the colony began to have an evil name. When gold was discovered in Australia, many more people flocked there. Then Queen Victoria and her government decided at last that it was not a good thing to send convicts to the colonies. And so in 1867 AD, the last convict ship set out for Australia. After that, the British shut up those who did wrong in strong prisons at home. Australia has grown quickly into a great and wealthy country. I cannot tell you the history of it here, but although it is now called the Commonwealth of Australia and has a parliament of its own, it is still part of the empire of Greater Britain. Australia lies quite at the other side of the world from Britain, and when it is day in the one, it is night in the other, and when Australians look up to the sky at night, they see the stars of the Southern Cross instead of the Pole Star and the plough which the British see. Yet the people in the two islands are friends and brothers, and ties of love draw them together across the ocean waves. Chapter 109 Victoria From Cannibal to Christian In 1769 A.D., Captain Cook landed in North Island. He cut the name of his ship upon a tree, planted the British flag, and claimed the land in the name of King George the Third. Then he sailed all round the island, proving to himself and his officers that it was indeed an island. In January of the following year, he landed in South Island, again hoisted the Union Jack, and again claimed the land, and all the lands near, in the name of King George. For many years no white people settled in New Zealand, 
for it was peopled by a wild and warlike race of savages called Maori. These Maoris were cannibals, that is, people who eat human beings. After a battle, those who were killed would be roasted and eaten by the victors. The Maoris fought among themselves, and they fought with the white traders who came from time to time to their shores. Yet although they were cannibals, the Maoris were not nearly such a low kind of savage as the Australian, and a missionary called Marsden, hearing about these islands and their people, made up his mind to teach them to be Christian. Mr. Marsden was working among the convicts in Australia, and one day he set sail from there and landed in New Zealand. For the price of twelve axes, he bought two hundred acres of land from one of the Maori chiefs, and there he founded a missionary settlement. Mr. Marsden himself could not stay, for his work was in Australia, but he left two men behind him who taught the natives, and he often came back to the islands, and was greatly loved by the Maoris. For many years Britain did not acknowledge New Zealand as a colony. Dreadful deeds were done there, but when the British government was asked to put a stop to them, the answer was that the islands were not within His Majesty's dominions. Yet at other times the government acted as if the islands were part of the empire. It was only very gradually that white people went to live in New Zealand. The first colonists who came did not stay long, for the dreadful customs of the savage Maoris frightened them away again. That was not to be wondered at, for, in spite of all the missionaries could do, many of the Maoris remained cannibals. When Queen Victoria came to the throne, there were only about two thousand white people in all the islands, but, as many of these were British, it was felt at last that it was the duty of the British to do something to protect their colonists against the Maoris, and also to protect the Maoris from being cheated and ill-treated by bad white people who went there to steal the land from the native chief. So a governor was sent out from Britain who was told to make a treaty with these native chiefs. This treaty was signed at a place called Waitangi, in North Island. The governor, with all the principal white people, sat upon a platform which had been set up in an open space near the town. Round them sat the Maori chiefs, and behind them stood all the rest of the white people. Beyond gleamed the white of the British tents, gay with flags, which showed brightly against the background of waving green tree. When all were gathered, the governor spoke to the people and, as he could not speak the Maori language, one of the missionaries translated his words to them. He told them how the great white queen in an island far away was anxious that they should be happy and at peace, and because so many of the great white queen's own subjects had come to live in these islands of New Zealand, she felt that she must send a governor to rule them, and to see justice done between them and the Maoris. The great white queen asked the Maori chiefs to acknowledge her as overlord, promising that if they did so she would protect them, their families, their people, and their goods, as she protected all her other subjects and their possession. Then the Maori chiefs spoke. Some of them did not want to sign the treaty, said one, springing up and pointing to the governor, do not sign the paper. If you do, you will become slaves, you will be made to break stones upon the roads, your lands will be taken away from you, and you will no longer be chiefs. Another chief then rode. He spoke so calmly and so well that all the white people were quite astonished. You will be our father, he said, turning to the governor. You must not allow us to become slaves. You will keep all our old customs. You will keep all our old customs. You will not let our land be taken from us. This chief was a very great man, very mighty in battle. So the others listened to him, 
and after more talking, it was agreed that they should think about it for a day. Before signing the treaty, then, with cheers from both the natives and the white people, the meeting was ended. Next day, with firing of guns and great ceremony, the treaty was signed. The great chief who had spoken in favor of the treaty signed his name as the missionaries had taught him to do. But the others made marks, like the marks, like the marks called tattooing with which their bodies were covered. A few months later, the chiefs of South Island also signed the treaty, and the Union Jack was hoisted amid the thunder of guns and the cheers of the people. So New Zealand became an acknowledged British colony, nearly one hundred years after it was discovered and claimed by Cook. Many years have passed since the signing of this treaty, and many things have happened of which I cannot tell you here. New Zealand has become an important part of the British Empire. Instead of two thousand white people, there are now about seven hundred thousand in the island. It is a self-governing colony, and, like Australia, has a parliament of its own, and in New Zealand the women help to choose the members for parliament just as the men do. Chapter 110 Victoria, Boer, and Britain in the days when Cromwell was ruling Britain with his iron hand, a few stern-faced, silent men sailed out from Holland and landed in South Africa. There they made their home, and there they grew rich and prospered. In the reign of George III, while Napoleon was conquering all Europe, British soldiers landed in Africa and took possession of Cape Town. Later still, when Napoleon had fallen, the Cape of Good Hope became a British possession by treaty with Holland. Soon thousands of British settled there, and slowly but surely the colony grew. So side by side these two races, Dutch and British, spread and prospered, but they could not live together in peace. It seemed as if in all the wide veld there was not room for both. I cannot tell you here of all the quarrels and dispeace, of how the different colonies called Orange Free State, Transvaal, Natal, and Cape Colony arose, of how the Transvaal at one time owned British rule and at another did not, of how Britain fought and suffered until at last the long years of unrest and trouble ended in the Great Boer War. I cannot tell you of all this, for it would take too long, and much of it would not seem interesting to you. I will not talk much, either, about the Boer War, for those were sad days for Britain, although a far more terrible war has since almost blotted them from memory. All through this book I have tried to give you reasons for the wars of which I have told and although now that we have come to our own time, it becomes more difficult, I will give you one reason for the Boer War, which you may understand. From the very beginning of our story, you have seen how Britons have fought for freedom, and how step by step they have won it, until at last Britons live under just laws, and have themselves the power to make these laws, for it is now acknowledged that the Briton who pays taxes has the right to help to frame the laws under which he lives. You remember how America was lost, because King George the Third tried to force the Americans to pay taxes, although they had not the right to choose and send members to Parliament. Now the Transvaal was a republic, and the government was in the hands of the Boers, as the South African Dutch had come to be called. Yet in some vague way the Boers owned the Queen of Britain as overlord. Those who lived in the Transvaal were chiefly Boer farmers, but gold was discovered in the country, and then many other people went there hoping to make a great deal of money. Many of these people were British, and although the Boers were not glad to see them, and wished they would keep away from the land which they considered their very own, these British 
helped to make the Boer country rich. They paid heavy taxes, but they were called Uitlanders, which means outlanders or strangers. They were harshly treated in many ways. They were not allowed to vote for members of parliament, and so had no voice in making the laws under which they had to live. You have heard how Britons for centuries had fought for this very freedom which was now denied them in South Africa. And you can imagine how hard it was for Britons to bear what seemed to their, what seemed to them so great an injustice. This is only one reason why the Boers and Britons could not live in peace together, but it is one which you can understand. The Boers, too, had their troubles and their grievances, and when war came they fought as patriots fight for their country. The British in South Africa appealed at last to the mother country for help. The mother country gave help, and in October 1899 A.D. war broke out. The struggle lasted for two and a half years, and at first the British were by no means always successful, for they understood the Boers in their ways of war as little as they had understood them in their ways of peace. The Boers of the Transvaal and of the Orange Free State made common cause and invading British territory besieged the towns of Kimberley, Ladysmith, and Mafeking. All three held out bravely so that there was time to send soldiers from England to their aid. But the first efforts to relieve them ended in disaster, and at Magersfontein, Stormberg, and Colenso, the British were defeated. These were trying days for those who waited at home anxiously, hoping for news of victory. And when day by day they read only of death and disaster, many hearts were sad. But although the Boers fought bravely, their numbers, after all, were small. Soon more and more troops poured into the country from Britain and from her colonies, for in the darkest hour one thing became certain. The little island was not fighting alone. The empire of Greater Britain was no mere name. From all sides, from New Zealand, Australia, Canada, from every province of Greater Britain, from every land, over which the Union Jack floats, came offers of help. Britain was fighting not for herself, but for her colony, and right or wrong, her colony stood by her side by side, and shoulder to shoulder. At length the tide turned. First Kimberley was relieved, and the army which besieged it was surrounded and forced to surrender, and with this surrender, Serious resistance from the Orange Free State was almost at an end. Very nearly at the same time Ladysmith was relieved. A few months later came the relief of Mafeking, and before the end of the first year of the war, both the Orange Free State and the Transvaal were annexed to Great Britain. When the news of the relief of Kimberley and Ladysmith reached home, it was like the rolling away of some dark cloud, and people wept and laughed in joy. When Mafeking was relieved, they seemed to go mad with delight. It was thought, too, that now the war must very quickly come to an end, and that added to the joy of everyone. In January, Lord Roberts, or Bobs as the soldiers loved to call him, had landed in South Africa as commander-in-chief with Lord Kitchener as his chief of staff. Even he thought that peace was now in sight, and leaving Lord Kitchener in charge, he sailed for home in December 1900. But he was mistaken. Peace was still a long way off. Britain might proclaim that the Orange Free State and the Transvaal were henceforth British colonies, but the Boers would not so easily yield up their freedom, and the war went on for nearly a year and a half longer. But from now onward the character of the fighting changed. There were no more sieges and set battles, but skirmishes and encounters over an enormous tract of land. The Boers had daring, dogged, and skillful leaders who knew every inch of the country, every secret of the hills and plains, and their men followed where they led with splendid devotion. They moved from place to place with lightning speed, often surprising, outwitting, and defeating the forces sent against them. 
yet they were not trained soldiers. They wore no uniform even. They were merely farmers in arms. Foot soldiers guiding two blindfolded men on horseback. The Boer leaders were blindfolded and guarded by soldiers of the Black Watch. But at length it became plain that this sort of warfare was most ruinous to the country, and that success, in the end, was impossible. So rather than ruin their country by continuing a useless struggle, the Boers decided to yield. It was not easy for them to come to this decision. Many at first rejected the idea with scorn, but at length nearly all agreed that peace was a stern necessity. What good will it do us, said one of their bravest leaders, if we fight till we men are all killed, and all our women die of starvation? So at length a meeting to discuss terms of peace was arranged. The Boer leaders gathered at a place called Vereniging to talk together over the terms of peace. Vereniging means union, so it seemed a good place at which to have the meeting. The Boers were treated as the guests of the British, who prepared a camp for them, and did everything for their comfort. But as they were led to the camp, through the British lines, the Boers were blindfolded and guarded by soldiers of the Black Watch. This was done because the Boers might not have agreed to make peace, and then the knowledge they had gained of the British camp would have helped them greatly. The meeting lasted about ten days, but at last, on Sunday, June 1, 1902, aid, the good news reached London. Peace was proclaimed. Never perhaps since the beginning of history had a conquered people been granted peace on such terms as it was now granted to the Boers. Save that their homeland was no longer a republic they seemed to gain rather than to lose, but to the Boers that one condition was a bitter one. As their great general Botha had said, the blood and tears which this war has cost is hard, but giving up our country will be doubly hard. Only time and wise government could heal the wound, and healing came swiftly. Little more than four years after peace had been signed, the conquered colonies were given full self-government. It was a bold move and a perilous. To some it seemed even foolhardy. Britons had laid down their lives to win freedom in South Africa. Now all that they had died for was being given back into the hands of the Boers, and would be again lost. So thought the fearful. Their fears were needless. The Orange River Colony and the Transvaal have truly entered into the brotherhood and freedom of the Empire. The experiment indeed proved so much of a success that it was soon followed by a desire for union between the two Boer and the two British colonies. So, on the 31st of May, 1910, exactly eight years after the signing of peace, the four great South African states, Cape Colony, Orange River Colony, Natal and the Transvaal, were formally united into the Union of South Africa. The war was a grievous thing. But for once, out of war, came harmony. Mutual trust and regard wiped away the bitterness of years, and Boer and Britain joined in a common love for their land, and a common desire for its prosperity. And before many years had passed, the Boers were to prove to all the world how, having once pledged their word, they could nobly keep faith. Here where my fresh-turned furrows run, and the deep soil glistens red, I will repair the wrong that was done to the living and the dead. Here, where the senseless bullet fell, and the barren shrapnel burst, I will plant a tree, I will dig a well, against the heat and the thirst. Here in a large and sunlit land, where no wrong bites to the bone, I will lay my hand in my neighbor's hand, and together we will atone for the set folly and the red breach and the black waste of it all, giving and taking counsel each over the cattle. Crail. Here, in the waves and the troughs of the plains, where the healing stillness lies, and the vast benignant sky restrains, and the long days make wise, 
Blessed to our use the rain and the sun and the blind seed in its bed, that we may repair the wrong that was done to the living and the dead. One won by the kind permission of Mr. Rudyard Kipling. Queen Victoria reigned for sixty-three years, which is longer than any other British sovereign has ever reigned. When she had been on the throne fifty years, great rejoicings were held. On the 21st of June, the anniversary of the day upon which she ascended the throne, the streets and houses were everywhere decorated, and bonfires and fireworks blazed. This year was called the Jubilee Year. Ten years later, Victoria was still upon the throne, and again the people rejoiced. The whole air was filled with shouts and cheers, as the white-haired lady, who was queen of half the world, drove through the streets of London on her way to St. Paul's Cathedral, there to thank God for her great and glorious reign. This was called the Diamond Jubilee Year. Three years later, while the dark war cloud still hung over the land, the news was flashed through all the great empire. The Queen is dead. At the close of a dull winter's day, the sad toll of muffled bells rang out the message to every town and village, and from east to west, wherever the flag of red, white, and blue floats, hearts were sad. May children of our children say she wrought her people lasting good, her court was pure, her life serene. God gave her peace, her land reposed, a thousand claims to reverence closed in her as mother, wife, and queen, and statesmen at her council met who knew the seasons when to take occasion. By the hand, and make the bounds of freedom wider yet, by shaping some august decree, which kept her throne unshaken still, broad-based upon her people's will, and compassed by the inviolate sea. Chapter 111 Edward V. The Peacemaker Victoria reigned for sixty-three years, so that only those who were themselves growing old, at the time of her death, could remember, when this wonderful little old lady did not rule. She bound herself firmly to the hearts of her people, calling forth a passionate love and loyalty, such as no other queen throughout the ages had received. She became a part of the empire, a part of our everyday life, and when she died the whole nation mourned as for the loss of a friend. Edward the Seventh was already sixty years old when he came to the throne, and as a ruler the nation at large knew little about him, for even in her old age Queen Victoria had held the reins of government firmly, giving up to others nothing of her rights of office. But never perhaps did King grow more rapidly in the knowledge and love of his people than did Edward the Seventh. Soon he won not only the love of his own people, but the good will of foreign peoples as well, and by his tact, understanding, and ready sympathy, earned for himself the name of Edward, the peacemaker. He had need of all his skill and understanding. For just at this time, for one reason or another, Many of the peoples of Europe had no very kindly feeling towards Great Britain. Yet at one time it seemed as if his reign would be too short in which to do any good, or that he would never be crowned at all. Much to the relief of both king and people, on May 31 the Boer War was ended, and the coronation was fixed for June 26, 1902. Now that peace had come, the people felt that it was indeed a time to rejoice. So throughout the land joyous preparations were made. Streets and houses were decorated with flags and wreaths. Bonfires were built. Entertainments of all kinds were planned. Then, like a bombshell in the midst of all these preparations, two days before the coronation came the news that the king was dangerously ill and that an operation must be performed at once. The coronation could not take place. The nation was staggered, unwilling to believe the news, yet fearful. Such a thing had never happened before, 
and now that it had happened, it left people dumbfounded. The operation was performed at once. Two days of anxious waiting followed. Then it was announced that the king was out of danger. He would get well. He got well so quickly that six weeks after the first day arranged, the coronation took place with great splendor. To those who saw it, it seemed like a fairy tale come true. The king and queen and their courtiers, gathered together in the grey old abbey of Westminster, seemed no longer gracious, well-dressed ladies and gentlemen. They were transformed into fairy princes and princesses, wearing stately robes, golden crowns, and glittering jewels. But beneath the glitter and the show, there was something deeply solemn, for King Edward was no mere king of pageantry. Since the days when the Tudors and the Stuarts held the scepter with despotic hands and forced their will upon the people, the authority of the British monarch had been greatly lessened. But still the power of the king for good or evil is great, and quickly King Edward showed himself a right kingly king, with both the will and the power for good. King Edward used his power towards peace and a better understanding among the nations of Europe. In the spring of 1903 he visited King Carlos of Portugal, then going on to Rome, he visited both the King of Italy and the Pope. At Paris, he was warmly welcomed by the President of France. Later, he visited both the Emperor of Austria and the Tsar of Russia. Everywhere, he charmed the people and left behind a better understanding. It is interesting to remember that King Edward VII was the first king of England to visit Austria since the far-off days when Richard the Lionheart, journeying through the land on his return from Palestine, had been seized and imprisoned. This time, whatever the real feelings of the emperor were, no dark dungeons or chains or chains awaited the king, but only smiles and pleasant words. The result of all these visits was that peace was kept with the whole of Europe, at a time when it seemed that very little might have caused a war, and after centuries of misunderstanding an agreement known as the Intense Cordial was signed with France. King Edward was related in one way or another to nearly all the crowned heads of Europe, and he was so friendly with everyone that the French called him the uncle of Europe. But there was one ruler who was not pleased with King Edward's doing. That was his nephew, the Emperor of Germany. He did not like King Edward's making friends with France, for he thought that must mean that Great Britain would become Germany's enemy. He thought, too, that in visiting Italy, King Edward was trying to break the friendship between that country and Germany. In fact, he thought that the genial, kindly King Edward was full of deep and dark designs, that he was trying to weave an evil spell around Germany and to cut her off from the rest of Europe. He failed to see that he too had the power to make friends with the other nations, just as King Edward had done and that it was his own fault if he were hemmed in by enemies instead of by friends. If Britain agreed to cease quarrelling and live in concord with the rest of Europe, it could not possibly hurt Germany unless Germany was bent on making war. King Edward had no dark designs. He loved peace. He believed that to make war lightly was not only foolish, but wicked, and because he had made friends with France, he had no intention of quarrelling with Germany. So he was able, in appearance at least, to bring his nephew out of his sulks, and the trouble which had been growing between England and Germany seemed to pass away. The Germans, however, had begun to build a great navy, 
and they still went on building big warships with feverish haste. They had a large army, and they did not need a large navy for defense. They could only need such a navy if they wanted to attack someone. Whom did they want to attack? Many people wanted to know that. More than any others, the British wanted to know. So one day an Englishman asked one of the German princes why they were building such a lot of warships. It was an awkward question, and he could not give any satisfactory answer. At any rate, he said, we are not going to use them against Uncle Edward. King Edward was not alone in his love of and desire for peace. The Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, also desired it. Even before King Edward had come to the throne, he had tried to turn the thoughts of Europe towards the idea of peace, and he had persuaded all the chief nations of Europe to come to a peace conference at The Hague in Holland. This conference was called together to try to find out if there was any means of persuading the peoples of Europe to reduce their armies and navies. To keep up a large army or large navy costs a great deal of money. To pay for them, the people must be taxed, sometimes heavily taxed. Even if the people could easily afford to pay the taxes, many people felt that the money spent on armaments as such things are called, might be put to much better uses, that it might be spent in making life happier, better, and safer. But, of course, it is impossible for one country to disarm if other countries will not agree to do the same. So this conference was called to see if all countries could be brought to consent, not to disarm altogether, but to reduce their armaments. It was also called to discuss the possibility of settling disputes between quarrelling nations by arbitration instead of by war, which means that if two nations quarrelled, instead of fighting, they should lay their quarrel before some other nation or group of nations and let them decide who was right and who wrong. The conference failed utterly to reduce armies and navies because Germany would not agree to it. Germany, said her spokesman, was very well content with things as they were. The German people were not crushed under a load of taxes. They were not nearing ruin. On the contrary, life was every year becoming easier. They did not think that forced military service was a heavy burden, but looked upon it as a sacred and patriotic duty. For years, Germany had taken the lead in Europe in increasing both army and navy. To such an extent, indeed, had she done this that other nations had begun to fear her. Now, as she refused to decrease either the one or the other, no nation dared do so. Therefore, on that point, the conference was a failure. But in the matter of arbitration, it succeeded very well. And since then, Many disputes, such as those over boundaries between countries, have been peacefully settled by the Hague Court of Arbitration. A second peace conference was called at the Hague in 1907. At this there were delegates from nearly every country in the world. But again, the attitude of Germany prevented success for her representative refused altogether to discuss the question of armaments, and even stood out against arbitration. Arbitration, said he, must be hurtful to Germany, as Germany is ready for war, as no other country can be. It was only after great arguments, and when it seemed certain that further resistance would greatly harm Germany in the eyes of all the world, that the Emperor gave way and his delegate agreed to the founding of the Hague Court of Arbitration. Even in spite of Germany with her despotic ideas, which seemed to come straight out of the Middle Ages, the Hague conferences proved that the world had advanced, and that the cause of peace had made great strides against the cause of war. Yet we must rather sadly note that in the very year in which the first conference took place, 
war broke out between Great Britain and the Boer states of South Africa, and that a few years later, in 1904, the Tsar, who had invited the conference to meet, was at war with Japan. But we must also note that had it not been for the calmer temper of nations, of which the conference was a sign, the war between Japan and Russia might have spread, and many other nations might have been involved. To the astonishment of almost everyone, in 1902 Britain had made an alliance with Japan, and when the war broke out, Russia accused Britain of helping to bring the war about by signing that treaty. Feeling ran so high that certainly fifty or a hundred years earlier Britain would have been dragged into war. Then, to make matters worse, one dark October night, the Russian fleet, passing through the North Sea on its way to the east, fired upon some English fishing smacks. One steam trawler was sunk, two men killed, and several wounded. When the story was spread abroad, this was an act of war, cried the hot heads. If Russia wanted war, Russia should have war. Russia should have war. But the leaders of the country were calm. The Tsar said he was sorry. The Russian admiral explained that it was a mistake, that he had mistake, that he had mistaken the fishing smacks for Japanese torpedo boats. It sounded rather a lame explanation, but the British accepted it and agreed that the whole matter should be settled by arbitration. So war was averted, and one more victory gained for peaceful method. King Edward the Seventh reigned for nine years, and when one day in May 1910, after a very short illness, he died, the country mourned as it had never mourned even at the death of the great Victoria. For King Edward was very human, and no king perhaps ever touched life at so many points on a level with his people. He was a good sportsman, a good farmer, a diligent man of business, and a charming man of the world. He enjoyed life. He wanted others to enjoy life too, and he was filled with deep sympathy towards those who suffered. When he died, his people felt that they had lost a friend as well as a king. Chapter 112 George V. Armed Peace Edward VII was succeeded by his second son, George, his eldest son, the Duke of Clarence, having died in 1892, while he himself was still Prince of Wales. George V came to the throne in a time of peace and goodwill. We were at peace within our own borders. We lived in greater friendship with our neighbors on the continent, and our understanding with the United States of America, the greatest power of the New World, was far better than it had ever been. George V came to the throne in a time of peace. But soon the peace, not of Great Britain alone, but of the whole world, was shattered. Throughout this book I have tried to give you reasons for the many wars in which during the long ages since our story began, Englishmen have taken part. In many cases the cause was easy to find, but to find the real cause of the World War, which began in 1914, is not easy, for its roots run deep into all the obscure soils of history. But so far as it is possible to do so shortly, I will try to explain. In 1870, the Franco-German War broke out. In that war, the French were defeated. And as victors, the Germans not only made the French pay an enormous sum of money, but took from them part of their land, the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. The money did not matter much. It was paid and forgotten. Not so the loss of land. That was neither forgiven nor forgotten. The memory indeed rankled until in the hearts of Frenchmen an undying sorrow for the lost provinces was born. Outwardly there was peace between the two countries, but the sorrow for the lost provinces was never stilled, 
and never so long as they were misruled by Germany could there be other than bitterness between the two countries. Yet France had no real thoughts of war, and unprovoked she would probably never have attacked Germany. At one time, Turkey in Europe was a large country stretching from the Bosporus to the Adriatic. But after a war between Russia and Turkey in 1877, eight by the Treaty of Berlin, Turkey lost a great deal of territory. The treaty was made in Germany, however, and it left Turkey too powerful, Russia dissatisfied, and the subject people who had been oppressed by the Turks restless. Almost even since that day the Balkans have been filled with intrigue and unrest. Among other things the treaty gave to Austria two provinces called Bosnia and Herzegovina, which had belonged to Turkey, but which were on or near the Adriatic. They were not given to Austria outright, but merely to rule and protect until their peace and prosperity should once more be restored. No one believed that they would ever be given back to the misrule of Turkey, but meanwhile in theory they remained part of the Turkish Empire. Now Bosnia and Herzegovina were peopled with Slavs, as were also the countries adjoining, such as Serbia and Montenegro. And, as was very natural, in time all those Slav peoples began to wish to join together into a greater Serbia. But that was the wish neither of Austria nor of Germany, for Germany had designs of expansion towards the east. For this expansion a clear highway through southeast Europe was necessary, and this highway a peaceful and united Serbia would have fatally blocked. So the Slav peoples were rudely awakened from their dream of union by the Emperor of Austria, who announced in 1908 that he intended to annex Bosnia and Herzegovina outright. By this unjust annexation, all the Slav hopes of a greater Serbia were shattered, and two Slav provinces were bound to a country with which they had nothing in common. But the blow was not taken quietly. The whole land seethed with rebellion. Serbia was ready to fight for the freedom of her sister states, and they all looked to the greatest of Slav rulers, the Tsar of Russia, for aid. Russia had not yet recovered from the disaster of the Japanese war. Still the Tsar seemed not unwilling to undertake this new adventure. It was not, however, the will of Germany that Austria should thus be balked. In his grandest manner, therefore, the Emperor of Germany let it be known that should Austria be attacked, a knight in shining armor would come to her aid. The Tsar could not fight both Austria and Germany, and bitterly humiliated, he gave up the idea of helping the Slav. But this German interference in a purely Slav question humiliated not only the Tsar, but all Russia, and henceforth Russia, and henceforth Russia was the enemy of both Austria and Germany. Serbia, too, was the enemy of Austria. Italy, the ally of both Germany and Austria, was not pleased because it seemed to her that Italy had far more right to provinces on the Adriatic coast than had Austria. In 1912 there was a war among the Balkan state. But when it was over, it seemed for a short time as if the Slav peoples, the Bulgarians, and the Greeks might forget their quarrels and be united into a Balkan federation. But, again, Austria and Germany interfered, and as a result, instead of a federation, a second and far more deadly war broke out in 1913. It ended in the utter defeat of Bulgaria, the Katzpaw, and of Turkey, the ally and tool of Germany. It left Germany also with the fear that a Balkan federation might still be formed which would block her way to the east. There were other causes of jealousy and rancor too many and too complicated to tell here. But from what you have already read, 
you can easily see that both Germany and Austria were clever at making enemies. And if, as the German Emperor said, in 1914 Germany was surrounded by enemies, Germany alone was to blame for at least some of them. In 1914 there were then several causes which made for war. There was the old, unforgotten quarrel between France and Germany. There was a new jealousy on the part of Germany against Great Britain, jealousy of her overseas empire, jealousy of her vast trade. There was the eternal question of the restless Balkans, Germany and Austria, keenly on the watch, lest Russia should gain power there and ruin their ambitions, while still other countries suspected Russia of ambition, likewise to extend her rule over Balkan land. Besides all this, the German nation had been taught that they were a very great nation, a nation which by divine right was destined to rule the world. They were taught that their very greatness must arouse the jealousy of lesser nations, eager to keep them out of their just heritage. They were taught that, as a mere measure of safety, these pernicious nations must be crushed ere they could crush Germany. For her they were taught. It was a choice between world power and downfall. This teaching was all wrong. No European power, not even France, was preparing to attack Germany. No European power desired to ruin her trade or deny her any lawful expansion. Satisfied that their own intentions were honest, the nations of Europe paid little attention to German sword-rattling, and nothing was further from the thoughts of most people than a European war, when suddenly they were rudely awakened to its possibility. One day, towards the end of June 1914, while driving through the streets of Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia, the Austrian Archduke Francis Ferdinand and his wife were shot and killed. The Archduke was heir to the throne of Austria, the Austrian Emperor, already a very old man, and all Europe was moved with sympathy and filled with horror at the crime. The murder took place on Austrian soil, in the land which Austria had unjustly annexed. The murderer was a Bosnian, therefore an Austrian subject. But he was a Slav, and the Serbian government was accused of having encouraged the murderer to do the dreadful deed. Many people were inclined to admit that Serbia was somewhat in fault, but no one was prepared for the brutal demands which the Austrians made upon Serbia. They were such as to rob her of all independence, and make her almost as much an Austrian possession as Bosnia. No nation could submit to them without national degradation, and Serbia was allowed only forty-eight hours in which to submit. From a passionate, turbulent people like the Serbian submission was hardly to be expected. Yet, listening to wise counsels, they yielded to almost all the Austrian demands, asking for arbitration on a few points only. But Austria and her ally Germany with whom she was in consultation, wanted not submission but war, and in spite of the frantic efforts of the statesmen of Europe to bring about an understanding, on the 28th of July Austria declared war on Serbia, and began immediately to prepare for it. But these preparations seemed to be far greater than were necessary for the defeat of a small country like Serbia and Russia, fearing that they were aimed at her, also began to arm. It was now seen that the peace of all Europe was in danger, and peace-loving statesmen did their utmost to preserve it. Foremost among them Sir Edward Grey, the British Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, worked untiringly suggesting, imploring, using every honorable means to keep the peace. But all his efforts were in vain, because, from the beginning, Germany and Austria meant to have war both with Russia and with France. The Central Powers, 
as Germany and Austria were called, believed that they could easily crush both France and Russia, and that henceforth they would be all-powerful in Europe. They did not wish, however, to be saddled with the blame of plunging Europe into war, so they used the murder of the Archduke as a stalking horse. The murder of the Archduke was not the cause of the war. It was merely the excuse. On the 1st of August, 1914, Germany declared war on Russia. By the 2nd, her armies had actually crossed the boundaries of France, but she declared war against France on the 3rd. It was not until a few days later that war between Austria and either France or Russia was declared. From the 1st, Germany was the aggressor, and yet, while Germany was forcing war on Europe with almost every public act, the Emperor still talked largely of his love for peace. The envious, he cried, are forcing us to a just defense. The sword is being thrust into our hand. With Europe, a flame Britain still strove to keep the peace. She had no cause to love Servia. It seemed almost monstrous that a peace-loving people should plunge into war merely to preserve the independence of a little, turbulent nation to which no ties of friendship bound them. Still less was it seemly that freedom-loving Britain should fight the battles of a despot by joining hands with Russia. With France it was somewhat different. Britain had held out the hand of friendship to France. What, in our own eyes, in the eyes of France, in the judgment of the world would that friendship be worth? Did Britain stand quietly by while France was felled by the mailed fist of Germany? It was the mailed fist of Germany that put an end to doubt and brought Britain into the war. For long ages in the past, Belgium had been the battlefield of Europe, and her plains had been laid waste in quarrels, not her own. But in 1830, one all the great powers of Europe had agreed that henceforth Belgium should be neutral. Belgium was to take no part in any European war, and on the other hand, no European power was to enter Belgium for any purpose of war. Germany, as well as the other great powers of Europe, signed this agreement. But the easiest and quickest road to France lay through Belgium and Germany, respecting no law but her own will, marched her armies through the land. Even some of the Germans themselves knew that this act must forever stain her national honor. Speaking in the Reichstag, or Parliament, the Chancellor acknowledged it. We are now in a state of necessity, he said, and necessity knows no law. Our troops have already perhaps entered Belgian soil. This is contrary to the rules of international law. France could wait. We were forced, therefore, to disregard the just protests of the Belgian government. The wrong, I wrong, which we do now, we will try to repair as soon as our end is served. That end was never served. For by this international falsehood and stupendous blunder Germany, in the end, brought the whole moral forces of the world against her. As a first fruit of her folly on the 4th of August, 1914, Great Britain declared war against Germany. When the German Chancellor heard it, he was filled with consternation. What? he cried, Britain will go to war for a mere word like neutrality, for a scrap of paper. The whole world gave him his answer. Not for a scrap of paper, but that treaties may be held sacred, that the world may be made safe for small nations, that the power of the mailed fist may be broken. Chapter 113 World War Of the World War itself I shall not write much, for it was so vast that to tell the story of it is almost to tell the story of the world during the most dreadful four years in all history. Very quickly, 
many other countries were drawn into the dread whirlpool of strife. Two countries, Turkey and Bulgaria, joined the Central Powers. Many more joined the Allies. In Europe, the chief of these was Italy. Italy had had an alliance with Germany and with Austria, which bound her to aid them, should they be attacked by any other power. But as they had not been attacked, but had themselves wantonly begun the strife, Italy considered herself released from her promise, and remained for some time neutral. Then, in May 1915, she joined the Allies, declaring war first against Austria, and more than a year later against Germany. Beyond Europe, the greatest of our allies was the United States of our allies was the United States of America, who declared war against Germany in April 1917. The coming of the United States into the war was a notable proof of the righteousness of the Allies' cause. For Americans as a nation hate war, and see the folly of it more clearly of it more clearly than many peoples of the old world. They have denied the right of Europe to interfere with things American, and they have also set their face against any American interference in the things of Europe, and they hesitated to draw the sword in a quarrel, not their own, thereby plunging a peaceful people into the agony of war. But this war was of such magnitude that there were no bounds to the misery it caused. There was hardly a country in the world, whether neutral or otherwise, that did not suffer. It was a universal evil. To help to end it was the duty of everyone. So America forsook her splendid isolation and joined the Allies. The war affected the whole world through three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. The battle line was flung. In every clime, from Arctic snows to burning desert sands, upon the sea, under the sea, under the sea, on each continent there were strife. On each continent there were campaigns which in themselves were great wars. All the German colonies in Africa were conquered chiefly by the South Africans who, much to the surprise and disgust of the Germans, remained loyal to the Empire. Early in the war, our allies, the Japanese, took the German colony of Kiyosha in China. Even the few scattered islands of the Pacific which the Germans possessed were wrested from them. The war with Turkey caused fighting in Egypt, in Palestine, in Mesopotamia, in every part of the Turkish Empire. But although the war spread over three continents, it was in Europe that it raged most fiercely. It was Europe that suffered most, Belgium and northern France becoming in the end a barren waste of desolation. At the beginning of the war, Lord Kitchener became head of the war office. Sir John French was commander-in-chief of the troops in France until the end of 1915 when he was succeeded by Sir Douglas Hay. Other great soldiers commanded upon the many fronts. But the war was so vast, it called forth such unlimited heroism, such varied genius and excellence, that victory, when it came, did not seem so much the result of the genius of the leaders as of the amazing endurance and courage of men who were soldiers neither by inclination nor by training. Germany was ready for war, as no other country was ready. Not the gallant little Belgian army, not the French, not the small British force, rushed with all speed across the channel, could stay the force of the German advance. In spite of the heroic resistance of all three allies, in spite of some victories, by the end of September the Germans were almost within sight of Paris. They did not reach their goal, indeed they never again came so near to it, and by the end of the month they were forced to retreat. From the very beginning, the Germans showed that they meant to wage war with a ruthlessness and cruelty never known before, and because the Belgians resisted the invasion of their country, as they had a right to do, they trampled it in the dust. The splendid buildings, which had been the pride and the glory of Belgium, were laid in ruins.
factories were destroyed, fields and orchards devastated. The people martyred. From the German point of view, this wrath was justified, for Belgium had ruined their plans. They had meant to crush France first, then free of all anxiety in the West, turn to Russia and crush her. Thus the war would have been brought to a speedy and, for them, triumphant, and Germany would have been in a position to dictate to all Europe. She would have been well on the way to gain the world dominion she coveted. But Belgium raised her puny arm, and the blow which was to have felled France, and laid her helpless at the feet of the conqueror, failed. But although the enemy was forced to retreat, almost from the walls of Paris, the Allies were not strong enough to force them back to their own borders. The German advance had been rapid. The retreat was terribly slow, and for more than four years, northern France and a great part of Belgium were a battlefield. During these years, because of her watchful navy, no foreign foe landed on British soil. But although saved from the awful devastation of war, our island became a changed land. In a few months from being a peaceful manufacturing nation, we were changed into a nation of soldiers, the whole country becoming one huge camp. Boys who had just left school, young men from the workshops and farms, from the universities and colleges, men of high and low estate, all flocked to join the army. Older men, too, men already settled in business or profession, left their families and their work, and marched to fight for right and freedom. They came not only from our little island kingdom, but from every colony and dependency of the worldwide empire, proving once again that the bonds that bind the empire are strong, and her people faithful in their loyalty even unto death. At first, save for our small standing army, our contemptible little army, as the Kaiser called it, all our soldiers were volunteers. Then, as the war went on, and death took a fearful toll, there came the call for more men, and still more men. The volunteers had come in numbers, wonderful beyond belief. Still they were not enough, and conscription was introduced. This means that every able-bodied man was forced to serve as a soldier. It was with some reluctance that conscription was introduced as it seemed somewhat foreign to our free traditions. But under the stress of war, Britons willingly gave up many of the liberties which they had won by centuries of hard struggle. Such things as freedom of speech and the freedom of the press were no more. Even private letters were censored. That is, they were opened and read by government officials before being sent on to the people to whom they were addressed. In everything, in fact, the comfort or pleasure of the individual had to be sacrificed to the general need of the country. When the conscripted men were taken for the army, there were not enough left to do the work of the country. Then the women showed themselves to be the true sisters of their menfolk. They filled the factories and offices. They became farm laborers, ticket collectors, porters, bus conductors. In fact, everywhere where labor was short women filled the breach. While the men were facing fearful odds in a foreign land, the women wrestled with and mastered their jobs at home. Therein they found some comfort and some sense of comradeship with their menfolk at the front. They too were at the front. So as time went on, all Britain became one vast factory of war. All life hinged on it, all thought turned to it. Everyone in some way or another was engaged in it. Life in those days was a strange, exciting, unhappy thing. In many ways, the war was unlike any other war. In Europe especially it was distinguished by its fixedness. As a rule, we connect movement with war. 
we think of armies marching hither and thither over large tracts of country. But after the rapid advance of the Germans at the beginning of the war, and the retreat which followed, the war in France and Flanders was not one of movement and pitched battles, but of trenches, each side on a long line stretching from the borders of Switzerland to the sea, dug itself into the ground. There, for weeks and months together, they faced each other, they faced each other, constantly sniping, bombing, and shelling each other's positions. At intervals, this developed into furious battles, raging over vast areas, and lasting for days and even weeks. In consequence of these battles, the line of trenches was sometimes pushed backward, sometimes forward, as one or other side gained some advantage. In this manner, some parts of the country were fought over three or four times, and their condition at the last was desolate beyond all description. This war was unlike others also in its horror and deadliness. Never before had such huge guns been used such powerful explosives. Never before had liquid flame and clouds of poison gas been used as weapons of war. It was Germany generally who led the way with new horrors. But soon the Allies too bent all their energies toward inventing and improving weapons of destruction. Even the greatest scientists turned their thoughts to such matters. For the wisest saw that the world must have peace if civilization was not to go down in the dust. The victory of Germany would have meant the enslavement of Europe. So to preserve our liberties, we fought fire with fire and devised fiendish instruments of destruction, peaceful inventions also, like the telephone and wireless telegraphy, were pressed into the service of war. Aeroplanes, too, were used for the first time adding a new horror to war. For not only did death now rain from the skies, but gunfire was directed by observers in aeroplanes, thereby becoming more sure and deadly. There was war on land, war on the sea, war underground, war under water and war in the air. But the huge German navy, which had caused so much heart-burning, and cost so much heart-burning, and cost so many millions to build, did little throughout the whole war. Once or twice, German ships made a dash across the North Sea, bombarded some defenseless seaside town, and sped away again. But these tip-and-run expeditions were of no value. They were performances wholly unworthy of a great navy. Besides these, there were a few naval battles. The last fought off Jutland in May 1916. In that battle the Germans were not defeated. Aided by night and mist, most of the ships got safely back to port. Yet the Germans had had enough of British seamen, and could never again be forced to face them. Once more, indeed, some of their ships put out to sea, but at the approach of the British Navy, they fled. After that, the great ships lay rotting in port, and when towards the end of the war an attempt was made to use the fleet again, it was met by mutiny on the part of the sailors. Although the German fleet proved a useless luxury, the Germans were by no means unsuccessful in causing destruction on the seas. But their weapons were not mighty ships, but mines and submarines. They sowed mines broadcast, and, in an endeavor to starve and terrify the Allies into submission, at length declared a ruthless submarine warfare. We can bottle up England, said the German Admiral von Tirpitz. We can torpedo every ship of the English or of the Allies which nears any harbour in Great Britain, thereby cutting off all large food supplies. It was a campaign of frightfulness which made the seas unsafe for all the world. Neutral and enemy ships, passenger steamers, hospital ships, merchantmen, 
anything and everything which came within their reach was torpedoed and sunk. But this ruthlessness, like the ruthless trampling through Belgium, was a blunder as well as a crime, for perhaps more than everything else, it brought the United States of America into the war against Germany. In the spring of 1917, the submarine campaign was at its worst. Then one quarter of the vessels which left British ports never returned. True, our Navy destroyed many submarines, but the Germans built them faster than we destroyed them, and they sunk ships faster than we could build them. But nothing could destroy the courage of the British merchant seamen. Undaunted by all the terrors of war, they crossed the seas again and again, knowing well that every voyage might be their last. They were not soldiers. They had not signed on. For war, and almost to the end, they went unarmed and unguarded. But they knew, if anyone hinders our coming, you'll starve, and with a courage never equaled, they allowed nothing to hinder their coming or going. Without the amazing grit of the merchant seamen, all England's great navy could scarcely have availed to keep her people from starvation. But in spite of all our gallant seamen could do food ran short, then the whole nation was put on rations, each person being allowed to buy only a certain small quantity of the most necessary foods each week. No one was allowed to have more than another and those who hoarded food were liable to fines and imprisonment. Such restrictions were tiresome and irritating, and added something to the general misery of the war. But the terror which the enemy had designed for us never struck home to our hearts. We never doubted clouds would break, never doubted clouds would break, never dreamed, though right were worsted, wrong would triumph. The air raid was another form of frightfulness, which tried the nerves, if it did not shake the courage of the people. Again and again, London and various seaside places were attacked by zeppelins and aeroplanes. Some people were killed, and a good deal of damage was done to buildings. But those raids were of no military value. They aided Germany no whit toward victory. They were only one more horror of war. But because of them at night, the whole land was plunged into darkness, for they were almost always made at night, and lest the enemy should be guided by the light of towns and villages, all streets were darkened, and the lights in houses were carefully screened. From sunset to sunrise, too, no public clock was allowed to strike, no bells were allowed to be rung. The strain on all the countries taking part in the war was terrible, and under the strain Russia broke into revolution. At first it seemed as if Russia had but risen in her strength to burst the chains of despotism by which she had been bound during long ages, and that free Russia would march irresistibly to victory. But soon it became plain that freedom in Russia meant chaos. Discipline, law, and order disappeared, and very quickly Russia dropped out of the World War to be involved in a devastating civil war. This was a disaster to Russia. It was also a disaster for the Allies. For having nothing more to fear from Russia, Germany was able to use all her might to defeat the Allies on the Western Front. But almost as soon as Russia fell away, the loss was made good, for in April 1917 the United States joined the LIC. Already, too, Germany had reached and passed the climax of her efforts. She knew already that she could not hope for a sweeping victory. Still, she fought on, and it was not until the autumn of 1918 that victory for the Allies came in sight. Then, one by one, Germany's allies yielded, Bulgaria, Turkey, Austria. With dramatic swiftness, the end came. Germany too sued for peace, and on the 11th of November, the armistice was signed.
Chapter 114 The Hope of the Future It is always much more easy to make war than to make peace, and never after any war had Europe been in such a state of turmoil and confusion as it now was. Francis Joseph, the old Emperor of Austria, died during the war. His successor abdicated, and the Empire of Austria fell to pieces. The Emperor of Germany, too, abdicated, and fled to Holland for refuge, while Germany was given over to revolution. Russia remained in the throes of civil war. Added to this, all the subject nations, which had been held in bondage by Germany, Austria, and Russia, clamored for release. The peace conference, which met at Paris, endeavored to satisfy these subject nations, and to settle the claims of the Allies, and when it had finished its work, the map of Europe was changed. New nations had been carved out of Austria and Hungary, Hungary becoming entirely independent, and Austria being made the weakest of Central European powers. Turkey was almost wiped from the map of Europe. Poland once again appeared as an independent state. Alsace and Lorraine were given back to France. Besides this restitution to France, Germany lost territory to Poland, to Denmark, to Belgium. Of her colonial empire, nothing remained. Italy gained territory to the north and east, and the frontiers of the Balkan states were rearranged. In fact, there were only five or six European states whose boundaries remained as they were before the war. Peace was signed with Germany on the 28th of June, 1919, exactly five years after the murder of the heir to the Austrian throne. Two months later, peace was signed with Austria. But although peace is signed, it will be long, very long before Europe settles to true peace. Civil war still rages in Russia. Several other states are still in arms. Almost every state which took part in the war is in a state of unrest. Famine and disease, the terrible ghosts of war, still stalk through Central Europe. In Austria alone millions of people are starving. Upon a hundred scattered battlefields, millions of gallant men have found a soldier's grave. Thousands more have returned home ruined in mind, body and estate, broken, maimed, blinded. Thousands upon thousands of children have been made orphans. Thousands upon thousands of women are widows. Have we to fear that all these lives have been given in vain, that all this agony has been suffered in vain? Are we sure that the ends for which the war was fought are won? Has the world been made safe for small nations? Are treaties more sacred and more binding than before? We are not sure, but we have a hope. For out of all the blood and agony of the war, a great hope for mankind was born. For two thousand years, no greater hope than that of the League of Nations has dawned upon the world. It is for you who read this book, you the men and women of the future, to make sure that this new hope is not betrayed. Very many times throughout the war we heard the words, This is a war to end war. But war cannot end war. Only when the will toward peace throughout all the world shall far outweigh the will toward war can war be ended. In spite of the terrible lesson of the war, the will toward peace is still not very great. But it is greater than it has ever been, and it is for us to labor so that it may grow greater still. Many things work against the will toward peace. In spite of all its horrors, there are some people who do not hate war, who even think that war may be a good thing. Others think that war is a bad thing, but taking counsel of despair, they say, there have always been wars, there always will be wars. It is human nature, so what is the use of trying to stop them? At first sight, it seems as if there was a good deal to be said for this argument. 
It does seem as if the love of fighting was born in us. It is nothing unusual for a boy at school to fight. No one is surprised if he comes home with a cut lip or a black eye. Indeed, it is taken as a matter of course. It is all part of the game of life, and a boy who can use his fists often gets on very well at school. But when a boy becomes a man, he changes. If he wants to get on well in life, he no longer uses his fists, but his brains. If, in his profession or business, he wants to get the better of another man, he does not throw off his coat and offer to fight him. He sits down and thinks, and even as children grow, so nations grow. In the early days of our island story, England was filled with many tribes constantly at war with each other. But as years went on, these warring tribes were forced in one way or another to the conclusion that it was better to join together, and all England in time became one nation, acknowledging the rule of one king. But even after all England acknowledged one ruler, there was little peace in the land. For throughout the Middle Ages, the turbulent barons claimed the right of private war. Look back to the reign of Stephen, and see what the proud barons did in those days. The feudal lord made war when and where he chose, acknowledging no law but his own will. He clung fiercely to this right, and it was only after a long and terrible struggle that the king's peace was enforced, and the most unruly baron taught that he could not disturb the general peace and go unpunished. All the nations of Europe had to go through a like struggle, but at length within the borders of most states a national peace was established. This was sometimes broken by civil war, but within the borders of a state peace was the rule, war the exception. Without the borders, war was unfortunately more often the rule, for men had yet to learn to respect the laws of international right and justice as they had learned to respect those of national right and justice. Men are only now beginning to see that just as in the old days, no baron had the right to break the peace of his country. So now no state has the right to break the peace of the world. And this has led them to the League of Nations. Very often in the past nations have leagued together. But these leagues have been for war, or have lain under the suspicion that they were meant for war. They were very often, too, merely leagues of despotic rulers, who thought of their own ambitions and not of the good of the people. But the League of Nations is a league of free peoples, and its object is peace. The idea of a league for peace is no new thing. All through the ages, there have been men who not only saw the need of such a league, but the possibility of its being formed. But very few people listened to them, for in all nations the will toward war was greater than the will toward peace. But in the years just before the war, the multitude of these people had increased very greatly, and societies were formed both in Great Britain and in the United States. But still, the people who formed these societies were more or less looked upon as amiable cranks. Their ideas were regarded as utopian, that is, beautiful but quite impossible. It was only when the Great War came and brought with it worldwide misery that leaders, rulers, politicians, and people at large awoke to the fact that something must be done to lessen the danger of another catastrophe, such as the world war overtaking the world. Then, from being the utopian dream of the few, the League of Nations became the great hope of the many. Great soldiers, thinkers, leaders of men urged its cause and at length, when the peace conference met, the covenant of the League of Nations was framed and embodied in the peace treaty with Germany. The original members of the League of Nations 
are to be all those nations who were at war with Germany, or who had broken off relations with her. These number thirty-two. Any other state may be elected a member, if it promises to keep the rules laid down by the League, and gives proof that it means to keep that promise. Any state can withdraw from the League if it gives two years' notice. All the states belonging to the League agree to meet regularly. There is to be a large assembly of representatives from all the nations and a smaller council. Besides these regular meetings, the League will have a permanent office in Geneva with a regular staff under a secretary-general, so that there will always be a rallying point for the peoples who seek peace, and should any unexpected danger of war arise any member of the League, can call a meeting of the Council by applying to the secretary-general. All the members of the League agree to reduce their armaments to the lowest point consistent with national safety. They also agree to tell the other members, quite frankly and freely, the extent of their preparations for war and the strength of their army and navy. Above all, they agree never to go to war until they have first laid the cause of quarrel before the League and given the League time to settle it, or try to settle it, or try to settle it by peaceful means. If any state disregards this rule, and goes to war without first trying to settle its quarrel by peaceful means, then the whole League will unite against it. So it would appear that even a League for peace must provide for war, but... If the League becomes a living thing, if nearly all the nations in the world join it, the danger of war will be greatly lessened. For a state would hesitate long to go to war if it knew with absolute certainty that thirty or forty other states would immediately rise against it. The League does not hope to abolish war. It cannot abolish war, for as a wise man said four hundred years ago, it is not possible for all things to be well, unless all men were good, which I think will not be yet in these good many years. But the League can make war less probable, and it can arrange that in the future war will never pay. Germany and Austria would never have gone to war in 1914 if they had known with absolute certainty beforehand that all the greatest forces in the world would be against them, because they would have known with equal certainty that they could not win, so long as war is to be the arbiter between nations, men will be forced to fight. Britain could not avoid taking part in the Great War. Our men could do no less than fight and die. Our women could do no less than cheer them on. Should a like cause arise tomorrow, and the League of Nations remain a mere name, Britain would again be forced to fight. If we are to keep faith with our gallant dead, who gave their lives in the belief that they fought and died in the cause of peace, we must do all we can to prevent such a catastrophe. The means is at hand. The statesmen of the world have framed the covenant. But it is only the support of the nations of the world that can give it force and make it avail against the will toward war. The nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more and none shall make them afraid. List of kings from Edward the Confessor, Saxon king. Edward the Confessor reigned twenty-four years. From 1042 to 1066 A.D., Harold II reigned a little more than nine months. From January 5th to October 14th, 1066 A.D., Norman kings. William I reigned twenty-one years from 1066 to 1080. William II, 
1310-87-1100 A.D., Henry I, 35, 1100, 1135 A.D., Stephen, 19, 1135, 1154 A.D., Plantagenet Kings. Henry II reigned 35 years, from 1189 A.D. Richard the first ten eleven John seventeen eleven ninety nine twelve sixteen A D Henry the third fifty six twelve sixteen twelve seventy two A D Edward the first thirty five twelve seventy two thirteen oh seven A D Edward the second twenty thirteen O seven thirteen twenty seven A Henry the fourth fourteen thirteen ninety nine fourteen thirteen A D Henry V, 9, 14, 13, 14, 22 A.D. Henry VI, 39, 14, 22, 14, 61. 1461. A.D. Edward IV, 22, 14, 61. Richard III reigned two years, from 1483 to 1485 A.D. Tudor kings. Henry VII reigned 24 years, from 1485 to 1509 A.D. Henry the eight thirty eight fifteen o nine fifteen forty seven a d a d fifteen forty seven fifteen forty seven fifty fee elizabeth forty five fifteen fifty eight sixteen o three a d stuart kings james the first of england and the sixth of scotland reigned fifty eight years thirty six as king of scotland only from fifteen sixty seven to sixteen o three and twenty-two as King of Great Britain and Ireland, from 1603 to 1603. Charles I reigned twenty-four years, from 1625 to 1649 A.D. The Commonwealth lasted eleven years, from 1649 to 1660 A.D. Stuart Kings, Charles II reigned twenty-five years, from 1660 to 1685 A.D. Mary the second and William the third reigned together for five years, from 1689 to 1694 A.D. William the third reigned alone for eight years, from 1694 to 1702 A.D., and reigned twelve years, from 1702 to 1702 to 1714 A.D. Hanoverian kings, George the first reigned thirteen years from 1714 to 1727 A.D., George II, 33, 1727, 1760 A.D., George III, 60, 1760, 1820 A. Victoria, 68, 1837, 1901 A.D., Edward VII, 9, 1901, 1901, 1910 A.D., George V, 1910 A.D., Al, oh, this edition, this book has been put on, lying as part of the Builder, book initiative at a celebration of women. Initial text entry and proofreading of this book were the work of volunteers at Ambleside Online. Numbering of chapters has been modernized for the convenience of modern readers. The original chapters numbers followed the convention I, 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 I. Six. Illustrations that would appear in mid-paragraph have been moved to follow a paragraph. Edited by Mary Mark. O Mary Mark. O